Book 3.2 Regicide Chapter 3.2.I The Deliberative France therefore has done two things very completely, she has hurled back her Sumerian invaders far over the marches. And likewise she has shattered her own internal social constitution, even to the minutest fiber of it, into wreck and dissolution. Utterly it is all altered, from king down to parish constable, all authorities, magistrates, judges, persons that bore rule, have had, on the sudden, to alter themselves, so far as needful. Or else, on the sudden, and not without violence, to be altered, a patriot executive council of ministers, with a patriot Danton in it, and then a whole nation and national convention, have taken care of that. Not a parish constable, in the furthest hamlet, who has said de par le roi, and shown loyalty, but must retire, making way for a new improved parish constable who can say de par la republic. It is a change such as history must beg her readers to imagine, undescribed. An instantaneous change of the whole body politic, the soul politic being all changed, such a change as few bodies, politic or other, can experience in this world. Say perhaps, such as poor nymph Semele's body did experience, when she would needs, with woman's humor, see her Olympian Jove as very Jove. And so stood, poor nymph, this moment Semele, next moment not Semele, but flame and a statue of red-hot ashes. France has looked upon democracy, seen it face to face. The Sumerian invaders will rally, in humbler temper, with better or worse luck, the wreck and dissolution must reshape itself into a social arrangement as it can and may. But as for this national convention, which is to settle everything, if it do, as Deputy Payne and France generally expects, get all finished, in a few months, we shall call it a most deft convention. In truth, it is very singular to see how this mercurial French people plunges suddenly from Vive le Roy to Vive la Republic, and goes simmering and dancing. Shaking off daily, so to speak, and trampling into the dust, its old social garnitures, ways of thinking, rules of existing. And cheerfully dances towards the ruleless, unknown, with such hope in its heart, and nothing but freedom, equality, and brotherhood in its mouth. Is it two centuries, or is it only two years, since all France roared simultaneously to the welkin, bursting forth into sound and smoke at its feast of pikes, live the restorer of French liberty? Three short years ago there was still Versailles and an Oie de Berf, now there is that watched circuit of the temple, girt with dragon-eyed municipals, where, as in its final limbo, royalty lies extinct. In the year 1789, constituent deputy Berreyer wept, in his break-of-day newspaper, at sight of a reconciled King Louis. And now in 1792, convention deputy Berreyer, perfectly tearless, may be considering, whether the reconciled King Louis shall be guillotined or not. Old garnitures and social vestures drop off, we say, so fast, being indeed quite decayed, and are trodden under the national dance. And the new vestures, where are they, the new modes and rules? Liberty, equality, fraternity, not vestures but the wish for vestures. The nation is for the present, figuratively speaking, naked. It has no rule or vesture, but is naked, a sansculotic nation. So far, therefore, in such manner have our patriot brissets, Guedets triumphed. Verdniad's Ezekiel visions of the fall of thrones and crowns, which he spake hypothetically and prophetically in the spring of the year, have suddenly come to fulfillment in the autumn. Our eloquent patriots of the legislative, like strong conjurers, by the word of their mouth, have swept royalism with its old modes and formulas to the winds, and shall now govern a France free of formulas. Free of formulas. And yet man lives not except with formulas, with customs, ways of doing and living, no text truer than this, which will hold true from the tea table and tailor's shopboard up to the high senate houses, solemn temples. Nay through all provinces of mind and imagination, onwards to the outmost confines of articulate being, ubi homini sunt modi sunt. There are modes wherever there are men. It is the deepest law of man's nature. Whereby man is a craftsman and tool-using animal, not the slave of impulse, chance, and brute nature, but in some measure their lord. Twenty-five millions of men, suddenly stripped bare of their modi, 
and dancing them down in that manner, are a terrible thing to govern. Eloquent patriots of the legislative, meanwhile, have precisely this problem to solve. Under the name and nickname of statesmen, Hans d'Etat, of moderate men, moderantins, of brissidens, Rolandins, finally of Girondins, they shall become world famous in solving it. For the twenty-five millions are Gallic effervescent too. Filled both with hope of the unutterable, of universal fraternity in golden age, and with terror of the unutterable, Sumerian Europe all rallying on us. It is a problem like few. Truly, if man, as the philosophers brag, did to any extent look before and after, what, one may ask, in many cases would become of him. What, in this case, would become of these 749 men? The convention, seeing clearly before and after, were a paralyzed convention. Seeing clearly to the length of its own nose, it is not paralyzed. To the convention itself neither the work nor the method of doing it is doubtful, to make the constitution, to defend the republic till that be made. Speedily enough, accordingly, there has been a committee of the constitution got together. Size, old constituent, constitution builder by trade, Condorcet, fit for better things, deputy Payne, foreign benefactor of the species, with that red carbuncled face, and the black beaming eyes. Harold de Seychelles, ex-parliamentier, one of the handsomest men in France, these, with inferior guild brethren, are girt cheerfully to the work, will once more make the constitution, let us hope, more effectually than last time. For that the constitution can be made, who doubts, unless the gospel of Jean Jacques came into the world in vain. True, our last constitution did tumble within the year, so lamentably. But what then, except sort the rubbish and boulders, and build them up again better? Widen your basis, for one thing, to universal suffrage, if need be, exclude rotten materials, royalism and such like, for another thing. And in brief, build, O oh unspeakable size and company, unwearied. Frequent perilous downrushing of scaffolding and rubble work, be that an irritation, no discouragement. Start ye always again, clearing aside the wreck. If with broken limbs, yet with whole hearts, and build, we say, in the name of heaven, till either the work do stand, or else mankind abandon it, and the constitution builders be paid off, with laughter and tears. One good time, in the course of eternity, it was appointed that this of social contract too should try itself out. And so the Committee of Constitution shall toil, with hope and faith, with no disturbance from any reader of these pages. To make the Constitution, then, and return home joyfully in a few months, this is the prophecy our National Convention gives of itself, by this scientific program shall its operations and events go on. But from the best scientific program, in such a case, to the actual fulfillment, what a difference! Every reunion of men, is it not, as we often say, a reunion of incalculable influences, every unit of it a microcosm of influences? Of which how shall science calculate or prophesy? Science, which cannot, with all its calculuses, differential, integral, and of variations, calculate the problem of three gravitating bodies, ought to hold her peace here. And say only, in this national convention there are 749 very singular bodies, that gravitate and do much else. Who, probably in an amazing manner, will work the appointment of heaven. Of national assemblages, parliaments, congresses, which have long sat, which are of saturnine temperament. Above all, which are not dreadfully in earnest, something may be computed or conjectured, yet even these are a kind of mystery in progress, whereby we see the journalist reporter find livelihood, even these jolt madly out of the ruts. From time to time. How much more a poor national convention, of French vehemence, urged on at such velocity, without routine, without rut, track or landmark, and dreadfully in earnest every man of them. It is a parliament literally such as there was never elsewhere in the world. Themselves are new, unarranged, they are the heart and presiding centre of a France fallen wholly into maddest disarrangement. From all cities, hamlets, from the utmost ends of this France with its twenty-five million vehement souls, thick streaming influences storm in on that same heart, in the Salle de Manege. And storm out again, 
such fiery venous arterial circulation is the function of that heart. 749 human individuals, we say, never sat together on earth, under more original circumstances. Common individuals most of them, or not far from common, yet in virtue of the position they occupied, so notable. How, in this wild piping of the whirlwind of human passions, with death, victory, terror, valor, and all height and all depth peeling and piping, these men, left to their own guidance, will speak and act. Readers know well that this French national convention, quite contrary to its own program, became the astonishment and horror of mankind, a kind of apocalyptic convention, or black dream become real. Concerning which history seldom speaks except in the way of interjection, how it covered France with woe, delusion, and delirium, and from its bosom there went forth death on the pale horse. To hate this poor national convention is easy. To praise and love it has not been found impossible. It is, as we say, a parliament in the most original circumstances. To us, in these pages, be it as a fuliginous fiery mystery, where upper has met nether, and in such alternate glare and blackness of darkness poor bedazzled mortals know not which is upper, which is nether. But rage and plunge distractedly, as mortals, in that case, will do. A convention which has to consume itself, suicidally, and become dead ashes, with its world. Behoves us, not to enter exploratively its dim embroiled deeps. Yet to stand with unwavering eyes, looking how it welters, what notable phases and occurrences it will successively throw up. One general superficial circumstance we remark with praise, the force of politeness. To such depth has the sense of civilization penetrated man's life, no druet, no legender, in the maddest tug of war, can altogether shake it off. Debates of senates dreadfully in earnest are seldom given frankly to the world. Else perhaps they would surprise it. Did not the Grand Monarch himself once chase his Louvois with a pair of brandish tongs? But reading long volumes of these convention debates, all in a foam with furious earnestness, earnest many times to the extent of life and death, one is struck rather with the degree of continence they manifest in speech. And how in such wild ebullition, there is still a kind of polite rule struggling for mastery, and the forms of social life never altogether disappear. These men, though they menace with clenched right hands, do not clench one another by the collar. They draw no daggers, except for oratorical purposes, and this not often, profane swearing is almost unknown, though the reports are frank enough, we find only one or two oaths, oaths by Marat, reported in all. For the rest, that there is effervescence, who doubts. Effervescence enough, decrees passed by acclamation today, repealed by vociferation tomorrow, temper fitful, most rotatory changeful, always headlong. The voice of the orator is covered with rumors, a hundred honorable members rush with menaces towards the left side of the hall, president has broken three bells in succession, claps on his hat, as signal that the country is near ruined. A fiercely effervescent old Gallic assemblage, ah, how the loud sick sounds of debate, and of life, which is a debate, sink silent one after another, so loud now, and in a little while so low. Brennus, and those antique gale captains, in their way to Rome, to Galatia, and such places, whither they were in the habit of marching in the most fiery manner, had debates as effervescent, doubt it not, though no monitor has reported them. They scolded in Celtic Welsh, those Brennuses, neither were they sans culotte, nay rather breeches, bracky, say of felt or rough leather, were the only thing they had. Being, as Livy testifies, naked down to the haunches, and, see, it is the same sort of work and of men still, now when they have got coats, and speak nasally a kind of broken Latin. But on the whole does not time envelop this present national convention, as it did those Brennuses, and ancient August senates in felt breeches? Time surely, and also eternity. Dim dusk of time, or noon which will be dusk. And then there is night, and silence, and time with all its sick noises is swallowed in the still sea. Pity thy brother, O son of Adam. The angriest frothy jargon that he utters, is it not properly the whimpering of an infant which cannot speak what ails it, but is in distress clearly, in the inwards of it. And so must squall and whimper continually, till its mother take it, and it get, 
to sleep. This convention is not four days old, and the melodious Melibian stanzas that shook down royalty are still fresh in our ear, when there bursts out a new diapason, unhappily, of discord, this time. For speech has been made of a thing difficult to speak of well, the September massacres. How deal with these September massacres, with the Paris Commune that presided over them? A Paris Commune hateful terrible. Before which the poor effete legislative had to quail, and sit quiet. And now if a young omnipotent convention will not so quail and sit, what steps shall it take? Have a departmental guard in its pay, answer the Girondins, and friends of order. A guard of national volunteers, mission from all the 83 or 85 departments, for that express end, these will keep Septembers, tumultuous communes in a due state of submissiveness, the convention in a due state of sovereignty. So have the friends of order answered, sitting in committee, and reporting, and even a decree has been passed of the required ten hour. Nay certain departments, as the VAR or Marseilles, in mere expectation and assurance of a decree, have their contingent of volunteers already on march, brave Marseillaise, foremost on the 10th of August, will not be hindmost here. Fathers gave their sons a musket and twenty-five Louis, says Barbarous, and bade them march. Can anything be proper? A republic that will found itself on justice must needs investigate September massacres. A convention calling itself national, ought it not to be guarded by a national force, alas, reader, it seems so to the eye, and yet there is much to be said and argued. Thou beholdest here the small beginning of a controversy, which mere logic will not settle. Two small wellsprings, September, departmental guard, or rather at bottom they are but one and the same small wellspring, which will swell and widen into waters of bitterness, all manner of subsidiary streams and brooks of bitterness flowing in, from this side and that. Till it become a wide river of bitterness, of rage and separation, which can subside only into the catacombs. This departmental guard, decreed by overwhelming majorities, and then repealed for peace's sake, and not to insult Paris, is again decreed more than once. Nay it is partially executed, and the very men that are to be of it are seen visibly parading the Paris streets, shouting once, being overtaken with liquor, ah B.A.S. Marat, down with Marat. Nevertheless, decreed never so often, it is repealed just as often, and continues, for some seven months, an angry noisy hypothesis only, a fair possibility struggling to become a reality, but which shall never be won. Which, after endless struggling, shall, in February next, sink into sad rest, dragging much along with it. So singular are the ways of men and honorable members. But on this fourth day of the convention's existence, as we said, which is the 25th of September, 1792, there comes committee report on that decree of the departmental guard, and speech of repealing it. There come denunciations of anarchy, of a dictatorship, which let the incorruptible Robespierre consider, there come denunciations of a certain journal de la République, once called Ami du Peuple. And so thereupon there comes, visibly stepping up, visibly standing aloft on the tribune, ready to speak, the bodily spectrum of people's friend Marat. Shriek, ye 749, it is verily Marat, he and not another. Marat is no phantasm of the brain, or mere lying impress of printer's types, but a thing material, of joint and sinew, and a certain small stature, ye behold him there, in his blackness in his dingy squalor, a living fraction of chaos and old night. Visibly incarnate, desirous to speak. It appears, says Marat to the shrieking assembly, that a great many persons here are enemies of mine. All. All, shriek hundreds of voices, enough to drown any people's friend. But Marat will not drown, he speaks and croaks explanation, croaks with such reasonableness, air of sincerity, that repentant pity smothers anger, and the shrieks subside or even become applauses. For this convention is unfortunately the crankiest of machines, it shall be pointing eastward, with stiff violence, this moment. And then do but touch some spring dexterously, the whole machine, clattering and jerking seven hundredfold, will whirl with huge crash, and, next moment, is pointing westward. Thus Marat, absolved and applauded, victorious in this turn of fence, is, as the debate goes on, 
pricked it again by some dexterous Girondin, and then the shrieks rise anew, and decree of accusation is on the point of passing. Till the dingy people's friend bobs aloft once more, croaks once more persuasive stillness, and the decree of accusation sinks, whereupon he draws forth, a pistol. And setting it to his head, the seat of such thought and prophecy, says, if they had passed their accusation decree, he, the people's friend, would have blown his brains out. A people's friend has that faculty in him. For the rest, as to this of the 260,000 aristocrat heads, Marat candidly says, say Lamont Avis, such is my opinion. Also it is not indisputable, no power on earth can prevent me from seeing into traitors, and unmasking them, by my superior originality of mind. An honorable member like this friend of the people few terrestrial parliaments have had. We observe, however, that this first onslaught by the friends of order, as sharp and prompt as it was, has failed. For neither can Robespierre, summoned out by talk of dictatorship, and greeted with the like rumor on shewing himself, be thrown into prison, into accusation, not though barbarous openly bear testimony against him, and sign it on paper. With such sanctified meekness does the incorruptible lift his sea-green cheek to the smiter. Lift his thin voice, and with Jesuitic dexterity plead, and prosper, asking at last, in a prosperous manner, but what witnesses has the Citoyen Barbarous to support his testimony? Moi! cries hot Rebecqui, standing up, striking his breast with both hands, and answering, me. Nevertheless the sea-green pleads again, and makes it good, the long hurly-burly, personal merely, while so much public matter lies fallow, has ended in the order of the day. O oh, friends of the Gironda, why will you occupy our August sessions with mere paltry personalities, while the grand nationality lies in such a state, the Gironda has touched, this day, on the foul black spot of its fair convention domain. Has trodden on it, and yet not trodden it down. Alas, it is a wellspring, as we said, this black spot, and will not tread down. Chapter 3.2.2 The Executive May we not conjecture therefore that round this grand enterprise of making the Constitution their will, as heretofore, very strange embroilments gather, and questions and interests complicate themselves. So that after a few or even several months, the Convention will not have settled everything. Alas, a whole tide of questions comes rolling, boiling, growing ever wider, without end. Among which, apart from this question of September and anarchy, let us notice those, which emerge oftener than the others, and promise to become leading questions, of the armies, of the subsistences, thirdly, of the dethroned king. As to the armies, public defense must evidently be put on a proper footing, for Europe seems coalizing itself again, one is apprehensive even England will join it. Happily Du Maurier prospers in the north. Nay what if he should prove too prosperous, and become liberticide, murderer of freedom, Du Maurier prospers, through this winter season, yet not without lamentable complaints. Sleek Patch, the Swiss schoolmaster, he that sat frugal in his alley, the wonder of neighbors, has got lately, whither thinks the reader? To be minister of war. Madame Roland, struck with his sleek ways, recommended him to her husband as clerk, the sleek clerk had no need of salary, being of true patriotic temper, he would come with a bit of bread in his pocket, to save dinner in time. And, munching incidentally, do three men's work in a day, punctual, silent, frugal, the sleek tartuffe that he was. Wherefore Roland, in the late overturn, recommended him to be war minister. And now, it would seem, he is secretly undermining Roland, playing into the hands of your hotter Jacobins in September commune, and cannot, like strict Roland, be the veto de Cokins. How the sleek patch might mine and undermine, one knows not well, this however one does know, that his war office has become a den of thieves and confusion, such as all men shudder to behold. That the citizen Hassenfratz, as head clerk, sits there in bonnet rouge, in rapin, in violence, and some mathematical calculation, a most insolent, red nightcapped man. That patch munches his pocket loaf, amid head clerks and sub clerks, and has spent all the war estimates, that furnishers scour in gigs, over all districts of France, and drive bargains, and lastly that the army gets next to no furniture. 
No shoes, though it is winter, no clothes, some have not even arms. In the army of the South, complains an honorable member, there are thirty thousand pairs of breeches wanting, a most scandalous want. Roland's strict soul is sick to see the course things take, but what can he do? Keep his own department strict, rebuke, and repress wheresoever possible, at lowest, complain. He can complain in letter after letter, to a national convention, to France, to posterity, the universe, grow ever more querulous indignant, till at last may he not grow wearisome. For is not this continual text of his, at bottom a rather barren one, how astonishing that in a time of revolt and abrogation of all law but canon law, there should be such unlawfulness. Intrepid veto of scoundrels, narrow faithful, respectable, methodic man, work thou in that manner, since happily it is thy manner, and wear thyself away, though ineffectual, not profitless in it, then nor now. The brave Dame Roland, bravest of all French women, begins to have misgivings, the figure of Danton has too much of the Sardanapalus character, at a Republican Rolandin dinner table, Klutz, speaker of mankind. Prose is sad stuff about a universal republic, or union of all peoples and kindreds in one and the same fraternal bond. Of which bond, how it is to be tied, one unhappily sees not. It is also an indisputable, unaccountable or accountable fact that grains are becoming scarcer and scarcer. Riots for grain, tumultuous assemblages demanding to have the price of grain fixed abound far and near. The mayor of Paris and other poor mayors are like to have their difficulties. Pechin was re-elected mayor of Paris, but has declined. Being now a convention legislator. Why surely to decline, for, besides this of grains and all the rest, there is in these times an improvised insurrectionary commune passing into an elected legal one. Getting their account settled, not without irritancy. Pechin has declined, nevertheless many do covet and canvas. After months of scrutinizing, balloting, arguing and jargoning, one Dr. Chamon gets the post of honor, who will not long keep it, but be, as we shall see, literally crushed out of it. Think also if the private sans culotte has not his difficulties, in a time of dearth. Bread, according to the people's friend, may be some, six sous per pound, a day's wages some fifteen, and grim winter here. How the poor man continues living, and so seldom starves, by miracle. Happily, in these days, he can enlist, and have himself shot by the Austrians, in an unusually satisfactory manner, for the rights of man. But Commandant Santerre, in this so straitened condition of the flower market, and state of equality and liberty, proposes, through the newspapers, two remedies, or at least palliatives, first, that all classes of men should live. Two days of the week, on potatoes. Then second, that every man should hang his dog. Hereby, as the commandant thinks, the saving, which indeed he computes to so many sacks, would be very considerable. A cheerfuller form of inventive stupidity than Commandant Santerre's dwells in no human soul. Inventive stupidity, embedded in health, courage and good nature, much to be commended. My whole strength, he tells the convention once, is, day and night, at the service of my fellow citizens, if they find me worthless, they will dismiss me, I will return and brew beer. Or figure what correspondences a poor Roland, minister of the interior, must have, on this of grains alone. Free trade in grain, impossibility to fix the prices of grain. On the other hand, clamor and necessity to fix them, political economy lecturing from the home office, with demonstration clear as scripture, ineffectual for the empty national stomach. The mayor of Chartres, like to be eaten himself, cries to the convention, the convention sends honorable members in deputation, who endeavor to feed the multitude by miraculous spiritual methods, but cannot. The multitude, in spite of all eloquence, come bellowing round, will have the grain prices fixed, and at a moderate elevation, or else, the honorable deputies hanged on the spot. The honorable deputies, reporting this business, admit that, on the edge of horrid death, they did fix, or affect to fix the price of grain, for which, be it also noted, the convention, a convention that will not be trifled with. Sees good to reprimand them. But as to the origin of these grain riots, 
is it not most probably your secret royalists again? Glimpses of priests were discernible in this of Chartres, to the eye of patriotism. Or indeed may not, the root of it all lie in the temple prison, in the heart of a perjured king, well as we guard him. Unhappy perjured king! And so there shall be baker's cues, by and by, more sharp-tempered than ever, on every baker's door rabbit an iron ring, and coil of rope. Whereon, with firm grip, on this side and that, we form our cue, but mischievous deceitful persons cut the rope, and our cue becomes a revelment, wherefore the coil must be made of iron chain. Also there shall be prices of grain well fixed. But then no grain purchasable by them, bread not to be had except by ticket from the mayor, few ounces per mouth daily, after long swaying, with firm grip, on the chain of the queue. And hunger shall stalk direful. And wrath and suspicion, wedded to the preternatural pitch, shall stalk, as those other preternatural, shapes of gods in their wrathfulness, were discerned stalking, in glare and gloom of that fire ocean, when Troy Town fell. Chapter 3.2.3 Discrowned But the question more pressing than all on the legislator, as yet, is this third, what shall be done with King Louis? King Louis, now king and majesty to his own family alone, in their own prison apartment alone, has been Louis Capet and the traitor Vito with the rest of France. Shut in his circuit of the temple, he has heard and seen the loud whirl of things. Yells of September massacres, Brunswick war thunders dying off in disaster and discomfiture, he passive, a spectator merely, waiting whither it would please to whirl with him. From the neighboring windows, the curious, not without pity, might see him walk daily, at a certain hour, in the temple garden, with his queen, sister, and two children, all that now belongs to him in this earth. Quietly he walks and waits. For he is not of lively feelings, and is of a devout heart. The weary de resolute has, at least, no need of resolving now. His daily meals, lessons to his son, daily walk in the garden, daily game at ombre or draughts, fill up the day, the morrow will provide for itself. The morrow indeed, and yet how? Lewis asks, how? France, with perhaps still more solicitude, asks, how? A king dethroned by insurrection is verily not easy to dispose of. Keep him prisoner, he is a secret center for the disaffected, for endless plots, attempts and hopes of theirs. Banish him, he is an open center for them, his royal war standard, with what of divinity it has, unrolls itself, summoning the world. Put him to death. A cruel questionable extremity that too, and yet the likeliest in these extreme circumstances, of insurrectionary men, whose own life and death lies staked, accordingly it is said. From the last step of the throne to the first of the scaffold there is short distance. But, on the whole, we will remark here that this business of Lewis looks altogether different now, as seen overseas and at the distance of forty-four years, than it looked then, in France, and struggling, confused all round one. For indeed it is a most lying thing that same past tense always, so beautiful, sad, almost Elysian sacred, in the moonlight of memory, it seems, and seems only. For observe, always, one most important element is surreptitiously, we not noticing it, withdrawn from the pastime, the haggard element of fear. Not there does fear dwell, nor uncertainty, nor anxiety, but it dwells here, haunting us, tracking us. Running like an accursed ground discord through all the music tones of our existence, making the tense a mere present one. Just so is it with this of Lewis. Why smite the fallen? Asks magnanimity, out of danger now. He is fallen so low this once high man, no criminal nor traitor, how far from it, but the unhappiest of human solecisms, whom if abstract justice had to pronounce upon, she might well become concrete pity, and pronounce only sobs and dismissal. So argues retrospective magnanimity, but pusillanimity, present, prospective. Reader, thou hast never lived, for months, under the rustle of Prussian gallows ropes. Never wert thou portion of a national Sahara waltz, twenty-five millions running distracted to fight Brunswick. Knights errant themselves, when they conquered giants, usually slew the giants, quarter was only for other knights errant, who knew courtesy and the laws of battle. 
The French nation, in simultaneous, desperate dead pull, and as if by miracle of madness, has pulled down the most dread Goliath, huge with the growth of ten centuries. And cannot believe, though his giant bulk, covering acres, lies prostrate, bound with peg and pack thread, that he will not rise again, man devouring, that the victory is not partly a dream. Terror has its skepticism. Miraculous victory its rage of vengeance. Then as to criminality, is the prostrated giant, who will devour us if he rise, an innocent giant? Curate Grégoire, who indeed is now constitutional Bishop Grégoire, asserts, in the heat of eloquence, that kingship by the very nature of it is a crime capital, that king's houses are as wild beasts' dens. Lastly consider this, that there is on record a trial of Charles I. This printed trial of Charles I is sold and read everywhere at present, Kell spectacle. Thus did the English people judge their tyrant, and become the first of free peoples, which feet, by the grace of destiny, may not France now rival. Skepticism of terror, rage of miraculous victory, sublime spectacle to the universe, all things point one fatal way. Such leading questions, and their endless incidental ones, of September anarchists and departmental guard. Of grain riots, plaintiff interior ministers, of armies, Hassenfratz dilapidations, and what is to be done with Lewis, beleaguer and embroil this convention, which would so gladly make the constitution rather. All which questions too, as we often urge of such things, are in growth, they grow in every French head, and can be seen growing also, very curiously, in this mighty welter of parliamentary debate, of public business which the convention has to do. A question emerges, so small at first, is put off, submerged, but always re-emerges bigger than before. It is a curious, indeed an indescribable sort of growth which such things have. We perceive, however, both by its frequent re-emergence and by its rapid enlargement of bulk, that this question of King Lewis will take the lead of all the rest. And truly, in that case, it will take the lead in a much deeper sense. For as Aaron's rod swallowed all the other serpents, so will the foremost question, whichever may get foremost, absorb all other questions and interests. And from it and the decision of it will they all, so to speak, be born, or newborn, and have shape, physiognomy in destiny corresponding. It was a point of fate that, in this wide weltering, strangely growing, monstrous stupendous imbroglio of convention business, the grand first parent of all the questions, controversies. Measures and enterprises which were to be evolved there to the world's astonishment, should be this question of King Lewis. Chapter 3.2.4 The Loser Pays The 6th of November, 1792, was a great day for the Republic, outwardly, over the frontiers, inwardly, in the Salle de Manege. Outwardly, for de Mourier, overrunning the Netherlands, did, on that day, come in contact with Saxdeschen and the Austrians, de Mourier wide-winged, they wide-winged, at and around the village of Jemaps, near Mons. And fire hail is whistling far and wide there, the great guns playing, and the small, so many green heights getting fringed and maned with red fire. And de Mourier is swept back on this wing, and swept back on that, and is like to be swept back utterly, when he rushes up in person, the prompt Polymedes, speaks a prompt word or two. And then, with clear tenor pipe, uplifts the hymn of the Marseillaise, and Tana la Marseillaise, ten thousand tenor or bass pipes joining, or say, some forty thousand in all. For every heart leaps at the sound, and so with rhythmic march melody, waxing ever quicker, to double and to treble quick, they rally, they advance, they rush, death-defying, man-devouring. Carry batteries, redoutes, whatsoever is to be carried. And, like the fire whirlwind, sweep all manner of Austrians from the scene of action. Thus, through the hands of de Mourier, May Rouget de Lille, in figurative speech, be said to have gained, miraculously, like another Orpheus, by his Marseillaise fiddle-strings, Fidibus canaries, a victory of Jemaps, and conquered the Low Countries. Young General Egalité, it would seem, shone brave among the bravest on this occasion. Doubtless a brave Egalité, whom however does not de Mourier rather talk of oftener than need were. The mother society has her own thoughts. As for the elder Egalité he flies low at this time, 
appears in the convention for some half-hour daily, with rubicon, preoccupied, or impressive quasi-contemptuous countenance, and then takes himself away. The Netherlands are conquered, at least overrun. Jacobin missionaries, your prolis, Pereiras, follow in the train of the armies. Also convention commissioners, melting church plate, revolutionizing and remodeling, among whom Danton, in brief space, does immensities of business, not neglecting his own wages and trade profits, it is thought. Hassenfratz dilapidates at home. Dumouriez grumbles and they dilapidate abroad, within the walls there is sinning, and without the walls there is sinning. But in the hall of the convention, at the same hour with this victory of Jamaps, there went another thing forward, report, of great length, from the proper appointed committee, on the crimes of Lewis. The galleries listen breathless. Take comfort, ye galleries, Deputy Valais, reporter on this occasion, thinks Lewis very criminal, and that, if convenient, he should be tried, poor Gerond and Valais, who may be tried himself, one day. Comfortable so far. Nay here comes a second committee reporter, Deputy Mail, with a legal argument, very prosy to read now, very refreshing to hear then, that, by the law of the country, Louis Capet was only called inviolable by a figure of rhetoric. But at bottom was perfectly viable, triable, that he can, and even should be tried. This question of Louis, emerging so often as an angry confused possibility, and submerging again, has emerged now in an articulate shape. Patriotism growls indignant joy. The so-called reign of equality is not to be a mere name, then, but a thing. Try Louis Capet. Scornfully ejaculates patriotism, mean criminals go to the gallows for a purse cut. And this chief criminal, guilty of a France cut, of a France slashed asunder with clotho scissors and civil war. With his victims, 1200 on the 10th of August alone, lying low in the catacombs, fattening the passes of Argonne Wood, of Valmy and Far Fields, he, such chief criminal, shall not even come to the bar, for, alas, O patriotism. Add we, it was from of old said, the loser pays. It is he who has to pay all scores, run up by whomsoever, on him must all breakages and charges fall. And the twelve hundred on the tenth of August are not rebel traitors, but victims and martyrs, such is the law of quarrel. Patriotism, nothing doubting, watches over this question of the trial, now happily emerged in an articulate shape. And will see it to maturity, if the gods permit. With a keen solicitude patriotism watches, getting ever keener, at every new difficulty, as Girondins and false brothers interpose delays. Till it get a keenness as a fixed idea, and will have this trial and no earthly thing instead of it, if equality be not a name. Love of equality. Then skepticism of terror, rage of victory, sublime spectacle of the universe, all these things are strong. But indeed this question of the trial, is it not to all persons a most grave one, filling with dubiety many a legislative head? Regicide? Asks the Gironda respectability, to kill a king, and become the horror of respectable nations and persons? But then also, to save a king, to lose one's footing with the decided patriot. An undecided patriot, though never so respectable, being mere hypothetic froth and no footing, the dilemma presses sore, and between the horns of it you wriggle round and round. Decision is nowhere, save in the mother society in her sons. These have decided, and go forward, the others wriggle round uneasily within their dilemma horns, and make way no whither. Chapter 3.2.V Stretching of Formulas But how this question of the trial grew laboriously, through the weeks of gestation, now that it has been articulated or conceived, were superfluous to trace here. It emerged and submerged among the infinite of questions and embroilments. The veto of scoundrels writes plaintive letters as to anarchy, concealed royalists, aided by hunger, produce riots about grain. Alas, it is but a week ago, these Girondins made a new fierce onslaught on the September massacres. For, one day, among the last of October, Robespierre, being summoned to the tribune by some new hint of that old calumny of the dictatorship, was speaking and pleading there, with more and more comfort to himself. Till, rising high in heart, he cried out valiantly, 
is there any man here that dare specifically accuse me? Moi, exclaimed one. Pause of deep silence, a lean angry little figure, with broad bald brow, strode swiftly towards the tribune, taking papers from its pocket, I accuse thee, Robespierre, I, Jean Baptiste Louvet. The sea green became tallow green. Shrinking to a corner of the tribune, Danton cried, Speak, Robespierre, there are many good citizens that listen, but the tongue refused its office. And so Louvet, with a shrill tone, read and recited crime after crime, dictatorial temper, exclusive popularity, bullying at elections, mob retinue, September massacres. Till all the convention shrieked again, and had almost indicted the incorruptible there on the spot. Never did the incorruptible run such a risk. Louvet, to his dying day, will regret that the Gironda did not take a bolder attitude, and extinguish him there and then. Not so, however, the incorruptible, about to be indicted in this sudden manner, could not be refused a week of delay. That week, he is not idle, nor is the mother society idle, fierce tremulous for her chosen son. He is ready at the day with his written speech, smooth as a Jesuit doctor's, and convinces some. And now? Why, now lazy Vergniaud does not rise with demosthenic thunder, poor Louvet, unprepared, can do little or nothing, Barrer proposes that these comparatively despicable personalities be dismissed by order of the day. Order of the day it accordingly is. Barbarous cannot even get a hearing, not though he rush down to the bar, and demand to be heard there as a petitioner. The convention, eager for public business, with that first articulate emergence of the trial just coming on, dismisses these comparative misers and despicabilities, splenetic Louvet must digest his spleen, regretfully forever, Robespierre. Dear to patriotism, is dearer for the dangers he has run. This is the second grand attempt by our Girondin friends of order, to extinguish that black spot in their domain, and we see they have made it far blacker and whiter than before. Anarchy, September massacre, it is a thing that lies hideous in the general imagination, very detestable to the undecided patriot, of respectability, a thing to be harped on as often as need is. Harp on it, denounce it, trample it, ye Girondin patriots, and yet behold, the black spot will not trample down, it will only, as we say, trample blacker and whiter, fools, it is no black spot of the surface, but a wellspring of the deep. Consider rightly, it is the apex of the everlasting abyss, this black spot, looking up as water through thin ice, say, as the region of nether darkness through your thin film of Gironda regulation and respectability. Trample it not, lest the film break, and then. The truth is, if our Gironda friends had an understanding of it, where were French patriotism, with all its eloquence, at this moment, had not that same great nether deep, of bedlam, fanaticism and popular wrath and madness. Risen unfathomable on the 10th of August. French patriotism were an eloquent reminiscence, swinging on Prussian gibbets. Nay, where, in few months, were it still, should the same great nether deep subside. Nay, as readers of newspapers pretend to recollect, this hatefulness of the September massacre is itself partly an afterthought, readers of newspapers can quote Gorses and various Brissetons approving of the September massacre. At the time it happened. And calling it a salutary vengeance. So that the real grief, after all, were not so much righteous horror, as grief that one's own power was departing. Unhappy Girondins. In the Jacobin society, therefore, the decided patriot complains that here are men who with their private ambitions and animosities, will ruin liberty, equality, and brotherhood, all three, they check the spirit of patriotism. Throw stumbling blocks in its way. And instead of pushing on, all shoulders at the wheel, will stand idle there, spitefully clamoring what foul ruts there are, what rude jolts we give. To which the Jacobin society answers with angry roar. With angry shriek, for there are citoyens too, thick crowded in the galleries here. Citoyens who bring their seam with them, or their knitting needles, and shriek or knit as the case needs, famed tricoteurses, patriot knitters. Mère Duchesse, or the like Deborah and mother of the Faubourgs, giving the keynote. It is a changed Jacobin society, and is still changing. Where Mother Duchess now sits, authentic duchesses have sat. 
High Rouge dames went once in jewels and spangles, now, instead of jewels, you may take the knitting needles and leave the rouge, the rouge will gradually give place to natural brown, clean washed or even unwashed. And Demoiselle Pharaoh and herself get scandalously fustigated. Strange enough, it is the same tribune raised in mid-air, where a high mirabeau, a high barnave and aristocrat lammaths once thundered, whom gradually your brissets, guadets, bergniads, a hotter style of patriots in bonnet rouge, did displace. Red heat, as one may say, superseding light. And now your brissets in turn, and brissetins, rolandins, girondins, are becoming supernumerary, must desert the sittings, or be expelled, the light of the mighty mother is burning not red but blue. Provincial daughter societies loudly disapprove these things, loudly demand the swift reinstatement of such eloquent Girondins, the swift erasure of Marat, radiation de Marat. The mother society, so far as natural reason can predict, seems ruining herself. Nevertheless she has, at all crises, seems so, she has a preternatural life in her, and will not ruin. But, in a fortnight more, this great question of the trial, while the fit committee is assiduously but silently working on it, receives an unexpected stimulus. Our readers remember poor Lewis's turn for Smith work, how, in old happier days, a certain Sieur Gamin of Versailles was wont to come over, and instruct him in lock-making, often scolding him, they say for his numbness. By whom, nevertheless, the royal apprentice had learned something of that craft. Hapless apprentice, perfidious Master Smith. For now, on this 20th of November, 1792, Dingy Smith Gamine comes over to the Paris municipality, over to Minister Roland, with hints that he, Smith Gamine, knows a thing. That, in May last, when traitorous correspondence was so brisk, he and the royal apprentice fabricated an iron press, armoire de fer, cunningly inserting the same in a wall of the royal chamber in the Tilleries, invisible under the wainscot. Where doubtless it still sticks. Perfidious Gamine, attended by the proper authorities, finds the wainscot panel which none else can find, wrenches it up, discloses the iron press, full of letters and papers. Roland clutches them out. Conveys them over in towels to the fit assiduous committee, which sits hard by. In towels, we say, and without notarial inventory, an oversight on the part of Roland. Here, however, are letters enough, which disclose to a demonstration the correspondence of a traitorous self-preserving court, and this not with traitors only, but even with patriots, so-called. Barnave's treason, of correspondence with the Queen, and friendly advice to her, ever since that Varenus business, is hereby manifest, how happy that we have him, this Barnave, lying safe in the prison of Grenoble, since September last. For he had long been suspect. Talleyrand's treason, many a man's treason, if not manifest hereby, is next to it. Mirabeau's treason, wherefore his bust in the hall of the convention, is veiled with gauze, till we ascertain. Alas, it is too ascertainable. His bust in the hall of the Jacobins, denounced by Robespierre from the tribune in mid-air, is not veiled, it is instantly broken to sherds, a patriot mounting swiftly with a ladder, and shivering it down on the floor, it and others, amid shouts. Such is their recompense and amount of wages, at this date, on the principle of supply and demand. Smith Gamine, inadequately recompensed for the present, comes, some fifteen months after, with a humble petition. Setting forth that no sooner was that important iron press finished off by him, than, as he now bethinks himself, Lewis gave him a large glass of wine. Which large glass of wine did produce in the stomach of Sieur Gamine the terriblest effects, evidently tending towards death, and was then brought up by an emetic, but has, notwithstanding, entirely ruined the constitution of Sieur Gamine. So that he cannot work for his family, as he now bethinks himself. The recompense of which is, pension of twelve hundred francs, and, honorable mention. So different is the ratio of demand and supply at different times. Thus, amid obstructions and stimulating furtherances, has the question of the trial to grow, emerging and submerging, fostered by solicitous patriotism. Of the orations that were spoken on it, 
of the painfully devised forms of process for managing it, the law arguments to prove it lawful, and all the infinite floods of juridical and other ingenuity and oratory. Be no syllable reported in this history. Lawyer ingenuity is good, but what can it profit here? If the truth must be spoken, O oh August Senators, the only law in this case is, v victus, the loser pays. Seldom did Robespierre say a wiser word than the hint he gave to that effect, in his oration, that it was needless to speak of law, that here, if never elsewhere, our right was might. An oration admired almost to ecstasy by the Jacobin patriot, who shall say that Robespierre is not a thoroughgoing man, bold in logic at least. To the like effect, or still more plainly, spake young Saint Just, the black-haired, mild-toned youth. Danton is on mission, in the Netherlands, during this preliminary work. The rest, far as one reads, welter amid law of nations, social contract, juristics, syllogistics, to us barren as the east wind. In fact, what can be more unprofitable than the sight of 749 ingenious men, struggling with their whole force and industry, for a long course of weeks? To do at bottom this, to stretch out the old formula and law phraseology, so that it may cover the new, contradictory, entirely uncoverable thing, whereby the poor formula does but crack, and one's honesty along with it. The thing that is palpably hot, burning, wilt thou prove it, by syllogism, to be a freezing mixture. This of stretching out formulas till they crack is, especially in times of swift change, one of the sorrowfulest tasks poor humanity has. Chapter 3.2. VI. At the Bar. Meanwhile, in a space of some five weeks, we have got to another emerging of the trial, and a more practical one than ever. On Tuesday, 11th of December, the King's trial has emerged, very decidedly, into the streets of Paris. In the shape of that green carriage of Mayor Chambon, within which sits the King himself, with attendants, on his way to the convention hall. Attended, in that green carriage, by Mayor's Chambon, Procureur Chaumet. And outside of it by Commandant Santerre, with cannon, cavalry and double row of infantry, all sections under arms, strong patrols scouring all streets. So fares he, slowly through the dull drizzling weather, and about two o'clock we behold him, in walnut-colored greatcoat, Redingote and Wazette, descending through the place Vadome, towards that Salle de Manege. To be indicted, and judicially interrogated. The mysterious temple circuit has given up its secret, which now, in this walnut-colored coat, men behold with eyes. The same bodily Louis who was once Louis the Desired, fares there, hapless king, he is getting now towards port, his deplorable fairings and voyagings draw to a close. What duty remains to him henceforth, that of placidly enduring, he is fit to do. The singular procession fares on, in silence, says Prudhomme, or amid growlings of the Marseillaise him, in silence, ushers itself into the hall of the convention, Santerre holding Louis's arm with his hand. Louis looks round him, with composed air, to see what kind of convention in Parliament it is. Much changed indeed, since February gone two years, when our constituent, then busy, spread flirtilous velvet for us. And we came over to say a kind word here, and they all started up swearing fidelity, and all France started up swearing, and made it a feast of pikes, which has ended in this. Berreyer, who once wept looking up from his editor's desk, looks down now from his president's chair, with a list of fifty-seven questions, and says, dry-eyed, Louis, you may sit down. Louis sits down, it is the very seat, they say, same timber and stuffing, from which he accepted the constitution, amid dancing and illumination, autumn gone a year. So much woodwork remains identical, so much else is not identical. Lewis sits and listens, with a composed look and mind. Of the fifty-seven questions we shall not give so much as one. They are questions captiously embracing all the main documents seized on the 10th of August, or found lately in the Iron Press. Embracing all the main incidents of the Revolution history, and they ask, in substance, this, Lewis, who wert king, art thou not guilty to a certain extent, by act and written document, of trying to continue king? Neither in the answers is there much notable. Mere quiet negations, for most part, 
an accused man standing on the simple basis of no, I do not recognize that document, I did not do that act, or did it according to the law that then was. Whereupon the fifty-seven questions, and documents to the number of a hundred and sixty-two, being exhausted in this manner, Barrere finishes, after some three hours, with his, Lewis, I invite you to withdraw. Lewis withdraws, under municipal escort, into a neighboring committee room, having first, in leaving the bar, demanded to have legal counsel. He declines refreshment, in this committee room, then, seeing Chaumet busy with a small loaf which a grenadier had divided with him, says, he will take a bit of bread. It is five o'clock. And he had breakfasted but slightly in a morning of such drumming and alarm. Chaumet breaks his half-loaf, the king eats of the crust, mounts the green carriage, eating, asks now what he shall do with the crumb. Chaumet's clerk takes it from him, flings it out into the street. Louis says, it is pity to fling out bread, in a time of dearth. My grandmother, remarks Chaumet, used to say to me, little boy, never waste a crumb of bread, you cannot make one. Monsieur Chaumet, answers Louis, your grandmother seems to have been a sensible woman. Poor innocent mortal, so quietly he waits the drawing of the lot, fit to do this at least well, passivity alone, without activity, sufficing for it. He talks once of traveling over France by and by, to have a geographical and topographical view of it, being from of old fond of geography. The temple circuit again receives him, closes on him. Gazing Paris may retire to its hearths and coffee houses, to its clubs and theatres, the damp darkness has sunk, and with it the drumming and patrolling of this strange day. Louis is now separated from his queen and family. Given up to his simple reflections and resources. Dull lie these stone walls round him, of his loved ones none with him. In this state of uncertainty, providing for the worst, he writes his will, a paper which can still be read. Full of placidity, simplicity, pious sweetness. The convention, after debate, has granted him legal counsel, of his own choosing. Advocate Target feels himself too old, being turned of fifty-four, and declines. He had gained great honor once, defending Rohan the Necklace Cardinal, but will gain none here. Advocate Tranchette, some ten years older, does not decline. Nay behold, good old Malherbe steps forward voluntarily. To the last of his fields, the good old hero. He is grey with seventy years, he says, I was twice called to the counsel of him who was my master, when all the world coveted that honour. And I owe him the same service now, when it has become one which many reckon dangerous. These two, with a younger disease, whom they will select for pleading, are busy over that fifty and sevenfold indictment, over the hundred and sixty-two documents, Lewis aiding them as he can. A great thing is now therefore in open progress. All men, in all lands, watching it. By what forms and methods shall the convention acquit itself, in such manner that there rest not on it even the suspicion of blame? Difficult that will be. The convention, really much at a loss, discusses and deliberates. All day from morning to night, day after day, the tribune drones with oratory on this matter, one must stretch the old formula to cover the new thing. The patriots of the mountain, wedded ever keener, clamor for dispatch above all, the only good form will be a swift one. Nevertheless the convention deliberates, the tribune drones, drowned indeed in tenor, and even in treble, from time to time. The whole hall shrilling up rounded into pretty frequent wrath and provocation. It has droned and shrilled well nigh a fortnight, before we can decide, this shrillness getting ever shriller, that on Wednesday 26th of December, Lewis shall appear, and plead. His advocates complain that it is fatally soon. Which they well might as advocates, but without remedy, to patriotism it seems endlessly late. On Wednesday, therefore, at the cold dark hour of eight in the morning, all senators are at their post. Indeed they warm the cold hour, as we find, by a violent effervescence, such as is too common now, some Louvet or Buzet attacking some Tauline, Chabot, and so the whole mountain effervescing against the whole Gironda. Scarcely is this done, at nine, when Louis and his three advocates, escorted by the clang of arms and Santerre's national force, enter the hall. D.C.'s unfolds his papers. 
honorably fulfilling his perilous office, pleads for the space of three hours. An honorable pleading, composed almost overnight, courageous yet discreet. Not without ingenuity, and soft pathetic eloquence, Louis fell on his neck, when they had withdrawn, and said with tears, Mon pauvre d'ici's. Louis himself, before withdrawing, had added a few words, perhaps the last he would utter to them how it pained his heart, above all things, to be held guilty of that bloodshed on the 10th of August. Or of ever shedding or wishing to shed French blood. So saying, he withdrew from that hall, having indeed finished his work there. Many are the strange errands he has had thither, but this strange one is the last. And now, why will the convention loiter? Here is the indictment and evidence, here is the pleading, does not the rest follow of itself? The mountain, and patriotism in general, clamors still louder for dispatch. For permanent session, till the task be done. Nevertheless a doubting, apprehensive convention decides that it will still deliberate first, that all members, who desire it, shall have leave to speak. Dot, to your desks, therefore, ye eloquent members. Down with your thoughts, your echoes and hearsays of thoughts, now is the time to shew oneself, France and the universe listens. Members are not wanting, oration spoken pamphlet follows spoken pamphlet, with what eloquence it can, president's list swells ever higher with names claiming to speak, from day to day, all days and all hours, the constant tribune drones. Shrill galleries supplying, very variably, the tenor and treble. It were a dull tune otherwise. The patriots, in mountain and galleries, or taking counsel nightly in section house, in mother society, amid their shrill tricoteurses, have to watch lynx-eyed, to give voice when needful, occasionally very loud. Deputy Thuriot, he who was advocate Thuriot, who was elector Thuriot, and from the top of the Bastille, saw Saint Antoine rising like the ocean, this Thuriot can stretch a formula as heartily as most men. Cruel Bill Laud is not silent, if you incite him. Nor is cruel Jean Bond silent, a kind of Jesuit he too, write him not, as the dictionaries too often do, Jambon, which signifies mere ham. But, on the whole, let no man conceive it possible that Lewis is not guilty. The only question for a reasonable man is, or was, can the convention judge Lewis? Or must it be the whole people, in primary assembly, and with delay? Always delay, ye Girondins, false homes d'etat. So bellows patriotism, its patience almost failing. Dot, but indeed, if we consider it, what shall these poor Girondins do? Speak their convictions that Lewis is a prisoner of war. And cannot be put to death without injustice, solecism, peril. Speak such conviction, and lose utterly your footing with the decided patriot? Nay properly it is not even a conviction, but a conjecture and dim puzzle. How many poor Girondins are sure of but one thing, that a man and Girondin ought to have footing somewhere, and to stand firmly on it, keeping well with the respectable classes. This is what conviction and assurance of faith they have. They must wriggle painfully between their dilemma horns. Nor is France idle, nor Europe. It is a heart this convention, as we said, which sends out influences, and receives them. A king's execution, call it martyrdom, call it punishment, were an influence. Two notable influences this convention has already sent forth, over all nations, much to its own detriment. On the 19th of November, it emitted a decree, and has since confirmed and unfolded the details of it. That any nation which might see good to shake off the fetters of despotism was thereby, so to speak, the sister of France, and should have help and countenance. A decree much noised of by diplomatists, editors, international lawyers. Such a decree as no living fetter of despotism, nor person in authority anywhere, can approve of. It was Deputy Chambon the Girondin who propounded this decree, at bottom perhaps as a flourish of rhetoric. The second influence we speak of had a still poorer origin, in the restless loud rattling slightly furnished head of one Jacob Dupont from the lawyer country. The convention is speculating on a plan of national education, Deputy Dupont in his speech says, I am free to avow, M. Le President, that I for my part am an atheist, thinking the world might like to know that. 
the French world received it without commentary, or with no audible commentary, so loud was France otherwise. The foreign world received it with confutation, with horror and astonishment, a most miserable influence this. And now if to these two were added a third influence, and sent pulsing abroad over all the earth, that of regicide? Foreign courts interfere in this trial of Louis, Spain, England, not to be listened to. Though they come, as it were, at least Spain comes, with the olive branch in one hand, and the sword without scabbard in the other. But at home too, from out of this circumambient Paris and France, what influences come thick pulsing? Petitions flow in, pleading for equal justice, in a reign of so-called equality. The living patriot pleads, O ye national deputies, do not the dead patriots plead? The twelve hundred that lie in cold obstruction, do not they plead? And petition, in death's dumb show, from their narrow house there, more eloquently than speech? Crippled patriots hop on crutches round the salle de manege, demanding justice. The wounded of the 10th of August, the widows and orphans of the killed petition in a body. And hop and defile, eloquently mute, through the hall, one wounded patriot, unable to hop, is borne on his bed thither, and passes shoulder high, in the horizontal posture. The convention tribune, which has paused at such sight, commences again, droning mere juristic oratory. But out of doors Paris is piping ever higher. Bull voiced Saint Hurich is heard. And the hysteric eloquence of Mother Duchesse, varlet, apostle of liberty, with pike and red cap, flies hastily, carrying his oratorical folding stool. Justice on the traitor! cries all the patriot world. Consider also this other cry, heard loud on the streets give us bread, or else kill us. Bread and equality, justice on the traitor, that we may have bread. The limited or undecided patriot is set against the decided. Mayor Chambon heard of dreadful rioting at the Theatre de la Nation, it had come to rioting, and even to fistwork, between the decided and the undecided, touching a new drama called Ami de Lois, Friend of the Laws. One of the poorest dramas ever written, but which had didactic applications in it, wherefore powdered wigs of friends of order and black hair of Jacobin heads are flying there, and Mayor Chambon hastens with Santerre, in hopes to quell it. Far from quelling it, our poor mayor gets so, squeezed, says the report, and likewise so blamed and bullied, say we, that he, with regret, quits the brief mayoralty altogether, his lungs being affected. This miserable Amos de Lois is debated of in the convention itself, so violent, mutually enraged, are the limited patriots and the unlimited. Between which two classes, are not aristocrats enough, and crypto-aristocrats, busy? Spies running over from London with important packets, spies pretending to run. One of these latter, Viard was the name of him, pretended to accuse Roland, and even the wife of Roland, to the joy of Chabot and the mountain. But the wife of Roland came, being summoned, on the instant, to the convention hall, came, in her high clearness, and, with few clear words, dissipated this viard into despicability in air, all friends of order applauding. So, with theatre riots, and, bread, or else kill us, with rage, hunger, preternatural suspicion, does this wild Paris pipe. Roland grows ever more querulous, in his messages and letters, rising almost to the hysterical pitch. Murat, whom no power on earth can prevent seeing into traitors and Rolands, takes to bed for three days. Almost dead, the invaluable people's friend, with heartbreak, with fever and headache, oh, Puppel Babillard, si too survives a gear, people of babblers, if thou couldst but act. To crown all, victorious de Mourier, in these New Year's days, is arrived in Paris, one fears, for no good. He pretends to be complaining of Minister Patch, and Hassenfrat's dilapidations. To be concerting measures for the spring campaign, one finds him much in the company of the Girondins. Plotting with them against Jacobinism, against equality, and the punishment of Louis. We have letters of his to the convention itself. Will he act the old Lafayette part, this new victorious general? Let him withdraw again, not undenounced. And still, in the convention tribune, it drones continually, mere juristic eloquence, and hypothesis without action. 
and there are still fifties on the president's list. Nay these Gironda presidents give their own party preference, we suspect they play foul with the list, men of the mountain cannot be heard. And still it drones, all through December into January and a new year, and there is no end. Paris pipes round it, multitudinous, ever higher, to the note of the whirlwind. Paris will, bring cannon from St. Denis. There is talk of, shutting the barriers, to Roland's horror. Whereupon, behold, the convention tribune suddenly ceases droning, we cut short, be on the list who likes, and make end. On Tuesday next, the 15th of January 1793, it shall go to the vote, name by name, and, one way or other, this great game play itself out. Chapter 3.2.7 The Three Votings Is Louis Capet guilty of conspiring against liberty? Shall our sentence be itself final, or need ratifying by appeal to the people? If guilty, what punishment? This is the form agreed to, after uproar and several hours of tumultuous indecision these are the three successive questions, whereon the convention shall now pronounce. Paris floods round their hall, multitudinous, many sounding. Europe and all nations listen for their answer. Deputy after deputy shall answer to his name, guilty or not guilty. As to the guilt, there is, as above hinted, no doubt in the mind of patriot man. Overwhelming majority pronounces guilt. The unanimous convention votes for guilt, only some feeble twenty-eight voting not innocence, but refusing to vote at all. Neither does the second question prove doubtful, whatever the Girondins might calculate. Would not appeal to the people be another name for civil war? Majority of two to one answers that there shall be no appeal, this also is settled. Loud patriotism, now at ten o'clock, may hush itself for the night and retire to its bed not without hope. Tuesday has gone well. On the morrow comes, what punishment? On the morrow is the tug of war. Consider therefore if, on this Wednesday morning, there is an affluence of patriotism. If Paris stands a tiptoe, and all deputies are at their post. 749 honorable deputies, only some 20 absent on mission, Ducatel and some seven others absent by sickness. Meanwhile expectant patriotism and Paris standing a tiptoe, have need of patience. For this Wednesday again passes in debate and effervescence, Girondins proposing that a majority of three-fourths shall be required. Patriots fiercely resisting them. Danton, who has just got back from mission in the Netherlands, does obtain order of the day on this Girondin proposal. Nay he obtains further that we decide sans de semper, in permanent session, till we have done. And so, finally, at eight in the evening this third stupendous voting, by roll call or appell nominal, does begin. What punishment? Girondins undecided, patriots decided, men afraid of royalty, men afraid of anarchy, must answer here and now. Infinite patriotism, dusky in the lamplight, floods all corridors, crowds all galleries, sternly waiting to hear. Shrill-sounding ushers summon you by name and department, you must rise to the tribune and say. Eyewitnesses have represented this scene of the third voting, and of the votings that grew out of it. A scene protracted, like to be endless, lasting, with few brief intervals, from Wednesday till Sunday morning, as one of the strangest scene in the revolution. Long night wears itself into day, morning's paleness is spread over all faces. And again the wintry shadows sink, and the dim lamps are lit, but through day and night and the vicissitude of hours, member after member is mounting continually those tribune steps. Pausing aloft there, in the clearer upper light, to speak his fate word, then diving down into the dusk and throng again. Like phantoms in the hour of midnight, most spectral, pandemonial. Never did President Vergniaud, or any terrestrial president, superintend the like. A king's life, and so much else that depends thereon, hangs trembling in the balance. Man after man mounts, the buzz hushes itself till he have spoken, death. Banishment, imprisonment till the peace. Many say, death, with what cautious well-studied phrases and paragraphs they could devise, of explanation, of enforcement, of faint recommendation to mercy. 
many too say, banishment, something short of death. The balance trembles, none can yet guess whitherward. Whereat anxious patriotism bellows, irrepressible by ushers. The poor Girondins, many of them, under such fierce bellowing of patriotism, say death. Justifying, motivant, that most miserable word of theirs by some brief casuistry and Jesuitry. Verdniot himself says, death, justifying by Jesuitry. Rich Le Pelletier Saint Fargeau had been of the noblesse, and then of the patriot left side, in the constituent, and had argued and reported, there and elsewhere, not a little, against capital punishment, nevertheless he now says, death. A word which may cost him dear. Manuel did surely rank with the decided in August last, but he has been sinking and backsliding ever since September, and the scenes of September. In this convention, above all, no word he could speak would find favor, he says now, banishment, and in mute wrath quits the place forever, much hustled in the corridors. Felipe Galate votes in his soul and conscience, death, at the sound of which, and of whom, even patriotism shakes its head, and there runs a groan and shudder through this hall of doom. Robespierre's vote cannot be doubtful, his speech is long. Men see the figure of shrill sighs ascend, hardly pausing, passing merely, this figure says, La Mort Sans phrase, death without phrases, and fares onward and downward. Most spectral, pandemonial. And yet if the reader fancy it of a funereal, sorrowful or even grave character, he is far mistaken. The ushers in the mountain quarter, says Mercier, had become as box openers at the opera. Opening and shutting of galleries for privileged persons, for Diorlans Egalitaeus mistresses, or other high dyes and women of condition, rustling with laces and tricolor. Gallant deputies pass and repass thitherward, treating them with ices, refreshments and small talk, the high dyes and heads beck responsive, some have their card and pin, pricking down the eyes and nose, as at a game of rouge et noir. Further aloft reigns Mère Duchesse with her unrouged Amazons, she cannot be prevented making long hahas, when the vote is not la mort. In these galleries there is refection, drinking of wine and brandy, as in open tavern, and plain tabaji. Betting goes on in all coffeehouses of the neighborhood. But within doors, fatigue, impatience, uttermost weariness sits now on all visages, lighted up only from time to time, by turns of the game. Members have fallen asleep. Ushers come and awaken them to vote, other members calculate whether they shall not have time to run and dine. Figures rise, like phantoms, pale in the dusky lamplight, utter from this tribune, only one word, death. Tout est optique, says Mercier, the world is all an optical shadow. Deep in the Thursday night, when the voting is done, and secretaries are summing it up, sick Ducatel, more spectral than another, comes borne on a chair, wrapped in blankets, in nightgown and nightcap. To vote for mercy, one vote it is thought may turn the scale. Ah no! In profoundest silence, President Vergniad, with a voice full of sorrow, has to say, I declare, in the name of the convention, that the punishment it pronounces on Louis Capet is that of death. Death by a small majority of fifty-three. Nay, if we deduct from the one side, and add to the other, a certain twenty-six, who said death but coupled some faintest ineffectual surmise of mercy with it, the majority will be but one. Death is the sentence, but its execution. It is not executed yet. Scarcely is the vote declared when Lewis's three advocates enter, with protest in his name, with demand for delay, for appeal to the people. For this do DCs and Tranchette plead, with brief eloquence, brave old Malherb pleads for it with eloquent want of eloquence, in broken sentences, in embarrassment and sobs. That brave time-honored face, with its gray strength, its broad sagacity and honesty, is mastered with emotion, melts into dumb tears. They reject the appeal to the people, that having been already settled. But as to the delay, what they call Sir Cis, it shall be considered, shall be voted for tomorrow at present we adjourn. Whereupon patriotism hisses from the mountain, but a tyrannical majority has so decided, and adjourns. There is still this fourth vote then, growls indignant patriotism, this vote, and who knows what other votes, and adjournments of voting, and the whole matter still hovering hypothetical. 
And at every new vote those Jesuit Girondins, even they who voted for death, would so fain find a loophole. Patriotism must watch and rage. Tyrannical adjournments there have been. One, and now another at midnight on plea of fatigue, all Friday wasted in hesitation and higgling, in recounting of the votes, which are found correct as they stood. Patriotism bays fiercer than ever. Patriotism, by long watching, has become red-eyed, almost rabid. Delay, yes or no, men do vote it finally, all Saturday, all day and night. Men's nerves are worn out, men's hearts are desperate, now it shall end. Vergniad, spite of the baying, ventures to say yes, delay, though he had voted death. Philippe Galate says, in his soul and conscience, no. The next member mounting, since Philippe says no, I for my part say yes, moi j'ai dis oui. The balance still trembles. Till finally, at three o'clock on Sunday morning, we have, no delay, by a majority of seventy, death within four and twenty hours. Garrett Minister of Justice has to go to the temple, with this stern message, he ejaculates repeatedly, Cal Commission Afri use, what a frightful function. Lewis begs for a confessor, for yet three days of life, to prepare himself to die. The confessor is granted, the three days and all respite are refused. There is no deliverance, then. Thick stone walls answer, none, has King Louis no friends. Men of action, of courage grown desperate, in this his extreme need. King Louis's friends are feeble and far. Not even a voice in the coffeehouses rises for him. At me at the restaurateurs no Captain Damp Martin now dines, or sees death doing whiskerandos on furlough exhibit daggers of improved structure. Me its gallant royalists on furlough are far across the marches, they are wandering distracted over the world, or their bones lie whitening argon wood. Only some weak priests leave pamphlets on all the born stones, this night, calling for a rescue, calling for the pious women to rise, or are taken distributing pamphlets, and sent to prison. Nay there is one death-doer, of the ancient Miet sort, who, with effort, has done even less and worse, slain a deputy, and set all the patriotism of Paris on edge. It was five on Saturday evening when Le Pelletier St. Fargeau, having given his vote, no delay, ran over to Fevriers in the Palais Royal to snatch a morsel of dinner. He had dined, and was paying. A thick-set man, with black hair and blue beard, in a loose kind of frock, stepped up to him. It was, as Fevrier and the bystanders bethought them, one Paris of the old king's guard. Are you Le Pelletier? asks he. Dot. Yes. You voted in the king's business. I voted death. Celerat, take that. Cries Paris, flashing out a sabre from under his frock, and plunging it deep in Le Pelletier's side. Fevrier clutches him, but he breaks off, is gone. The voter Le Pelletier lies dead, he has expired in great pain, at one in the morning. Two hours before that vote of no delay was fully summed up. Guardsman Paris is flying over France, cannot be taken, will be found some months after, self-shot in a remote inn. Robespierre sees reason to think that Prince d'Artois himself is privately in town, that the convention will be butchered in the lump. Patriotism sounds mere wail and vengeance, Santerre doubles and trebles all his patrols. Pity is lost in rage and fear, the convention has refused the three days of life and all respite. Chapter 3.2.8 Place de la Revolution To this conclusion, then, hast thou come, O hapless Louis. The son of sixty kings is to die on the scaffold by form of law. Under sixty kings this same form of law, form of society, has been fashioning itself together, these thousand years, and has become, one way and other, a most strange machine. Surely, if needful, it is also frightful this machine, dead, blind, not what it should be, which, with swift stroke, or by cold slow torture, has wasted the lives and souls of innumerable men. And behold now a king himself, or say rather kinghood in his person, is to expire here in cruel tortures, like a phalaris shut in the belly of his own red-heated brazen bull. It is ever so. And thou shouldst know it, O haughty tyrannous man, 
injustice breeds injustice, curses and falsehoods do verily, return always home, wide as they may wander. Innocent Lewis bears the sins of many generations, he too experiences that man's tribunal is not in this earth, that if he had no higher one, it were not well with him. A king dying by such violence appeals impressively to the imagination. As the like must do, and ought to do. And yet at bottom it is not the king dying, but the man. Kingship is a coat, the grand loss is of the skin. The man from whom you take his life, to him can the whole combined world do more. Lally went on his hurdle, his mouth filled with a gag. Miserablest mortals, doomed for picking pockets, have a whole five-act tragedy in them, in that dumb pain, as they go to the gallows, unregarded. They consume the cup of trembling down to the lees. For kings and for beggars, for the justly doomed and the unjustly, it is a hard thing to die. Pity them all, thy utmost pity with all aids and appliances and thrown and scaffold contrasts, how far short is it of the thing pitted. A confessor has come. Abbe Edgeworth, of Irish extraction, whom the king knew by good report, has come promptly on this solemn mission. Leave the earth alone, then, thou hapless king, it with its malice will go its way, thou also canst go thine. A hard scene yet remains, the parting with our loved ones. Kind hearts, environed in the same grim peril with us, to be left here. Let the reader look with the eyes of Valet Clary, through these glass doors, where also the municipality watches. And see the cruelest of scenes. At half past eight, the door of the anteroom opened, the queen appeared first, leading her son by the hand, then Madame Royale and Madame Elizabeth, they all flung themselves into the arms of the king. Silence reigned for some minutes, interrupted only by sobs. The queen made a movement to lead his majesty towards the inner room, where M. Edgeworth was waiting unknown to them, no, said the king, let us go into the dining room, it is there only that I can see you. They entered there, I shut the door of it, which was of glass. The king sat down, the queen on his left hand, Madame Elizabeth on his right, Madame Royale almost in front, the young prince remained standing between his father's legs. They all leaned towards him, and often held him embraced. This scene of woe lasted an hour and three quarters, during which we could hear nothing, we could see only that always when the king spoke, the sobbings of the princesses redoubled, continued for some minutes. And that then the king began again to speak. And so our meetings and our partings do now end. The sorrows we gave each other. The poor joys we faithfully shared, and all our lovings and our sufferings, and confused toilings under the earthly sun, are over. Thou good soul, I shall never, never through all ages of time, see thee any more, never. O reader, knowest thou that hard word? For nearly two hours this agony lasts, then they tear themselves asunder. Promise that you will see us on the morrow. He promises, ah yes, yes, yet once, and go now, ye loved ones. Cry to God for yourselves and me, it was a hard scene, but it is over. He will not see them on the morrow. The queen in passing through the anteroom glanced at the Cerberus municipals. And with woman's vehemence, said through her tears, Vu eats two decelerats. King Louis slept sound, till five in the morning, when Clary, as he had been ordered, awoke him. Clary dressed his hair. While this went forward, Louis took a ring from his watch, and kept trying it on his finger, it was his wedding ring, which he is now to return to the queen as a mute farewell. At half past six, he took the sacrament. And continued in devotion and conference with Abbe Edgeworth. He will not see his family, it were too hard to bear. At eight, the municipals enter, the king gives them his will and messages and effects. Which they, at first, brutally refuse to take charge of, he gives them a roll of gold pieces, a hundred and twenty-five louis, these are to be returned to Malherbe, who had lent them. At nine, Santerre says the hour is come. The king begs yet to retire for three minutes. At the end of three minutes, Santerre again says the hour is come. Stamping on the ground with his right foot, Louis answers, Partons, let us go. How the rolling of those drums comes in, 
through the temple bastions and bulwarks, on the heart of a queenly wife, soon to be a widow. He is gone, then, and has not seen us. A queen weeps bitterly, a king's sister and children. Over all these four does death also hover, all shall perish miserably save one, she, as Duchesse d'Angouline, will live, not happily. At the temple gate were some faint cries, perhaps from voices of pitiful women, Grace. Grace. Through the rest of the streets there is silence as of the grave. No man not armed is allowed to be there, the armed, did any even pity, dare not express it, each man overawed by all his neighbors. All windows are down, none seen looking through them. All shops are shut. No wheel carriage rolls this morning, in these streets but one only. Eighty thousand armed men stand ranked, like armed statues of men. Cannons bristle, cannoneers with match burning, but no word or movement, it is as a city enchanted into silence and stone, one carriage with its escort, slowly rumbling, is the only sound. Lewis reads, in his Book of Devotion, The Prayers of the Dying, clatter of this death march falls sharp on the ear, in the great silence, but the thought would fain struggle heavenward, and forget the earth. As the clock strike ten, behold the place de la Revolution, once place de Louis Quinn's, the guillotine, mounted near the old pedestal where once stood the statue of that Louis. Far round, all bristles with cannons and armed men, spectators crowding in the rear, Diorland's Egalité there in Cabriolet. Swift messengers, Hokadans, speed to the town hall, every three minutes, nearby is the convention sitting, vengeful for Le Pelletier. Heedless of all, Louis reads his prayers of the dying, not till five minutes yet has he finished. Then the carriage opens. What temper he is in. Ten different witnesses will give ten different accounts of it. He is in the collision of all tempers. Arrived now at the black maelstrom and descent of death, in sorrow, in indignation, in resignation struggling to be resigned. Take care of M. Edgeworth, he straightly charges the lieutenant who is sitting with them, then they too descend. The drums are beating, Taisez vous, silence, he cries, in a terrible voice, Dune voix terrible. He mounts the scaffold, not without delay, he is in puce coat, breeches of grey, white stockings. He strips off the coat. Stands disclosed in a sleeve waistcoat of white flannel. The executioners approach to bind him, he spurns, resists, Abbe Edgeworth has to remind him how the Saviour, in whom men trust, submitted to be bound. His hands are tied, his head bare. The fatal moment is come. He advances to the edge of the scaffold, his face very red, and says, Frenchman, I die innocent it is from the scaffold and near appearing before God that I tell you so. I pardon my enemies. I desire that France, a general on horseback, Santerre, or another, prances out with uplifted hand, tambours. The drums drown the voice. Executioners do your duty. The executioners, desperate lest themselves be murdered, for Santerre and his armed ranks will strike, if they do not, seize the hapless Louis, six of them desperate, him singly desperate, struggling there, and bind him to their plank. Abbe Edgeworth, stooping, bespeaks him, son of St. Louis, ascend to heaven. The axe clanks down, a king's life is shorn away. It is Monday the 21st of January, 1793. He was aged 38 years four months and 28 days. Executioner Samson shoes the head, fierce shout of Vive la Republic rises, and swells, caps raised on bayonets, hats waving, students of the College of Four Nations take it up, on the far quays, fling it over Paris. Orleans drives off in his cabriolet, the town hall councillors rub their hands, saying, it is done, it is done. There is dipping of handkerchiefs, of pike points in the blood. Headsman Samson, though he afterwards denied it, sells locks of the hair, fractions of the puce coat are long after worn in rings. And so, in some half hour it is done, and the multitude has all departed. Pastry cooks, coffee sellers, milkmen sing out their trivial quotidian cries, the world wags on, as if this were a common day. In the coffee houses that evening, says Prudhomme, Patriot shook hands with Patriot in a more cordial manner than usual. 
Not till some days after, according to Mercier, did public men see what a grave thing it was. A grave thing it indisputably is, and will have consequences. On the moral morning, Roland, so long steeped to the lips in disgust and chagrin, sends in his demission. His accounts lie already, correct and black on white to the uttermost farthing, these he wants but to have audited, that he might retire to remote obscurity to the country and his books. They will never be audited those accounts. He will never get retired thither. It was on Tuesday that Roland de Meet. On Thursday comes Le Pelletier Saint Fargeau's funeral, and passage to the pantheon of great men. Notable as the wild pageant of a winter day. The body is borne aloft, half bare, the winding sheet disclosing the death wound, saber and bloody clothes parade themselves, a lugubrious music wailing harsh ninii. Oak crowns shower down from windows. President Vergniaud walks there, with convention, with Jacobin society, and all patriots of every color, all mourning brotherlike. Notable also for another thing, this burial of Le Pelletier, it was the last act these men ever did with concert. All parties and figures of opinion, that agitate this distracted France and its convention, now stand, as it were, face to face, and dagger to dagger, the king's life, round which they all struck and battled, being hurled down. Du Maurier, conquering Holland, growls ominous discontent, at the head of armies. Men say Du Maurier will have a king, that young d'Orleans Egalité shall be his king. Deputy Fauchet, in the journal de Amos, curses his day, more bitterly than Job did. Invokes the poniards of regicides, of heiress vipers, or Robespierre's, of Pluto Dantons, of horrid butchers Legendre and Simulacre de Herboys, to send him swiftly to another world than theirs. This is Te Deum Fauchet, of the Bastille Victory, of the Circle Social. Sharp was the death hail rattling round one's flag of truce, on that Bastille day, but it was soft to such wreckage of high hope as this. One's new golden era going down in leaden dross, and sulfurous black of the everlasting darkness. At home this killing of a king has divided all friends, and abroad it has united all enemies. Fraternity of peoples, revolutionary propagandism. Atheism, regicide, total destruction of social order in this world. All kings, and lovers of kings, and haters of anarchy, rank in coalition, as in a war for life. England signifies to citizen Chauvelin, the ambassador, or rather ambassador's cloak, that he must quit the country in eight days. Ambassador's cloak and ambassador, Chauvelin and Talleyrand, depart accordingly. Talleyrand, implicated in that iron press of the Tilleries, thinks it safest to make for America. England has cast out the embassy, England declares war, being shocked principally, it would seem, at the condition of the river Skelt. Spain declares war, being shocked principally at some other thing, which doubtless the manifesto indicates. Nay we find it was not England that declared war first, or Spain first, but that France herself declared war first on both of them. A point of immense parliamentary and journalistic interest in those days, but which has become of no interest whatever in these. They all declare war. The sword is drawn, the scabbard thrown away. It is even as Danton said, in one of his all too gigantic figures, the coalized kings threaten us, we hurl at their feet, as gauge of battle, the head of a king. Book 3.3 The Girondins Chapter 3.3.I Cause and Effect This huge insurrectionary movement, which we liken to a breaking out of Tophet and the Abyss, has swept away royalty, aristocracy, and a king's life. The question is, what will it next do, how will it henceforth shape itself? Settle down into a reign of law and liberty, according as the habits, persuasions and endeavors of the educated, moneyed, respectable class prescribe? That is to say, the volcanic lava flood, bursting up in the manner described, will explode and flow according to Girondin formula and pre-established rule of philosophy? If so, for our Girondin friends it will be well. Meanwhile were not the prophecy rather that as no external force, royal or other, now remains which could control this movement, the movement will follow a course of its own, probably a very original one. Further, 
that whatsoever man or men can best interpret the inward tendencies it has, and give them voice and activity, will obtain the lead of it. For the rest, that is a thing without order, a thing proceeding from beyond and beneath the region of order, it must work and welter, not as a regularity but as a chaos, destructive and self-destructive. Always till something that has order arise, strong enough to bind it into subjection again. Which something, we may further conjecture, will not be a formula, with philosophical propositions and forensic eloquence. But a reality, probably with a sword in its hand. As for the Girondin formula, of a respectable republic for the middle classes, all manner of aristocracies being now sufficiently demolished, there seems little reason to expect that the business will stop there. Liberty, equality, fraternity, these are the words, enunciative and prophetic. Republic for the respectable washed middle classes, how can that be the fulfillment thereof? Hunger and nakedness, and nightmare oppression lying heavy on twenty-five million hearts. This, not the wounded vanities or contradicted philosophies of philosophical advocates, rich shopkeepers, rural noblesse, was the prime mover in the French Revolution, as the like will be in all such revolutions, in all countries. Feudal fleur de lis had become an insupportably bad marching banner, and needed to be torn and trampled, but money bag of mammon, for that, in these times, is what the respectable republic for the middle classes will signify, is a still worse. While it lasts. Properly, indeed, it is the worst and basest of all banners, and symbols of dominion among men, and indeed is possible only in a time of general atheism, and unbelief in anything save in brute force and sensualism. Pride of birth, pride of office, any known kind of pride being a degree better than purse pride. Freedom, equality, brotherhood, not in the money bag, but far elsewhere, will sansculottism seek these things. We say therefore that an insurrectionary France, loose of control from without, destitute of supreme order from within, will form one of the most tumultuous activities ever seen on this earth, such as no Girondin formula can regulate. An immeasurable force, made up of forces manifold, heterogeneous, compatible and incompatible. In plainer words, this France must need split into parties, each of which seeking to make itself good, contradiction, exasperation will arise. And parties on parties find that they cannot work together, cannot exist together. As for the number of parties, there will, strictly counting, be as many parties as there are opinions. According to which rule, in this national convention itself, to say nothing of France generally, the number of parties ought to be 749, for every unit entertains his opinion. But now as every unit has at once an individual nature, or necessity to follow his own road, and a gregarious nature or necessity to see himself travelling by the side of others, what can there be but dissolutions, precipitations? Endless turbulence of attracting and repelling. Till once the master element get evolved, and this wild alchemy arrange itself again. To the length of 749 parties, however, no nation was ever yet seen to go. Nor indeed much beyond the length of two parties, two at a time. So invincible is man's tendency to unite, with all the invincible divisiveness he has. Two parties, we say, are the usual number at one time, let these two fight it out, all minor shades of party rallying under the shade likest them. When the one has fought down the other, then it, in its turn, may divide, self-destructive, and so the process continue, as far as needful. This is the way of revolutions, which spring up as the French one has done. When the so-called bonds of society snap asunder, and all laws that are not laws of nature become naught and formulas merely. But quitting these somewhat abstract considerations, let history note this concrete reality which the streets of Paris exhibit, on Monday the 25th of February, 1793. Long before daylight that morning, these streets are noisy and angry. Petitioning enough there has been, a convention often solicited. It was but yesterday there came a deputation of washerwomen with petition, complaining that not so much as soap could be had, to say nothing of bread, and condiments of bread. The cry of women, round the salle de manege, was heard plaintive, du pain et du savon, bread and soap. And now from six o'clock, this Monday morning, 
one perceives the baker's cues unusually expanded, angrily agitating themselves. Not the baker alone, but two section commissioners to help him, manage with difficulty the daily distribution of loaves. Soft-spoken assiduous, in the early candlelight, are baker and commissioners, and yet the pale chill February sunrise discloses an unpromising scene. Indignant female patriots, partly supplied with bread, rush now to the shops, declaring that they will have groceries. Groceries enough, sugar barrels rolled forth into the street, patriot citoyens weighing it out at a just rate of eleven pence a pound. Likewise coffee chests, soap chests, nay cinnamon and cloves chests, with a quavity in other forms of alcohol, at a just rate, which some do not pay, the pale-faced grocer silently wringing his hands. What help? The distributive citoyens are a violent speech and gesture, their long humanity's hair hanging out of curl, nay in their girdles pistols are seen sticking, some, it is even said, have beards, male patriots in petticoats and mob cap. Thus, in the streets of Lombards, in the street of Five Diamonds, street of Pulleys, in most streets of Paris does it effervesce, the live long day. No municipality, no mayor patch, though he was war minister lately, sends military against it, or ought against it but persuasive eloquence, till seven at night, or later. On Monday gone five weeks, which was the 21st of January, we saw Paris, beheading its king, stand silent, like a petrified city of enchantment, and now on this Monday it is so noisy, selling sugar. Cities, especially cities in revolution, are subject to these alternations, the secret courses of civic business and existence effervescing and efflorescing, in this manner, as a concrete phenomenon to the eye. Of which phenomenon, when secret existence becoming public efflorescence on the street, the philosophical cause and effect is not so easy to find. What, for example, may be the accurate philosophical meaning, and meanings, of this sale of sugar? These things that have become visible in the street of Pulleys and over Paris, whence are they, we say, and whither? That pit has a hand in it, the gold of pit, so much, to all reasonable patriot men, may seem clear. But then, through what agents of pit? Varlet, apostle of liberty, was discerned again of late, with his pike and his red nightcap. Deputy Marat published in his journal, this very day, complaining of the bitter scarcity, and sufferings of the people, till he seemed to get wroth, if your rights of man were anything but a piece of written paper, the plunder of a few shops. And a forestaller or two hung up at the door lintels, would put an end to such things. Are not these, say the Girondins, pregnant indications? Pitt has bribed the anarchists, Marat is the agent of Pitt, hence this sale of sugar. To the mother society, again, it is clear that the scarcity is factitious. Is the work of Girondins, and such like, a set of men sold partly to Pitt, sold wholly to their own ambitions, and hard-hearted pedantries, who will not fix the grain prices, but prate pedantically of free trade? Wishing to starve Paris into violence, and embroil it with the departments, hence this sale of sugar. And, alas, if to these two notabilities, of a phenomenon and such theories of a phenomenon, we add this third notability, that the French nation has believed, for several years now, in the possibility, nay certainty in near advent. Of a universal millennium, or reign of freedom, equality, fraternity, wherein man should be the brother of man, and sorrow and sin flee away. Not bread to eat, nor soap to wash with, and the reign of perfect felicity ready to arrive, do always since the Bastille fell. How did our hearts burn within us, at that feast of pikes, when brother flung himself on brother's bosom. And in sunny jubilee, twenty-five millions burst forth into sound and cannon smoke. Bright was our hope then, as sunlight, red angry is our hope grown now, as consuming fire. But, O oh heavens, what enchantment is it, or devilish ledger domain, of such effect, that perfect felicity, always within arm's length, could never be laid hold of, but only in her stead controversy in scarcity. This set of traitors after that set. Tremble, ye traitors, dread a people which calls itself patient, long-suffering, but which cannot always submit to have its pocket picked, in this way, of a millennium. Yes, reader, here is a miracle. Out of that putrescent rubbish of skepticism, sensualism, 
sentimentalism, hollow Machiavellism, such a faith has verily risen, flaming in the heart of a people. A whole people, awakening as it were to consciousness in deep misery, believes that it is within reach of a fraternal heaven on earth. With longing arms, it struggles to embrace the unspeakable, cannot embrace it, owing to certain causes. Seldom do we find that a whole people can be said to have any faith at all, except in things which it can eat and handle. Whensoever it gets any faith, its history becomes spirit-stirring, noteworthy. But since the time when steel Europe shook itself simultaneously, at the word of Hermit Peter, and rushed towards the sepulchre where God had lain, there was no universal impulse of faith that one could note. Since Protestantism went silent, no Luther's voice, no Ziska's drum any longer proclaiming that God's truth was not the devil's lie, and the last of the Cameronians, Renwick was the name of him, honour to the name of the brave. Sank, shot, on the castle hill of Edinburgh, there was no partial impulse of faith among nations. Till now, behold, once more this French nation believes. Herein, we say, in that astonishing faith of theirs, lies the miracle. It is a faith undoubtedly of the more prodigious sort, even among faiths, and will embody itself in prodigies. It is the soul of that world prodigy named French Revolution, whereat the world still gazes and shudders. But, for the rest, let no man ask history to explain by cause and effect how the business proceeded henceforth. This battle of Mountain and Gironda, and what follows, is the battle of fanaticisms and miracles, unsuitable for cause and effect. The sound of it, to the mind, is as a hubbub of voices in distraction, little of articulate is to be gathered by long listening and studying, only battle tumult, shouts of triumph, shrieks of despair. The mountain has left no memoirs. The Girondins have left memoirs, which are too often little other than long-drawn interjections, of woe is me and cursed be ye. So soon as history can philosophically delineate the conflagration of a kindled fireship, she may try this other task. Here lay the bitumen stratum, there the brimstone one, so ran the vein of gunpowder, of niter, terebinth, and foul grease, this, were she inquisitive enough, history might partly know. But how they acted and reacted below decks, one fire stratum playing into the other, by its nature and the art of man, now when all hands ran raging, and the flames lashed high over shrouds and topmast, this let not history attempt. The fireship is old France, the old French form of life, her creed a generation of men. Wild are their cries and their ragings there, like spirits tormented in that flame. But, on the whole, are they not gone, O oh reader? Their fireship and they, frightening the world, have sailed away, its flames and its thunders quite away, into the deep of time. One thing therefore history will do, pity them all, for it went hard with them all. Not even the sea-green incorruptible but shall have some pity, some human love, though it takes an effort. And now, so much once thoroughly attained, the rest will become easier. To the eye of equal brotherly pity, innumerable perversions dissipate themselves, exaggerations and execrations fall off, of their own accord. Standing wistfully on the safe shore, we will look, and see, what is of interest to us, what is adapted to us. Chapter 3.3.2 Colotic and Sansculotic Gironda and Mountain are now in full quarrel. Their mutual rage, says Talonjan, is growing a pale rage. Curious, lamentable, all these men have the word republic on their lips. In the heart of every one of them is a passionate wish for something which he calls republic, yet see their death quarrel. So, however, are men made. Creatures who live in confusion. Who, once thrown together, can readily fall into that confusion of confusions which quarrel is, simply because their confusions differ from one another, still more because they seem to differ. Men's words are a poor exponent of their thought. Nay their thought itself is a poor exponent of the inward unnamed mystery, wherefrom both thought and action have their birth. No man can explain himself, can get himself explained. Men see not one another but distorted phantasms which they call one another, which they hate and go to battle with, for all battle is well said to be misunderstanding. But indeed that similitude of the fireship. Of our poor French brethren, 
so fiery themselves, working also in an element of fire, was not insignificant. Consider it well, there is a shade of the truth in it. For a man, once committed headlong to republican or any other transcendentalism, and fighting and fanaticizing amid a nation of his like, becomes as it were enveloped in an ambient atmosphere of transcendentalism and delirium, his individual self is lost in something that is not himself, but foreign though inseparable from him. Strange to think of, the man's cloak still seems to hold the same man, and yet the man is not there, his volition is not there, nor the source of what he will do and devise. Instead of the man and his volition there is a piece of fanaticism and fatalism incarnated in the shape of him. He, the hapless incarnated fanaticism, goes his road, no man can help him, he himself least of all. It is a wonderful tragical predicament, such as human language, and used to deal with these things, being contrived for the uses of common life, struggles to shadow out in figures. The ambient element of material fire is not wilder than this of fanaticism, nor, though visible to the eye, is it more real. Volition bursts forth involuntary, wrapped along. The movement of free human minds becomes a raging tornado of fatalism, blind as the winds, and mountain and gironda, when they recover themselves, are alike astounded to see where it has flung and dropped them. To such height of miracle can men work on men, the conscious and the unconscious blended inscrutably in this our inscrutable life, endless necessity environing free will. The weapons of the Girondins are political philosophy, respectability, and eloquence. Eloquence, or call it rhetoric, really of a superior order, Vergniad, for instance, turns a period as sweetly as any man of that generation. The weapons of the mountain are those of mere nature, audacity and impetuosity which may become ferocity, as of men complete in their determination, in their conviction, nay of men, in some cases, who as Septemberers must either prevail or perish. The ground to be fought for is popularity, further you may either seek popularity with the friends of freedom and order, or with the friends of freedom simple, to seek it with both has unhappily become impossible. With the former sort, and generally with the authorities of the departments, and such as read parliamentary debates, and are of respectability, and of a peace-loving moneyed nature, the Girondins carry it. With the extreme patriot again, with the indigent millions, especially with the population of Paris who do not read so much as hear and see, the Girondins altogether lose it, and the mountain carries it. Egoism, nor meanness of mind, is not wanting on either side. Surely not on the Girondin side, where in fact the instinct of self-preservation, too prominently unfolded by circumstances, cuts almost a sorry figure. Where also a certain finesse, to the length even of shuffling and shamming, now and then shoes itself. They are men skillful in advocate fence. They have been called the Jesuits of the Revolution, but that is too hard a name. It must be owned likewise that this rude blustering mountain has a sense in it of what the Revolution means, which these eloquent Girondins are totally void of. Was the Revolution made, and fought for, against the world, these four weary years, that a formula might be substantiated, that society might become methodic, demonstrable by logic, and the old noblesse with their pretensions vanish? Or ought it not withal to bring some glimmering of light and alleviation to the twenty-five millions, who sat in darkness, heavy laden, till they rose with pikes in their hands? At least and lowest, one would think, it should bring them a proportion of bread to live on. There is in the mountain here and there, in Marat people's friend. In the incorruptible sea green himself, though otherwise so lean and formularly, a heartfelt knowledge of this latter fact. Without which knowledge all other knowledge here is not, and the choicest forensic eloquence is as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Most cold, on the other hand, most patronizing, unsubstantial is the tone of the Girondins towards our poorer brethren. Those brethren whom one often hears of under the collective name of the masses, as if they were not persons at all, but mounds of combustible explosive material, for blowing down Bastilles with. In very truth, a revolutionist of this kind, is he not a solecism? Disowned by nature and art, deserving only to be erased, and disappear. Surely, to our poorer brethren of Paris, all this Girondin patronage sounds deadening and killing, if fine-spoken and incontrovertible in logic, then all the falser, all the hateful in fact. 
nay doubtless, pleading for popularity, here among our poorer brethren of Paris, the Girondin has a hard game to play. If he gain the ear of the respectable at a distance, it is by insisting on September and such like. It is at the expense of this Paris where he dwells and pirorates. Hard to pirorate in such an auditory. Wherefore the question arises, could we not get ourselves out of this Paris? Twice or oftener such an attempt is made. If not we ourselves, thinks Guadet, then at least our supplines might do it. For every deputy has his suppliant, or substitute, who will take his place if need be, might not these assemble, say at Bourges, which is a quiet episcopal town, in quiet Berry, forty good leagues off. In that case, what profit were it for the Paris sans to insult us, our supplines sitting quiet in Bourges, to whom we could run? Nay even the primary electoral assemblies, thinks Guadet, might be reconvoked, and a new convention got, with new orders from the sovereign people. And right glad were Lyons, were Bordeaux, Rouen, Marseilles, as yet provincial towns, to welcome us in their turn, and become a sort of capital towns, and teach these Parisians reason. Fond schemes, which all misgo. If decreed, in heat of eloquent logic, today, they are repealed, by clamor, and passionate wider considerations, on the morrow. Will you, O Girondins, parcel us into separate republics, then, like the Swiss, like your Americans? So that there be no metropolis or indivisible French nation any more. Your departmental guard seemed to point that way. Federal Republic. Federalist. Men and knitting women repeat Federalist, with or without much dictionary meaning. But go on repeating it, as is usual in such cases, till the meaning of it becomes almost magical, fit to designate all mystery of iniquity, and Federalist has grown a word of exorcism and a page satanus. But furthermore, consider what poisoning of public opinion, in the departments, by these brisset, courses, caritat condorcet newspapers. And then also what counterpoisoning, still feller in quality, by a pair du chain of Hébert, brutalist newspaper yet published on earth, by a rougeuf of Guffroy, by the incendiary leaves of Marat. More than once, on complaint given and effervescence rising, it is decreed that a man cannot both be legislator and editor, that he shall choose between the one function and the other. But this too, which indeed could help little, is revoked or eluded, remains a pious wish mainly. Meanwhile, as the sad fruit of such strife, behold, O ye national representatives, how between the friends of law and the friends of freedom everywhere, mere heats and jealousies have arisen, fevering the whole republic. Department, provincial town is set against metropolis, rich against poor, Colotic against sans -culotic, man against man. From the southern cities come addresses of an almost inculpatory character, for Paris has long suffered newspaper calumny. Bordeaux demands a reign of law and respectability, meaning Girondinism, with emphasis. With emphasis Marseilles demands the like. Nay from Marseilles there come two addresses, one Girondin, one Jacobin sans -culotic. Hot Rebecqui, sick of this convention work, has given place to his substitute, and gone home, where also, with such jarrings, there is work to be sick of. Lyons, a place of capitalists and aristocrats, is in still worse state, almost in revolt. Chalier the Jacobin town councillor has got, too literally, to daggers drawn with Nevercold cold the moderate in mayor, one of your moderate, perhaps aristocrat, royalist or federalist mayors. Chalier, who pilgrimed to Paris, to behold Marat and the mountain, has verily kindled himself at their sacred urn, for on the 6th of February last, history or rumor has seen him haranguing his lion's Jacobins in a quite transcendental manner. With a drawn dagger in his hand. Recommending, they say, sheer September methods, patience being worn out, and that the Jacobin brethren should, impromptu, work the guillotine themselves. One sees him still, in engravings, mounted on a table, foot advanced, body contorted. A bald, rude, slope-browed, infuriated visage of the canine species, the eyes starting from their sockets, in his puissant right hand the brandished dagger, or horse pistol, as some give it. Other dog visages kindling under him, a man not likely to end well. However, the guillotine was not got together impromptu, that day, on the Pont Saint-Clair, 
or elsewhere. But indeed continued lying rusty in its loft, neither coal with military went about, rumbling cannon, in the most confused manner, and the nine hundred prisoners received no hurt. So distracted is lion's groan, with its cannon rumbling. Convention commissioners must be sent thither forthwith, if even they can appease it, and keep the guillotine in its loft. Consider finally if, on all these mad jarrings of the southern cities, and of France generally, a traitorous crypto-royalist class is not looking and watching, ready to strike in, at the right season. Neither is there bread. Neither is there soap, see the patriot women selling out sugar, at a just rate of twenty-two sous per pound. Citizen representatives, it were verily well that your quarrels finished, and the reign of perfect felicity began. Chapter 3.3.3 .3. Growing Shrill On the whole, one cannot say that the Girondins are wanting to themselves, so far as goodwill might go. They prick assiduously into the sore places of the mountain, from principle, and also from Jesuitism. Besides September, of which there is now little to be made except effervescence, we discern two sore places where the mountain often suffers, Marat and Orléans Égalité. Squalid Marat, for his own sake and for the mountains, is assaulted ever and anon, held up to France, as a squalid bloodthirsty portent, inciting to the pillage of shops, of whom let the mountain have the credit. The mountain murmurs, ill at ease, this maximum of patriotism, how shall they either own him or disown him? As for Marat personally, he, with his fixed idea, remains invulnerable to such things, nay the people's friend is very evidently rising in importance, as his befriended people rises. No shrieks now, when he goes to speak. Occasional applauses rather, furtherance which breeds confidence. The day when the Girondins propose to decree him accused, decreed or deaccusation, as they phrase it, for that February paragraph, of hanging up a forestaller or two at the door lintels, Marat proposes to have them decreed insane. And, descending the tribune steps, is heard to articulate these most unsenatorial ejaculations, less cochons, less imbeciles, pigs, idiots. Oftentimes he croaks harsh sarcasm, having really a rough rasping tongue, and a very deep fund of contempt for fine outsides. And once or twice, he even laughs, nay, explodes into laughter, writ a uxa clause, at the gentilities and superfine airs of these Girondin men of statesmanship, with their pedantries, plausibilities, pusillanimities, these two years, says he. You have been whining about attacks, and plots, and danger from Paris. And you have not a scratch to shoe for yourselves. Danton gruffly rebukes him, from time to time, a maximum of patriotism, whom one can neither own nor disown. But the second sore place of the mountain is this anomalous Monsignor Equality Prince d'Orleans. Behold these men, says the Gironda, with a whilom bourbon prince among them, they are creatures of the d'Orleans faction. They will have Philippe made king, one king no sooner guillotined than another made in his stead. Girondins have moved, Buzet moved long ago, from principle and also from Jesuitism, that the whole race of Bourbons should be marched forth from the soil of France, this Prince Egalité to bring up the rear. Motions which might produce some effect on the public, which the mountain, ill at ease, knows not what to do with. And poor Orléans Egalité himself, for one begins to pity even him, what does he do with them? The disowned of all parties, the rejected and foolishly be drifted hither and hither, to what corner of nature can he now drift with advantage? Feasible hope remains not for him, unfeasible hope, in pallid doubtful glimmers, there may still come, bewildering, not cheering or illuminating, from the Dumouriez quarter. And how, if not the time-wasted Orléans Égalité, then perhaps the young unworn Chartres Égalité might rise to be a kind of king. Sheltered, if shelter it be, in the clefts of the mountain, poor Égalité will wait, one refuge in Jacobinism, one in Dumouriez in counter-revolution, are there not two chances? However, the look of him, Dame Genly says, is grown gloomy. Sad to see. Sillery also, the Genlis's husband, who hovers about the mountain, not on it, is in a bad way. Dame Genlis has come to Rainsey, out of England and Berry Street Edmonds, in these days. Being summoned by Egalité, with her young charge, 
Mademoiselle Egalité, that so Mademoiselle might not be counted among emigrants and hardly dealt with. But it proves a reveled business, Genlis and Charge find that they must retire to the Netherlands, must wait on the frontiers for a week or two, till Monsignor, by Jacobin help, get it wound up. Next morning, says Dame Genlis, Monsignor, gloomier than ever, gave me his arm, to lead me to the carriage. I was greatly troubled, Mademoiselle burst into tears, her father was pale and trembling. After I had got seated, he stood immovable at the carriage door, with his eyes fixed on me, his mournful and painful look seemed to implore pity, adieu, madam, said he. The altered sound of his voice completely overcame me. Not able to utter a word, I held out my hand, he grasped it close, then turning, and advancing sharply towards the postilions, he gave them a sign, and we rolled away. Nor are peacemakers wanting, of whom likewise we mention two. One fast on the crown of the mountain, the other not yet alighted anywhere, Danton and Berreyer. Ingenious Berreyer, old constituent and editor from the slopes of the Pyrenees, is one of the usefulest men of this convention, in his way. Truth may lie on both sides, on either side, or on neither side, my friends, ye must give and take, for the rest, success to the winning side. This is the motto of Berreyer. Ingenious, almost genial, quick-sighted, supple, graceful. A man that will prosper. Scarcely Belial in the assembled pandemonium was plausibler to ear and eye. An indispensable man, in the great art of varnish he may be said to seek his fellow. Has there an explosion arisen, as many do arise, a confusion, unsightliness, which no tongue can speak of, nor I look on, give it to Berreyer, Berreyer shall be committee reporter of it. You shall see it transmute itself into a regularity, into the very beauty and improvement that was needed. Without one such man, we say, how were this convention bested? Call him not, as exaggerative Mercier does, the greatest liar in France, nay it may be argued there is not truth enough in him to make a real lie of. Call him, with Burke, Anacreon of the Guillotine, and a man serviceable to this convention. The other peacemaker whom we name is Danton. Peace, O oh peace with one another. Cries Danton often enough, are we not alone against the world, a little band of brothers? Broad Danton is loved by all the mountain. But they think him too easy-tempered, deficient in suspicion, he has stood between de Maurier in much censure, anxious not to exasperate our only general, in the shrill tumult Danton's strong voice reverberates, for union and pacification. Meetings there are, dinings with the Girondins, it is so pressingly essential that there be union. But the Girondins are haughty and respectable, this Titan Danton is not a man of formulas, and there rests on him a shadow of September. Your Girondins have no confidence in me this is the answer a conciliatory Milan gets from him, to all the arguments and pleadings this conciliatory Milan can bring, the repeated answer is, ILS and Owen point to confidence. The tumult will get ever shriller, rage is growing pale. In fact, what a pang is it to the heart of a Girondin, this first withering probability that the despicable unphilosophic anarchic mountain, after all, may triumph. Brutal Septemberers, a fifth-floor Taulin, a Robespierre without an idea in his head, as Condorcet says, or a feeling in his heart and yet we, the flower of France, cannot stand against them, behold the scepter departs from us. From us and goes to them. Eloquence, philosophism, respectability avail not, against stupidity the very gods fight to no purpose. MIT der Dummheit kampfen Gotter selbst vergebens. Shrill are the plaints of Louvet. His thin existence all acidified into rage, and preternatural insight of suspicion. Wrath is young barbarous, wrath and scornful. Silent, like a queen with the aspic on her bosom, sits the wife of Roland. Roland's accounts never yet got audited, his name become a byword. Such is the fortune of war, especially of revolution. The great gulf of Tophet, and 10th of August, opened itself at the magic of your eloquent voice. And lo now, it will not close at your voice. It is a dangerous thing such magic. The magician's famulus got hold of the forbidden book, and summoned a goblin, Plate I L, what is your will? 
said the goblin. The famulus, somewhat struck, bade him fetch water, the swift goblin fetched it, pale in each hand, but lo, would not cease fetching it. Desperate, the famulus shrieks at him, smites at him, cuts him in two, lo, two goblin water carriers ply. And the house will be swum away in Deucalion deluges. Chapter 3.3.4 Fatherland in Danger Or rather we will say, this senatorial war might have lasted long. And party tugging and throttling with party might have suppressed and smothered one another, in the ordinary bloodless parliamentary way, on one condition, that France had been at least able to exist, all the while. But this sovereign people has a digestive faculty, and cannot do without bread. Also we are at war, and must have victory, at war with Europe, with fate and famine, and behold, in the spring of the year, all victory deserts us. Dumouriez had his outpost stretched as far as Aix la Chapelle, and the beautifulest plan for pouncing on Holland, by stratagem, flat-bottomed boats and rapid intrepidity, wherein too he had prospered so far, but unhappily could prosper no further. Aix la Chapelle is lost, Maastricht will not surrender to mere smoke and noise, the flat-bottomed boats must launch themselves again, and return the way they came. Steady now, ye rapidly intrepid men, retreat with firmness, Parthian-like. Alas, were it General Miranda's fault, were it the war minister's fault, or were it Dumouriez's own fault and that of fortune, enough, there is nothing for it but retreat, well if it be not even flight. For already terror-stricken cohorts and stragglers pour off, not waiting for order, flow disastrous, as many as ten thousand of them, without halt till they see France again. Nay worse, Dumouriez himself is perhaps secretly turning traitor. Very sharp is the tone in which he writes to our committees. Commissioners and Jacobin pillagers have done such incalculable mischief, Hassan Fratz sends neither cartridges nor clothing, shoes we have, deceptively, sold with wood and pasteboard. Nothing in short is right. Danton and Lacroix, when it was they that were commissioners, would needs join Belgium to France, of which Dumouriez might have made the prettiest little duchy for his own secret behoof. With all these things the general is wroth, and writes to us in a sharp tone. Who knows what this hot little general is meditating? Dumouriez Duke of Belgium or Brabant. And say, Egalité the younger king of France, there were an end for our revolution, committee of defence gazes, and shakes its head, who except Danton, defective in suspicion, could still struggle to be of hope. And General Custine is rolling back from the Rhine country, conquered Mentz will be reconquered, the Prussians gathering round to bombard it with shot and shell. Mentz may resist, Commissioner Merlin, the Thionviller, making sallies, at the head of the besieged, resist to the death, but not longer than that. How sad a reverse for Mentz! Brave Foster, brave Lux planted liberty trees, amid CAIRNG music, in the snow slush of last winter, there, and made Jacobin societies. And got the territory incorporated with France. They came hither to Paris, as deputies or delegates, and have their eighteen francs a day, but see, before once the liberty tree is got rightly in leaf, Mentz is changing into an explosive crater. Vomiting fire, bevomited with fire. Neither of these men shall again see Mentz, they have come hither only to die. Foster has been round the globe, he saw Cook perish under Oahe clubs, but like this Paris he has yet seen or suffered nothing. Poverty escorts him, from home there can nothing come, except jobs news, the eighteen daily francs, which we hear as deputy or delegate with difficulty, touch, are in paper assignats, and sink fast in value. Poverty, disappointment, inaction, obloquy, the brave heart slowly breaking. Such is Foster's lot. For the rest, Demoiselle Theroen smiles on you in the soirees, a beautiful brown-locked face, of an exalted temper and contrives to keep her carriage. Prussian Trank, the poor subterranean baron, jargons and jangles in an unmelodious manner. Thomas Paine's face is red-pustuled, but the eyes uncommonly bright. Convention deputies ask you to dinner, very courteous, and, we all play at plum sack. It is the explosion and new creation of a world, says Foster, and the actors in it, such small mean objects, 
buzzing round one like a handful of flies. Likewise there is war with Spain. Spain will advance through the gorges of the Pyrenees, rustling with bourbon banners, jingling with artillery and menace. And England has donned the red coat. And marches, with Royal Highness of York, whom some once spake of inviting to be our king. Change that humor now, and ever more changing, till no hatefuler thing walk this earth than a denizen of that tyrannous island. And Pitt be declared and decreed, with effervescence, l'enemy du genre humain, the enemy of mankind, and, very singular to say, you make an order that no soldier of liberty give quarter to an Englishman. Which order however, the soldier of liberty does but partially obey. We will take no prisoners then, say the soldiers of liberty, they shall all be, deserters, that we take. It is a frantic order, and attended with inconvenience. For surely, if you give no quarter, the plain issue is that you will get none, and so the business become as broad as it was long. Our, recruitment of three hundred thousand men, which was the decreed force for this year, is like to have work enough laid to its hand. So many enemies come wending on, penetrating through throats of mountains, steering over the salt sea. Towards all points of our territory, rattling chains at us. Nay worst of all, there is an enemy within our own territory itself. In the early days of March, the nonce postbags do not arrive. There arrive only instead of them conjecture, apprehension, bodeful wind of rumor. The bodefulest proves true. Those fanatic peoples of Lavade will no longer keep under, their fire of insurrection, heretofore dissipated with difficulty, blazes out anew, after the king's death, as a wide conflagration, not riot, but civil war. Your Catholinos, your Stofflets, Charettes, are other men than was thought, behold how their peasants, in mere russet and hodden, with their rude arms, rude array, with their fanatic Gaelic frenzy and wild yelling battle cry of God and the King. Dash at us like a dark whirlwind. And blow the best disciplined nationals we can get into panic and sovkaput. Field after field is theirs, one sees not where it will end. Commandant Santerre may be sent thither, but with non-effect. He might as well have returned and brewed beer. It has become peremptorily necessary that a national convention cease arguing, and begin acting. Yield one party of you to the other, and do it swiftly. No theoretic outlook is here, but the close certainty of ruin, the very day that is passing over must be provided for. It was Friday the 8th of March when this jobs post from Dumouriez, thickly preceded and escorted by so many other jobs posts, reached the National Convention. Blank enough are most faces. Little will it avail whether our Septemberers be punished or go unpunished, if Pitt and Coburg are coming in, with one punishment for us all. Nothing now between Paris itself and the tyrants but a doubtful Dumouriez, and hosts in loose-flowing loud retreat, Danton the Titan rises in this hour, as always in the hour of need. Great is his voice, reverberating from the domes, citizen representatives, shall we not, in such crisis of fate, lay aside discords? Reputation, oh what is the reputation of this man or of that? Que mon nom soit flétri, que la France soit libre, let my name be blighted, let France be free. It is necessary now again that France rise, in swift vengeance, with her million right hands, with her heart as of one man. Instantaneous recruitment in Paris, let every section of Paris furnish its thousands, every section of France. Ninety-six commissioners of us, two for each section of the forty-eight, they must go forthwith, and tell Paris what the country needs of her. Let eighty more of us be sent, post-haste, over France to spread the fire cross, to call forth the might of men. Let the eighty also be on the road, before this sitting rise. Let them go, and think what their errand is. Speedy camp of fifty thousand between Paris and the north frontier. For Paris will pour forth her volunteers. Shoulder to shoulder, one strong universal death-defiant rising and rushing, we shall hurl back these sons of night yet again, and France, in spite of the world, be free. So sounds the Titan's voice, into all section houses. Into all French hearts. Sections sit in permanence, for recruitment, enrollment, that very night. 
Convention commissioners, on swift wheels, are carrying the fire cross from town to town, till all France blaze. And so there is flag of fatherland in danger waving from the town hall, black flag from the top of Notre Dame Cathedral. There is proclamation, hot eloquence, Paris rushing out once again to strike its enemies down. That, in such circumstances, Paris was in no mild humor can be conjectured. Agitated streets, still more agitated round the Salle de Manege. Fulin's terrace crowds itself with angry citizens, angrier citizenesses. Varlet perambulates with portable chair, ejaculations of no measured kind, as to perfidious fine-spoken Homs d'Etat, friends of de Maurier, secret friends of Pitt and Coburg, burst from the hearts and lips of men. To fight the enemy? Yes, and even to freeze him with terror, Glacier d'Effroy, but first to have domestic traitors punished. Who are they that, carping and quarreling, in their Jesuitic most moderate way, seek to shackle the patriotic movement? That divide France against Paris, and poison public opinion in the departments? That when we ask for bread, and a maximum fixed price, treat us with lectures on free trade in grains? Can the human stomach satisfy itself with lectures on free trade? And are we to fight the Austrians in a moderate manner, or in an immoderate? This convention must be purged. Set up a swift tribunal for traders, a maximum for grains, thus speak with energy the patriot volunteers, as they defile through the convention hall, just on the wing to the frontiers. Pirorating in that heroical Cambyses vein of theirs, beshouted by the galleries and mountain, but murmured by the right side and plain. Nor are prodigies wanting, lo, while a captain of the section poissonier pirorates with vehemence about Dumouriez, Maximum, and crypto-royalist traders, and his troop beat chorus with him, waving their banner overhead. The eye of a deputy discerns, in this same banner, that the cravats or streamers of it have royal fleurs de lis. The section captain shrieks, his troop shriek, horror-struck, and trample the banner underfoot seemingly the work of some crypto-royalist plotter. Most probable. Or perhaps at bottom, only the old banner of the section, manufactured prior to the 10th of August, when such streamers were according to rule. History, looking over the Girondin memoirs, anxious to disentangle the truth of them from the hysterics, finds these days of March, especially this Sunday the 10th of March, play a great part. Plots, plots, a plot for murdering the Girondin deputies, anarchists and secret royalists plotting, in hellish concert, for that end. The far greater part of which is hysterics. What we do find indisputable is that Louvet and certain Girondins were apprehensive they might be murdered on Saturday, and did not go to the evening sitting, but held counsel with one another, each inciting his fellow to do something resolute. And end these anarchists, to which, however, Hessian, opening the window, and finding the night very wet, answered only, ILS any ferrant rain, and, composedly resumed his violin, says Louvet, thereby, with soft Lydian tweedledeeing. To wrap himself against eating cares. Also that Louvet felt especially liable to being killed, that several Girondins went abroad to seek beds, liable to being killed, but were not. Further that, in very truth, Journalist Deputy Gorses, poisoner of the departments, he and his printer had their houses broken into, by a tumult of patriots, among whom red-capped varlet, American Fournier loomed forth. In the darkness of the rain and riot. Had their wives put in fear, their presses, types and circumjacent equipments beaten to ruin, no mayor interfering in time, Gorses himself escaping, pistol in hand, along the coping of the back wall. Further that Sunday, the morrow, was not a workday, and the streets were more agitated than ever, is it a new September, then, that these anarchists intend? Finally, that no September came. And also that hysterics, not unnaturally, had reached almost their acme. Vergniaud denounces and deplores, in sweetly turned periods. Section Bonconseil, good counsel so named, not Mockenseil or ill counsel as it once was, does a far notabler thing, demands that Vergniaud, Brissett, Guadet, and other denunciatory fine-spoken Girondins, to the number of twenty-two, be put under arrest. Section Good Counsel, so named ever since the 10th of August, is sharply rebuked, like a section of ill counsel, 
but its word is spoken, and will not fall to the ground. In fact, one thing strikes us in these poor Girondins. Their fatal shortness of vision, nay fatal poorness of character, for that is the root of it. They are as strangers to the people they would govern, to the thing they have come to work in. Formulas, philosophies, respectabilities, what has been written in books, and admitted by the cultivated classes, this inadequate scheme of nature's working is all that nature, let her work as she will, can reveal to these men. So they perorate and speculate, and call on the friends of law, when the question is not law or no law, but life or no life. Pedants of the revolution, if not Jesuits of it. Their formalism is great, great also is their egoism. France rising to fight Austria has been raised only by plot of the 10th of March, to kill 22 of them. This revolution prodigy, unfolding itself into terrific stature and articulation, by its own laws and natures, not by the laws of formula, has become unintelligible, incredible as an impossibility, the waste chaos of a dream. A republic founded on what they call the virtues, on what we call the decencies and respectabilities, this they will have, and nothing but this. Whatsoever other republic nature and reality send, shall be considered as not sent. As a kind of nightmare vision, and thing non-extant, disowned by the laws of nature, and a formula. Alas! Dim for the best eyes is this reality. And as for these men, they will not look at it with eyes at all, but only through, faceted spectacles, of pedantry, wounded vanity, which yield the most portentous fallacious spectrum. Carping and complaining forever of plots and anarchy, they will do one thing, prove, to demonstration, that the reality will not translate into their formula. That they and their formula are incompatible with the reality, and, in its dark wrath, the reality will extinguish it and them. What a man cans he cans. But the beginning of a man's doom is that vision be withdrawn from him. That he see not the reality, but a false spectrum of the reality, and, following that, step darkly, with more or less velocity, downwards to the utter dark. To ruin, which is the great sea of darkness, whither all falsehoods, winding or direct, continually flow. This tenth of March we may mark as an epoch in the Girondin destinies, the rage so exasperated itself, the misconception so darkened itself. Many desert the sittings, many come to them armed. An honorable deputy, setting out after breakfast, must now, besides taking his notes, see whether his priming is in order. Meanwhile with Dumouriez in Belgium it fares ever worse. Were it again General Miranda's fault, or some other's fault, there is no doubt whatever but the Battle of Nerwinden, on the 18th of March, is lost, and our rapid retreat has become a far too rapid one. Victorious Coburg, with his Austrian prickers, hangs like a dark cloud on the rear of us, Dumouriez never off horseback night or day, engagement every three hours. Our whole discomfited host rolling rapidly inwards, full of rage, suspicion, and soft kaput. And then Dumouriez himself, what his intents may be. Wicked seemingly and not charitable. His dispatches to committee openly denounce a factious convention, for the woes it has brought on France and him. And his speeches, for the general has no reticence. The execution of the tyrant this Dumouriez calls the murder of the king. Danton and Lacroix, flying thither as commissioners once more, return very doubtful, even Danton now doubts. Three Jacobin missionaries, Proli, Dubuisson, Pereira, have flown forth. Sped by a wakeful mother society, they are struck dumb to hear the general speak. The convention, according to this general, consists of three hundred scoundrels and four hundred imbeciles, France cannot do without a king. But we have executed our king. And what is it to me, hastily cries de Maurier, a general of no reticence, whether the king's name be Lodovicus or Jacobus. Or Philippus, rejoins Proli, and hastens to report progress. Over the frontiers such hope is there. Chapter 3.3.V Sansculottism accoutred. Let us look, however, at the grand internal Sansculottism and revolution prodigy, whether it stirs and waxes, there and not elsewhere hope may still be for France. The revolution prodigy, as decree after decree issues from the mountain, 
like creative fiats, accordant with the nature of the thing, is shaping itself rapidly, in these days, into terrific stature and articulation, limb after limb. Last March, 1792, we saw all France flowing in blind terror, shutting town barriers, boiling pitch for brigands, happier, this March, that it is a seeing terror, that a creative mountain exists, which can say fiat. Recruitment proceeds with fierce celerity, nevertheless our volunteers hesitate to set out, till treason be punished at home, they do not fly to the frontiers, but only fly hither and thither, demanding and denouncing. The mountain must speak new fiat, and new fiats. And does it not speak such? Take, as first example, those Comites revolutionaries for the arrestment of persons suspect. Revolutionary Committee, of twelve chosen patriots, sits in every township of France, examining the suspect, seeking arms, making domiciliary visits and arrestments, caring, generally, that the Republic suffer no detriment. Chosen by universal suffrage, each in its section, they are a kind of elixir of Jacobinism, some 44,000 of them awake and alive over France. In Paris and all towns, every house door must have the names of the inmates legibly printed on it, at a height not exceeding five feet from the ground, every citizen must produce his certificatory carte de civism, signed by section president. Every man be ready to give account of the faith that is in him. Person suspect had as well depart this soil of liberty. And yet departure too is bad, all emigrants are declared traitors, their property become national. They are dead in law, save indeed that for our behoof they shall live yet fifty years in law, and what heritages may fall to them in that time become national too. A mad vitality of Jacobinism, with forty-four thousand centers of activity, circulates through all fibers of France. Very notable also is the tribunal extraordinaire, decreed by the mountain. Some Girondins dissenting, for surely such a court contradicts every formula, other Girondins assenting, nay cooperating, for do not we all hate traitors, O ye people of Paris, tribunal of the seventeenth in autumn last was swift. But this shall be swifter. Five judges, a standing jury, which is named from Paris and the neighborhood, that there be not delay in naming it, they are subject to no appeal. To hardly any law forms, but must, get themselves convinced, in all readiest ways, and for security are bound, to vote audibly, audibly, in the hearing of a Paris public. This is the tribunal extraordinaire. Which, in few months, getting into most lively action, shall be entitled tribunal revolutionnaire. As indeed it from the very first has entitled itself, with a Herman or a Dumas for judge president, with a Fouquier Tinville for attorney general, and a jury of such as citizen Leroy, who has surnamed himself Dix Eight, Leroy August 10th. It will become the wonder of the world. Herein has sansculottism fashioned for itself a sort of sharpness, a weapon magical, tempered in the Stygian hell waters, to the edge of it all armor, and defense of strength or of cunning shall be soft, it shall mow down lives and brazen gates. And the waving of it shed terror through the souls of men. But speaking of an amorphous sansculottism taking form, ought we not above all things to specify how the amorphous gets itself ahead? Without metaphor, this revolution government continues hitherto in a very anarchic state. Executive Council of Ministers, six in number, there is, but they, especially since Roland's retreat, have hardly known whether they were ministers or not. Convention committees sit supreme over them, but then each committee as supreme as the others, Committee of 21, of Defense, of General Surety, simultaneous or successive, for specific purposes. The convention alone is all-powerful, especially if the commune go with it, but is too numerous for an administrative body. Wherefore, in this perilous quick-whirling condition of the Republic, before the end of March, we obtain our small comite de salat public, as it were, for miscellaneous accidental purposes, requiring dispatch. As it proves, for a sort of universal supervision, and universal subjection. They are to report weekly, these new committee men, but to deliberate in secret. Their number is nine, firm patriots all, Danton one of them, renewable every month. Yet why not re-elect them if they turn out well? The flower of the matter is that they are but nine, that they sit in secret. An insignificant-looking thing at first, 
this committee, but with a principle of growth in it. Forwarded by fortune, by internal Jacobin energy, it will reduce all committees and the convention itself to mute obedience, the six ministers to six assiduous clerks, and work its will on the earth and under heaven, for a season. A committee of public salvation, whereat the world still shrieks and shudders. If we call that revolutionary tribunal a sword, which sansculottism has provided for itself, then let us call the law of the maximum, a provender scrip, or haversack, wherein better or worse some ration of bread may be found. It is true, political economy, Girondin free trade, and all law of supply and demand, are hereby hurled topsy-turvy, but what help? Patriotism must live, the cupidity of farmers seems to have no bowels. Wherefore this law of the maximum, fixing the highest price of grains, is, with infinite effort, got passed. And shall gradually extend itself into a maximum for all manner of comestibles and commodities, with such scrambling and topsy-turvying as may be fancied. For now, if, for example, the farmer will not sell. The farmer shall be forced to sell. An accurate account of what grain he has shall be delivered into the constituted authorities, let him see that he say not too much. For in that case, his rents, taxes and contributions will rise proportionally, let him see that he say not too little. For, on or before a set day, we shall suppose in April, less than one-third of this declared quantity, must remain in his barns, more than two-thirds of it must have been thrashed and sold. One can denounce him, and raise penalties. By such inextricable overturning of all commercial relation will sansculottism keep life in, since not otherwise. On the whole, as Camille de Moulin says once, while the sansculottes fight, the messieurs must pay. So there come impots progress ifs, ascending taxes, which consume, with fast increasing voracity, and superfluous revenue, of men, beyond fifty pounds a year you are not exempt, rising into the hundred you bleed freely. Into the thousands and tens of thousands, you bleed gushing. Also there come requisitions, there comes, forced loan of a milliard, some fifty million sterling, which of course they that have must lend. Unexampled enough, it has grown to be no country for the rich, this, but a country for the poor. And then if one fly, what steads it? Dead in law, nay kept alive fifty years yet, for their accursed behoof. In this manner, therefore, it goes. Topsy-turvying, C-A-I-R-N-G, and with all there is endless sale of emigrant national property, there is Camben with endless cornucopia of assignats. The trade and finance of sansculottism. And how, with maximum and baker's cues, with cupidity, hunger, denunciation and paper money, it led its galvanic life, and began and ended, remains the most interesting of all chapters in political economy, still to be written. All which things are they not clean against formula? O oh, Girondin friends, it is not a republic of the virtues we are getting, but only a republic of the strengths, virtuous and other. Chapter 3.3.VI The Traitor But Dumouriez, with his fugitive host, with his King Ladovicus or King Philippus. There lies the crisis, there hangs the question, revolution prodigy, or counter-revolution, one wide shriek covers that northeast region. Soldiers, full of rage, suspicion and terror, flock hither and thither, Dumouriez the many counseled, never off horseback, knows now no counsel that were not worse than none, the counsel, namely, of joining himself with Coburg. Marching to Paris, extinguishing Jacobinism, and, with some new King Ludovicus or King Philippus, resting the constitution of 1791. Is wisdom quitting Dumouriez, the herald of fortune quitting him? Principle, faith political or other, beyond a certain faith of messrooms, and honor of an officer, had him not to quit. At any rate, his quarters in the burg of St. Amand. His headquarters in the village of St. Amand de Bouis, a short way off, have become a bedlam. National representatives, Jacobin missionaries are riding and running, of the three towns, Lille, Valenciennes, or even Condé, which Dumouriez wanted to snatch for himself, not one can be snatched, your captain is admitted. But the town gate is closed on him, and then the prison gate, and his men wander about the ramparts. Couriers gallop breathless, men wait, or seem waiting, 
to assassinate, to be assassinated, battalions nigh frantic with such suspicion and uncertainty, with Vivla Republic and Sovkaput, rush this way and that. Ruin and desperation in the shape of Coburg lying entrenched close by. Dame Genlis and her fair princess Diorlans find this burg of St. Ammon no fit place for them, Du Mouillet's protection is grown worse than none. Tough Genlis one of the toughest women, a woman, as it were, with nine lives in her, whom nothing will beat, she packs her bandboxes, clear for flight in a private manner. Her beloved princess she will, leave here, with the Prince Chartres et Galate her brother. In the cold grey of the April morning, we find her accordingly established in her hired vehicle, on the street of St. Amand. Postilions just cracking their whips to go, when behold the young princely brother, struggling hitherward, hastily calling, bearing the princess in his arms. Hastily he has clutched the poor young lady up, in her very nightgown, nothing saved of her goods except the watch from the pillow, with brotherly despair he flings her in, among the bandboxes, into Genlis's chaise. Into Genlis's arms, leave her not, in the name of mercy and heaven. A shrill scene, but a brief one, the postilions crack and go. Ah, whither? Through byroads and broken hill passes, seeking their way with lanterns after nightfall, through perils, and Coburg Austrians, and suspicious French nationals. Finally, into Switzerland, safe though nigh moneyless. The brave young Egalité has a most wild morrow to look for, but now only himself to carry through it. For indeed over at that village named of the mud baths, St. Amon de Bouis, matters are still worse. About four o'clock on Tuesday afternoon, the 2d of April 1793, two couriers come galloping as if for life, Mon General. Four national representatives, war minister at their head, are posting hitherward, from Valenciennes, are close at hand, with what intents one may guess. While the couriers are yet speaking, war minister and national representatives, old Camus the archivist for chief speaker of them, arrive. Hardly has Mon General had time to order out the Hazar Regiment de Berchigny. That it take rank and wait nearby, in case of accident. And so, enter war minister Bernanville, with an embrace of friendship, for he is an old friend, enter archivist Camus and the other three, following him. They produce papers, invite the general to the bar of the convention, merely to give an explanation or two. The general finds it unsuitable, not to say impossible, and that, the service will suffer. Then comes reasoning. The voice of the old archivist getting loud. Vain to reason loud with this de Maurier, he answers mere angry irreverences. And so, amid plumed staff officers, very gloomy looking. In jeopardy and uncertainty, these poor national messengers debate and consult, retire and re-enter, for the space of some two hours, without effect. Whereupon archivist Camus, getting quite loud, proclaims, in the name of the National Convention, for he has the power to do it, that General de Maurier is arrested, will you obey the national mandate, General? Pardon ce moment ci, si not at this particular moment, answers the General also aloud, then glancing the other way, utters certain unknown vocables, in a mandatory manner, seemingly a German word of command. Hussars clutch the four national representatives, and Bernanville the war minister, pack them out of the apartment, out of the village, over the lines to Coburg, in two chaises that very night, as hostages, prisoners. To lie long in Maastricht and Austrian strongholds. Jacta Estalia. This night de Maurier prints his proclamation. This night and the morrow the de Maurier army, in such darkness visible, and rage of semi-desperation as there is, shall meditate what the general is doing, what they themselves will do in it. Judge whether this Wednesday was of halcyon nature, for any one. But, on the Thursday morning, we discern de Maurier with small escort, with Chartres Egalité and a few staff officers, ambling along the Condé Highway, perhaps they are for Condé, and trying to persuade the garrison there. At all events, they are for an interview with Coburg, who waits in the woods by appointment, in that quarter. Nigh the village of Dumit, three national battalions, a set of men always full of Jacobinism, sweep past us. Marching rather swiftly, seemingly in mistake, by a way we had not ordered. The general dismounts, steps into a cottage, 
a little from the wayside, will give them right order in writing. Hark! What strange growling is heard, what barkings are heard, loud yells of traitors, of arrest, the national battalions have wheeled round, are emitting shot. Mount, Dumouriez, and spring for life. Dumouriez and staff strike the spurs in, deep. Vault over ditches, into the fields, which prove to be morasses, sprawl and plunge for life, be whistled with curses and lead. Sunk to the middle, with or without horses, several servants killed, they escape out of shot range, to General Mack the Austrians' quarters. Nay they return on the morrow, to St. Amand and faithful foreign Birchigny, but what boots it? The artillery has all revolted, is jingling off to Valenciennes, all have revolted, are revolting. Except only foreign Birchigny, to the extent of some poor fifteen hundred, none will follow Dumouriez against France and indivisible republic, Dumouriez's occupations gone. Such an instinct of Freenhood and Sansculottism dwells in these men, they will follow no Dumouriez nor Lafayette, nor any mortal on such errand. Shriek may be of Sovkaput, but will also be of Vive la Republic. New national representatives arrive, new General Dampierre, soon killed in battle, new General Custine, the agitated hosts draw back to some camp of farmers, make head against Coburg as they can. And so Dumouriez is in the Austrian quarters. His drama ended, in this rather sorry manner. A most shifty, wiry man, one of heaven's Swiss that wanted only work. Fifty years of unnoticed toil and valor, one year of toil and valor, not unnoticed, but seen of all countries in centuries. Then thirty other years again unnoticed, of memoir writing, English pension, scheming and projecting to no purpose, adieu thou Swiss of heaven, worthy to have been something else. His staff go different ways. Brave young Egalité reaches Switzerland and the Genlis cottage, with a strong crabstick in his hand, a strong heart in his body, his prince Dom in now reduced to that. Egalité the father sat playing whist, in his Palais Egalité, at Paris, on the sixth day of this same month of April, when a catchpole entered, Citoyen Egalité is wanted at the convention committee. Examination, requiring arrestment. Finally requiring imprisonment, transference to Marseilles and the castle of If. Orleansdom has sunk in the black waters, Palais Egalité, which was Palais Royal, is like to become Palais National. Chapter 3.3.7 In fight. Our republic, by paper decree, may be, one and indivisible, but what profits it while these things are? Federalists in the Senate, renegados in the army, traitors everywhere. France, all in desperate recruitment since the 10th of March, does not fly to the frontier, but only flies hither and thither. This defection of contemptuous diplomatic de Mourier falls heavy on the fine-spoken high-sniffing Hans d'Etat, whom he consorted with, forms a second epoch in their destinies. Or perhaps more strictly we might say, the second Girondin epoch, though little noticed then, began on the day when, in reference to this defection, the Girondins broke with Danton. It was the first day of April. Dumouriez had not yet plunged across the morasses to Coburg, but was evidently meaning to do it, and our commissioners were off to arrest him. When what does the Girondin Lesource see good to do, but rise, and Jesuitically question and insinuate at great length, whether a main accomplice of Dumouriez had not probably been, Danton. Gironda grins sardonic assent, mountain holds its breath. The figure of Danton, Levasseur says, while this speech went on, was noteworthy. He sat erect, with a kind of internal convulsion struggling to keep itself motionless, his eye from time to time flashing wilder, his lip curling in titanic scorn. Lesource, in a fine-spoken attorney manner, proceeds, there is this probability to his mind, and there is that, probabilities which press painfully on him, which cast the patriotism of Danton under a painful shade. Which painful shade he, Lesource, will hope that Danton may find it not impossible to dispel. Less cellarats, cries Danton, starting up, with clenched right hand, Lesource having done, and descends from the mountain, like a lava flood. His answer not unready. Lesource's probabilities fly like idle dust, but leave a result behind them. Ye were right, friends of the mountain, begins Danton, and I was wrong, 
there is no peace possible with these men. Let it be war then. They will not save the Republic with us, it shall be saved without them, saved in spite of them. Really a burst of rude parliamentary eloquence this, which is still worth reading, in the old Moniteur. With fire words the exasperated rude titan rives and smites these Girondins, at every hit the glad mountain utters chorus, Marat, like a musical bis, repeating the last phrase. Lesor's probabilities are gone, but Danton's pledge of battle remains lying. A third epoch, or seen in the Girondin drama, or rather it is but the completion of this second epoch, we reckon from the day when the patience of virtuous passion finally boiled over. And the Girondins, so to speak, took up this battle pledge of Danton's and decreed Marat accused. It was the eleventh of the same month of April, on some effervescence rising, such as often rose. And President had covered himself, mere bedlam now ruling, and Mountain and Gironda were rushing on one another with clenched right hands, and even with pistols in them, when, behold, the Girondin de Perret drew a sword. Shriek of horror rose, instantly quenching all other effervescence, at sight of the clear murderous steel, whereupon de Perret returned it to the leather again. Confessing that he did indeed drive, being instigated by a kind of sacred madness, Saint Fuhrer, and pistols held at him. But that if he parasitally had chanced to scratch the outmost skin of national representation with it, he too carried pistols, and would have blown his brains out on the spot. But now in such posture of affairs, virtuous Pession rose, next morning, to lament these effervescences, this endless anarchy invading the legislative sanctuary itself. And here, being growled at and howled at by the mountain, his patience, long tried, did, as we say, boil over, and he spake vehemently, in high key, with foam on his lips. Whence, says Marat, I concluded he had got, la rage, the rabidity, or dog madness. Rabidity smites others rabid, so there rises new foam-lipped demand to have anarchists extinguished, and specially to have Marat put under accusation. Send a representative to the Revolutionary Tribunal. Violate the inviolability of a representative. Have a care, O oh friends. This poor Marat has faults enough, but against liberty or equality, what fault? That he has loved and fought for it, not wisely but too well. In dungeons and cellars, in pinching poverty, under anathema of men, even so, in such fight, has he grown so dingy, bleared, even so has his head become a stylite's one. Him you will fling to your sword of sharpness, while Coburg and Pitt advance on us, fire spitting? The mountain is loud, the Gironda is loud and deaf, all lips are foamy. With permanent session of twenty-four hours, with vote by roll call, and a deadlift effort, the Gironda carries it, Marat is ordered to the Revolutionary Tribunal, to answer for that February paragraph of forestallers at the door lintel with other offences. And, after a little hesitation, he obeys. Thus is Danton's battle pledge taken up, there is, as he said there would be, war without truce or treaty, ni treve ni composition. Wherefore, close now with one another, formula and reality, in death grips, and wrestle it out, both of you cannot live, but only one. Chapter 3.3.8 In Death Grips it proves what strength, were it only of inertia, there is in established formulas, what weakness in nascent realities, and illustrates several things, that this death wrestle should still have lasted some six weeks or more. National business, discussion of the Constitutional Act, for our Constitution should decidedly be got ready, proceeds along with it. We even change our locality. We shift, on the 10th of May, from the old Salle de Manege, into our new hall, in the palace, once a king's but now the republics, of the Tilleries. Hope and Ruth, flickering against despair and rage, still struggles in the minds of men. It is a most dark confused death wrestle, this of the six weeks. Formalist frenzy against realist frenzy. Patriotism, egoism, pride, anger, vanity, hope and despair, all raised to the frenetic pitch, frenzy meets frenzy, like dark clashing whirlwinds, neither understands the other, the weaker, one day, will understand that it is verily swept down. Girondism is strong as established formula and respectability, 
do not as many as seventy-two of the departments, or say respectable heads of departments, declare for us? Calvados, which loves its Buzet, will even rise in revolt, so hint the addresses, Marseilles, cradle of patriotism, will rise, Bordeaux will rise, and the Gironda department, as one man. In a word, who will not rise, were our representation nationale to be insulted, or one hair of a deputy's head harmed. The mountain, again, is strong as reality and audacity. To the reality of the mountain are not all further some things possible. A new 10th of August, if needful, nay a new 2nd of September. But, on Wednesday afternoon, 24th day of April, year 1793, what tumult as a fierce jubilee is this? It is Marat returning from Revolutionary Tribunal. A week or more of death peril, and now there is triumphant acquittal, Revolutionary Tribunal can find no accusation against this man. And so the eye of history beholds patriotism, which had gloomed unutterable things all week, break into loud jubilee, embrace its Marat, lift him into a chair of triumph, bear him shoulder-high through the streets. Shoulder-high is the injured people's friend, crowned with an oak garland, amid the wavy sea of red nightcaps, carmignol jackets, grenadier bonnets and female mob caps, far sounding like a sea. The injured people's friend has here reached his culminating point, he too strikes the stars with his sublime head. But the reader can judge with what face President Lasource, he of the painful probabilities, who presides in this convention hall, might welcome such jubilee tide, when it got thither, and the decree of accusation floating on the top of it. A national sapper, spokesman on the occasion, says, the people know their friend, and love his life as their own, whosoever wants Marat's head must get the sappers first. Lesource answered with some vague painful mumblement, which, says Levasseur, one could not help tittering at. Patriot sections, volunteers not yet gone to the frontiers, come demanding the purgation of traitors from your own bosom. The expulsion, or even the trial and sentence, of a factious twenty-two. Nevertheless the Gironda has got its commission of twelve. A commission specially appointed for investigating these troubles of the legislative sanctuary, let sansculottism say what it will, law shall triumph. Old constituent Rabot Saint Etienne presides over this commission, it is the last plank whereon a wrecked republic may perhaps still save herself. Rabot and they therefore sit, intent, examining witnesses, launching arrestments. Looking out into a waste dim sea of troubles. Dot, the womb of formula, or perhaps her grave. Enter not that sea, O reader. There are dim desolation and confusion, raging women and raging men. Sections come demanding twenty-two. For the number first given by section Bonconseal still holds, though the names should even vary. Other sections, of the wealthier kind, come denouncing such demand. Nay the same section will demand today, and denounce the demand tomorrow, according as the wealthier sit, or the poorer. Wherefore, indeed, the Girondins decree that all sections shall close, at ten in the evening. Before the working people come, which decree remains without effect. And nightly the mother of patriotism wails doleful, doleful, but her eye kindling. And Fournier el American is busy, and the two banker phrase, and varlet apostle of liberty. The bull voice of Marquis St. Hurich is heard. And shrill women vociferate from all galleries, the convention ones and downwards. Nay a central committee of all the forty-eight sections looms forth huge and dubious. Sitting dim in the archivesh, sending resolutions, receiving them, a center of the sections, in dread deliberation as to a new tenth of August. One thing we will specify to throw light on many, the aspect under which, seen through the eyes of these Girondin twelve, or even seen through one's own eyes, the patriotism of the softer sex presents itself. There are female patriots, whom the Girondins call Majiras, and count to the extent of eight thousand, with serpent hair, all out of curl, who have changed the distaff for the dagger. They are of, the society called brotherly, fraternelle, say sisterly, which meets under the roof of the Jacobins. Two thousand daggers, or so, have been ordered, doubtless, for them. They rush to Versailles, to raise more women. But the Versailles women will not rise. Nay, B. 
Behold, in National Garden of Tilleries, Demoiselle Pharaohin herself is become as a brown-locked Diana, were that possible, attacked by her own dogs, or she-dogs. The Demoiselle, keeping her carriage, is for liberty indeed, as she has full well shown. But then for liberty with respectability, whereupon these serpent-haired extreme she-patriots now do fasten on her, tatter her, shamefully fustigate her, in their shameful way, almost fling her into the garden ponds, had not help intervened. Help, alas, to small purpose. The poor demoiselle's head and nervous system, none of the soundest, is so tattered and fluttered that it will never recover, but flutter worse and worse, till it crack. And within year and day we hear of her in madhouse, and straight waistcoat, which proves permanent. Such brown-locked figure did flutter, and inarticulately jabber and gesticulate, little able to speak the obscure meaning it had, through some segment of that eighteenth century of time. She disappears here from the revolution and public history, for evermore. Another thing we will not again specify, yet again beseech the reader to imagine, the reign of fraternity and perfection. Imagine, we say, O reader, that the millennium were struggling on the threshold, and yet not so much as groceries could be had, owing to traders. With what impetus would a man strike traitors, in that case? Ah, thou canst not imagine it, thou hast thy groceries safe in the shops, and little or no hope of a millennium ever coming. But, indeed, as to the temper there was in men and women, does not this one fact say enough, the height suspicion had risen to? Preternatural we often called it. Seemingly in the language of exaggeration, but listen to the cold deposition of witnesses. Not a musical patriot can blow himself a snatch of melody from the French horn, sitting mildly pensive on the housetop, but Mercier will recognize it to be a signal which one plotting committee is making to another. Distraction has possessed Harmony herself, lurks in the sound of Marseillaise and C.A.I.R.A. Louvet, who can see as deep into a millstone as the most, discerns that we shall be invited back to our old hall of the Manege, by a deputation. And then the anarchists will massacre twenty-two of us, as we walk over. It is Pitt and Coburg, the gold of Pitt dot, poor Pitt. They little know what work he has with his own friends of the people. Getting them bespied, beheaded, their habeas corpuses suspended, and his own social order and strong boxes kept tight, to fancy him raising mobs among his neighbors. But the strangest fact connected with French or indeed with human suspicion, is perhaps this of Camille de Moulin. Camille's head, one of the clearest in France, has got itself so saturated through every fiber with preternaturalism of suspicion, that looking back on that 12th of July 1789, when the thousands rose round him, yelling responsive at his word in the Palais Royal Garden, and took cockades, he finds it explicable only on this hypothesis, that they were all hired to do it, and set on by the foreign and other plotters. It was not for nothing, says Camille with insight, that this multitude burst up round me when I spoke. No, not for nothing. Behind, around, before, it is one huge preternatural puppet play of plots, Pitt pulling the wires. Almost I conjecture that I Camille myself am a plot, and wooden with wires. Dot, the force of insight could no further go. Be this as it will, history remarks that the commission of twelve, now clear enough as to the plots. And luckily having, got the threads of them all by the end, as they say, are launching mandates of arrest rapidly in these May days, and carrying matters with a high hand, resolute that the sea of troubles shall be restrained. What chief patriot, section president even, is safe? They can arrest him, tear him from his warm bed, because he has made irregular section arrestments. They arrest Varlet Apostle of Liberty. They arrest Procure Substitute Hébert, Père Duchesne. A magistrate of the people, sitting in town hall, who, with high solemnity of martyrdom, takes leave of his colleagues, prompt he, to obey the law, and solemnly acquiescent, disappears into prison. The swifter fly the sections, energetically demanding him back, demanding not arrestment of popular magistrates, but of a traitorous twenty-two. Section comes flying after section. Defiling energetic, with their Cambyses vein of oratory, nay the commune itself comes, with Mayor Patch at its head. And with question not of a bear in the twenty-two alone, but with this ominous old question made new, can you save the Republic, 
or must we do it? To whom President Max Isner makes fiery answer, if by fatal chance, in any of those tumults which since the 10th of March are ever returning, Paris were to lift a sacrilegious finger against the national representation. France would rise as one man, in never imagined vengeance, and shortly the traveller would ask, on which side of the same Paris had stood. Whereat the mountain bellows only louder, and every gallery, patriot Paris boiling round. And Girondin Valais has nightly conclaves at his house, sends billets, come punctually, and well armed, for there is to be business. And Majira women perambulate the streets, with flags, with lamentable alalu. And the convention doors are obstructed by roaring multitudes, fine-spoken homes d'etat are hustled, maltreated, as they pass. Marat will apostrophize you, in such death peril, and say, Thou too art of them. If Roland ask leave to quit Paris, there is order of the day. What help? Substitute a bear, apostle varlet, must be given back, to be crowned with oak garlands. The commission of twelve, in a convention overwhelmed with roaring sections, is broken, then on the morrow, in a convention of rallied Girondins, is reinstated. Dim chaos, or the sea of troubles, is struggling through all its elements. Writhing and chafing toward some creation. Chapter 3.3.9 Extinct Accordingly, on Friday, the 31st of May 1793, there comes forth into the summer sunlight one of the strangest scenes. Mayor Patch with municipality arrives at the Tilleries Hall of Convention, sent for, Paris being in visible ferment, and gives the strangest news. How, in the grey of this morning, while we sat permanent in town hall, watchful for the commonweal, there entered, precisely as on a tenth of August, some ninety-six extraneous persons, who declared themselves to be in a state of insurrection. To be plenipotentiary commissioners from the forty-eight sections, sections, or members of the sovereign people, all in a state of insurrection, and further that we, in the name of said sovereign in insurrection, were dismissed from office. How we thereupon laid off our sashes, and withdrew into the adjacent saloon of liberty. How in a moment or two, we were called back, and reinstated, the sovereign pleasing to think us still worthy of confidence. Whereby, having taken new oath of office, we on a sudden find ourselves insurrectionary magistrates, with extraneous committee of ninety-six sitting by us. And a Yen Henriette, one whom some accuse of Septemberism, is made generalissimo of the National Guard. And, since six o'clock, the toxins ring and the drums beat, under which peculiar circumstances, what would an August National Convention please to direct us to do? Yes, there is the question. Break the insurrectionary authorities, answers some with vehemence. Verdniot at least will have, the national representatives all die at their post, this is sworn to, with ready loud acclaim. But as to breaking the insurrectionary authorities, alas, while we yet debate, what sound is that? Sound of the alarm cannon on the Pont Neuf, which it is death by the law to fire without order from us. It does boom off there, nevertheless. Sending a sound through all hearts. And the toxins discourse stern music, and Henriot with his armed force has enveloped us. And section succeeds section, the live long day. Demanding with Cambyses oratory, with the rattle of muskets, that traitors, twenty-two, or more, be punished, that the commission of twelve be irrecoverably broken. The heart of the Gironda dies within it. Distant are the seventy-two respectable departments, this fiery municipality is near. Berreir is for a middle course, granting something. The commission of twelve declares that, not waiting to be broken, it hereby breaks itself, and is no more. Fain would report a rabbot speak his and its last words, but he is bellowed off. Too happy that the twenty-two are still left unviolated. Vergniad, carrying the laws of refinement to a great length, moves, to the amazement of some, that, the sections of Paris have deserved well of their country. Whereupon, at a late hour of the evening, the deserving sections retire to their respective places of abode. Bereir shall report on it. With busy quill and brain he sits, secluded, for him no sleep tonight. Friday the last of May has ended in this manner. The sections have deserved well, 
but ought they not to deserve better? Faction and Girondism is struck down for the moment, and consents to be a nullity. But will it not, at another favorabler moment rise, still feller, and the Republic have to be saved in spite of it? So reasons patriotism, still permanent, so reasons the figure of Marat, visible in the dim section world, on the morrow. To the conviction of men, and so at eventide of Saturday, when Barrier had just got it all varnished in the course of the day, and his report was setting off in the evening mailbags, Toxin peels out again. General is beating. Armed men taking station in the place Vadom and elsewhere for the night, supplied with provisions and liquor. There under the summer stars will they wait, this night, what is to be seen and to be done, Henriette and Town Hall giving due signal. The convention, at sound of General, hastens back to its hall, but to the number only of a hundred, and does little business, puts off business till the morrow. The Girondins do not stir out thither, the Girondins are abroad seeking beds. Poor Rabot, on the morrow morning, returning to his post, with Louvet and some others, through streets all in ferment, wrings his hands, ejaculating, Illa Suprema dies. It has become Sunday, the second day of June, year 1793, by the old style. By the new style, year one of liberty, equality, fraternity. We have got to the last scene of all, that ends this history of the Girondin senatorship. It seems doubtful whether any terrestrial convention had ever met in such circumstances as this national one now does. Toxin is peeling, barriers shut, all Paris is on the gaze, or under arms. As many as a hundred thousand under arms they count, national force, and the armed volunteers, who should have flown to the frontiers and Lavade, but would not, treason being unpunished, and only flew hither and thither. So many, steady under arms, environ the national tilleries and garden. There are horse, foot, artillery, sappers with beards, the artillery one can see with their camp furnaces in this national garden, heating bullets red, and their match is lighted. Henriette in plumes rides, amid a plumed staff, all posts and issues are safe, reserves lie out, as far as the wood of Boulogne, the choicest patriots nearest the scene. One other circumstance we will note, that a careful municipality, liberal of camp furnaces, has not forgotten provision carts. No member of the sovereign need now go home to dinner, but can keep rank, plentiful victual circulating unsought. Does not this people understand insurrection? Ye, not uninventive, Gualches. Therefore let a national representation, mandatories of the sovereign, take thought of it. Expulsion of your twenty-two, and your commission of twelve, we stand here till it be done. Deputation after deputation, in ever stronger language, comes with that message. Berea proposes a middle course, will not perhaps the inculpated deputies consent to withdraw voluntarily, to make a generous demission, and self-sacrifice for the sake of one's country? Isnard, repentant of that search on which Riverbank Paris stood, declares himself ready to demit. Ready also is Te Deum Fauchet, bold de Sauks of the Bastille, Vieux Raditeur, Old Dotard, as Marat calls him, is still readier. On the contrary, Langeonise the Breton declares that there is one man who never will demit voluntarily, but will protest to the uttermost, while a voice is left him. And he accordingly goes on protesting, amid rage and clangor. Legendre crying at last, Langeonise, come down from the tribune, or I will fling thee down, O U J E T E Jeta N B A S. For matters are come to extremity. Nay, they do clutch hold of Lanjuan eyes, certain zealous mountain men. But cannot fling him down, for he cramps himself on the railing, and his clothes get torn. Brave senator, worthy of pity. Neither will Barbarus Demet, he has sworn to die at his post, and will keep that oath. Whereupon the galleries all rise with explosion, brandishing weapons, some of them, and rush out saying, Alons, then, we must save our country. Such a session is this of Sunday the 2nd of June. Churches fill, over Christian Europe, and then empty themselves, but this convention empties not, the while, a day of shrieking contention, of agony, humiliation and tearing of coat skirts, Illa Suprema dies. Round stand Henriette and his hundred thousand, copiously refreshed from tray and basket, 
nay he is, distributing five francs a piece, we Girondins saw it with our eyes, five francs to keep them in heart. And distraction of armed riot encumbers our borders, jangles at our bar, we are prisoners in our own hall, Bishop Gregoire could not get out for a Besoin actual without four gendarmes to wait on him. What is the character of a national representative become? And now the sunlight falls yellower on western windows, and the chimney tops are flinging longer shadows, the refreshed hundred thousand, nor their shadows, stir not. What to resolve on? Motion rises, superfluous one would think, that the convention go forth in a body, ascertain with its own eyes whether it is free or not. Lo, therefore, from the eastern gate of the Tilleries, a distressed convention issuing. Handsome herald Seychelles at their head, he with hat on, in sign of public calamity, the rest bareheaded, towards the gate of the carousel, wondrous to see, towards Henriette and his plumed staff. In the name of the national convention, make way. Not an inch of the way does Henriette make, I receive no orders, till the sovereign, yours and mine, has been obeyed. The convention presses on, Henriette prances back, with his staff, some fifteen paces, to arms. Cannoneers to your guns. Flashes out his puissant sword, as the staff all do, and the hussars all do. Cannoneers brandish the lit match, infantry present arms, alas, in the level way, as if for firing. Hatted Herald leads his distressed flock, through their pinfold of artilleries again, across the garden, to the gate on the opposite side. Here is Fulin's terrace, alas, there is our old Salle de Manege. But neither at this gate of the Pont Tournant is there egress. Try the other, and the other, no egress. We wander disconsolate through armed ranks, who indeed salute with live the Republic, but also with die the Gironda. Other such sight, in the year one of liberty, the westering sun never saw. And now behold Marat meets us. For he lagged in this suppliant procession of ours, he has got some hundred elect patriots at his heels, he orders us in the sovereign's name to return to our place, and do as we are bidden and bound. The convention returns. Does not the convention, says Cuthan with a singular power of face, see that it is free? None but friends round it. The convention, overflowing with friends and armed sectioners, proceeds to vote as bidden. Many will not vote, but remain silent, some one or two protest, in words, the mountain has a clear unanimity. Commission of twelve, and the denounced twenty-two, to whom we add ex-ministers Clavier and Lebrun, these, with some slight extempore alterations, this or that orator proposing, but Marat disposing, are voted to be under arrestment in their own houses. Brissot, Buzet, Vergniaud, Guadet, Louvet, Jensen, Barbarous, Laisource, Lanjuanise, Rabot, thirty-two, by the tale, all that we have known as Girondins, and more than we have known. They, under the safeguard of the French people. By and by, under the safeguard of two gendarmes each, shall dwell peaceably in their own houses, as non-senators, till further order. Here with end seance of Sunday the 2nd of June 1793. At ten o'clock, under mild stars, the hundred thousand, their work well finished, turn homewards. This same day, Central Insurrection Committee has arrested Madame Roland, imprisoned her in the Abbey. Roland has fled, no one knows whither. Thus fell the Girondins, by insurrection, and became extinct as a party, not without a sigh from most historians. The men were men of parts, of philosophic culture, decent behavior. Not condemnable in that they were pedants and had not better parts, not condemnable, but most unfortunate. They wanted a republic of the virtues, wherein themselves should be head. And they could only get a republic of the strengths, wherein others than they were head. For the rest, Bereir shall make report of it. The night concludes with a civic promenade by torchlight. Surely the true reign of fraternity is now not far. Book 3.4 Terror Chapter 3.4.I Charlotte Corday in the leafy months of June and July, several French departments germinate a set of rebellious paper leaves, named proclamations, resolutions, journals, or diurnals, of the Union for Resistance to Oppression. 
In particular, the town of Cannes, in Calvados, sees its paper leaf a bulletin that can suddenly bud, suddenly establish itself as newspaper there, under the editorship of Girondin national representatives. For among the proscribed Girondins are certain of a more desperate humor. Some, as Vergniaud, Valais, Jensan, arrested in their own houses, will await with stoical resignation what the issue may be. Some, as Brissett, Rabot, will take to flight, to concealment, which, as the Paris barriers are opened again in a day or two, is not yet difficult. But others there are who will rush, with Buzet, to Calvados. Or far over France, to Lyons, Toulon, Nantes and elsewhere, and then rendezvous at Cannes, to awaken as with war trumpet the respectable departments, and strike down an anarchic mountain faction, at least not yield without a stroke at it. Of this latter temper we count some score or more, of the arrested, and of the not yet arrested, a Buzet, a Barbarous, Louvet, Guadet, Pechon, who have escaped from arrestment in their own homes. A Sales, a Pythagorean Valadi, a Ducatel, the Ducatel that came in blanket and nightcap to vote for the life of Louis, who have escaped from danger and likelihood of arrestment. These, to the number at one time of twenty-seven, do accordingly lodge here, at the, intendance, or departmental mansion, of the town of Cannes, welcomed by persons in authority, welcomed and defrayed, having no money of their own. And the bulletin that can comes forth, with the most animating paragraphs, how the Bordeaux department, the Lyons department, this department after the other is declaring itself. Sixty, or say sixty-nine, or seventy-two respectable departments either declaring, or ready to declare. Nay Marseilles, it seems, will march on Paris by itself, if need be. So has Marseilles town said, that she will march. But on the other hand, that Montelamart town has said, no thoroughfare, and means even to, bury herself, under her own stone and mortar first, of this be no mention in Bulletin of Cannes. Such animating paragraphs we read in this newspaper. And fervors, and eloquent sarcasm, tirades against the mountain, frame pen of Deputy Salas, which resemble, say friends, Pascal's provincials. What is more to the purpose, these Girondins have got a general-in-chief, one Wimphen, formerly under de Maurier, also a secondary questionable general Puisse, and others, and are doing their best to raise a force for war. National volunteers, whosoever is of right heart, gather in, ye national volunteers, friends of liberty, from our Calvados townships, from the Eure, from Brittany, from far and near, forward to Paris, and extinguish anarchy. Thus at Cannes, in the early July days, there is a drumming and parading, a perorating and consulting, staff and army, council, club of carabots, anti-Jacobin friends of freedom, to denounce atrocious Marat. With all which, and the editing of bulletins, a national representative has his hands full. At Cannes it is most animated, and, as one hopes, more or less animated in the seventy-two departments that adhere to us. And in a France begirt with Sumerian invading coalitions, and torn with an internal lavade, this is the conclusion we have arrived at, to put down anarchy by civil war. Durham et Durham, the proverb says, non facient murum. Lavade burns, Santerre can do nothing there, he may return home and brew beer. Sumerian bombshells fly all along the north. That siege of Mentz is become famed. Lovers of the picturesque, as Goethe will testify, washed country people of both sexes, stroll thither on Sundays, to see the artillery work and counterwork, you only duck a little while the shot whizzes past. Condé is capitulating to the Austrians, Royal Highness of York, these several weeks, fiercely batters Valenciennes. For, alas, our fortified camp of farmers was stormed, General Dampierre was killed. General Custine was blamed, and indeed is now come to Paris to give explanations. Against all which the mountain and atrocious Marat must even make head as they can. They, anarchic convention as they are, publish decrees, expostulatory, explanatory, yet not without severity, they ray forth commissioners, singly or in pairs, the olive branch in one hand, yet the sword in the other. Commissioners come even to can, but without effect. Mathematical Ram, and Prieur named of the Côte d'Or, venturing thither, with their olive and sword, are packed into prison, 
there may Ram lie, under lock and key, for fifty days. And meditate his new calendar, if he please. Samaria and civil war. Never was republic one and indivisible at a lower ebb. Amid which dim ferment of can and the world, history specially notices one thing, in the lobby of the mansion de l intendance, where busy deputies are coming and going, a young lady with an aged valet. Taking grave graceful leave of deputy Barbaros. She is of stately Norman figure, in her twenty-fifth year, of beautiful still countenance, her name is Charlotte Corday, heretofore styled D'Armans, while nobility still was. Barbarous has given her a note to Deputy de Perret, him who once drew his sword in the effervescence. Apparently she will to Paris on some errand. She was a Republican before the Revolution, and never wanted energy. A completeness, a decision is in this fair female figure, by energy she means the spirit that will prompt one to sacrifice himself for his country. What if she, this fair young Charlotte, had emerged from her secluded stillness, suddenly like a star, cruel lovely, with half-angelic, half-demonic splendor. To glean for a moment, and in a moment be extinguished, to be held in memory, so bright complete was she, through long centuries. Quitting Cimmerian coalitions without, and the dim simmering twenty-five millions within, history will look fixedly at this one fair apparition of a Charlotte Corday. We'll note whither Charlotte moves, how the little life burns forth so radiant, then vanishes swallowed of the night. With Barbarous's note of introduction, and slight stock of luggage, we see Charlotte, on Tuesday the 9th of July, seated in the condiligence, with a place for Paris. None takes farewell of her, wishes her good journey, her father will find a line left, signifying that she is gone to England, that he must pardon her and forget her. The drowsy diligence lumbers along. Amid drowsy talk of politics, and praise of the mountain, in which she mingles not, all night, all day, and again all night. On Thursday, not long before none, we are at the bridge of Neryi. Here is Paris with her thousand black domes, the goal and purpose of thy journey. Arrived at the Inde de la Providence in the Rue de Vieux Augustines, Charlotte demands a room, hastens to bed, sleeps all afternoon and night, till the morrow morning. On the morrow morning, she delivers her note to Duperet. It relates to certain family papers which are in the minister of the interior's hand, which a nun at Cannes, an old convent friend of Charlotte's, has need of. Which Duperet shall assist her in getting, this then was Charlotte's errand to Paris. She has finished this, in the course of Friday, yet says nothing of returning. She has seen and silently investigated several things. The convention, in bodily reality, she has seen, what the mountain is like. The living physiognomy of Marat she could not see, he is sick at present, and confined to home. About eight on the Saturday morning, she purchases a large sheath knife in the Palais Royal, then straightway, in the place de Victoires, takes a hackney coach, to the Rue de l'École de Medicine, number 44. It is the residence of the Citoyen Marat. The Citoyen Marat is ill, and cannot be seen, which seems to disappoint her much. Her business is with Marat, then. Hapless beautiful Charlotte, hapless squalid Marat. From Cannes in the utmost west, from Neuchâtel in the utmost east, they two are drawing nigh each other, they two have, very strangely, business together. Charlotte, returning to her inn, dispatches a short note to Marat. Signifying that she is from Cannes, the seat of rebellion, that she desires earnestly to see him, and will put it in his power to do France a great service. No answer. Charlotte writes another note, still more pressing. Sets out with it by coach, about seven in the evening, herself. Tired day laborers have again finished their week, huge Paris is circling and simmering, manifold, according to its vague wont, this one fair figure has decision in it. Drive straight, towards a purpose. It is yellow July evening, we say, the thirteenth of the month, eve of the Bastille day, when M. Marat, four years ago, in the crowd of the Pont Neuf, shrewdly required of that Bissendel Hazar party, which had such friendly dispositions, to dismount, and give up their arms, then, and became notable among patriot men. For years, what a road he has travelled, and sits now, about half-past seven of the clock, stewing in slipper-bath, 
sore afflicted, ill of revolution fever, of what other malady this history had rather not name. Excessively sick and worn, poor man, with precisely eleven pence halfpenny of ready money, in paper, with slipper bath, strong three footed stool for writing on, the while. And a squalid, washerwoman, one may call her, that is his civic establishment in Medical School Street, thither and not elsewhither has his road led him. Not to the reign of brotherhood and perfect felicity, yet surely on the way towards that. Hark, a rap again. A musical woman's voice, refusing to be rejected, it is the citoyenne who would do France a service. Marat, recognizing from within, cries, admit her. Charlotte Corday is admitted. Citoyen Marat, I am from Ken the seat of rebellion, and wish to speak with you. Be seated, mon infant. Now what are the traitors doing at Ken? What deputies are at Ken? Charlotte names some deputies. Their heads shall fall within a fortnight, croaks the eager people's friend, clutching his tablets to write, Barbarous, Pession, writes he with bare shrunk arm, turning aside in the bath, Pession, and Louvet. And, Charlotte has drawn her knife from the sheath. Plunges it, with one sure stroke, into the writer's heart. Ah moi, cher Amy, help, dear. No more could the death choke say or shriek. The helpful washerwoman running in, there is no friend of the people, or friend of the washerwoman, left. But his life with a groan gushes out, indignant, to the shades below. And so Marat people's friend is ended, the lone stylites has got hurled down suddenly from his pillar, whitherward he that made him does know. Patriot Paris may sound triple and tenfold, in dole and wail, re-echoed by Patriot France. And the convention, Chabot pale with terror declaring that they are to be all assassinated, may decree him pantheon honors, public funeral, Mirabeau's dust making way for him. And Jacobin societies, in lamentable oratory, summing up his character, parallel him to one, whom they think it honor to call, the good sansculotte, whom we name not here. Also a chapel may be made, for the urn that holds his heart, in the place du carousel, and newborn children be named Marat, and Lego de Como hawkers bake mountains of stucco into unbeautiful busts, and David paint his picture, or death scene. And such other apotheosis take place as the human genius, in these circumstances, can devise, but Marat returns no more to the light of this sun. One sole circumstance we have read with clear sympathy, in the old Moniteur newspaper, how Marat's brother comes from Neuchâtel to ask of the convention that the deceased Jean-Paul Marat's musket be given him. For Marat too had a brother, and natural affections, and was wrapped once in swaddling clothes, and slept safe in a cradle like the rest of us. Ye children of men, a sister of his, they say, live still to this day in Paris. As for Charlotte Corday her work is accomplished, the recompense of it is near and sure. The cher Amy, and neighbors of the house, flying at her, she overturns some movables, entrenches herself till the gendarmes arrive. Then quietly surrenders, goes quietly to the Abbey prison, she alone quiet, all Paris sounding in wonder, in rage or admiration, round her. Duperet is put in arrest, on account of her, his papers sealed, which may lead to consequences. Fauchet, in like manner, though Fauchet had not so much as heard of her. Charlotte, confronted with these two deputies, praises the grave firmness of Duperet, censures the dejection of Fauchet. On Wednesday morning, the thronged Palais de Justice and Revolutionary Tribunal can see her face, beautiful and calm, she dates it, fourth day of the preparation of peace. A strange murmur ran through the hall, at sight of her. You could not say of what character. Tinville has his indictments and tape papers the cutler of the Palais Royal will testify that he sold her the sheath knife, all these details are needless, interrupted Charlotte, it is I that killed Marat. By whose instigation, by no one's. What tempted you, then? His crimes. I killed one man, added she, raising her voice extremely, extremant, as they went on with their questions, I killed one man to save a hundred thousand. A villain to save innocence, a savage wild beast to give repose to my country. I was a Republican before the Revolution, I never wanted energy. There is therefore nothing to be said. 
the public gazes astonished, the hasty limners sketch her features, Charlotte not disapproving, the men of law proceed with their formalities. The doom is death as a murderess. To her advocate she gives thanks. In gentle phrase, in high-flown classical spirit. To the priest they send her she gives thanks, but needs not any shriving, or ghostly or other aid from him. On this same evening, therefore, about half-past seven o'clock, from the gate of the conciergerie, to a city all on tiptoe, the fatal cart issues, seated on it a fair young creature, sheeted in red smock of murderous. So beautiful, serene, so full of life, journeying towards death, alone amid the world. Many take off their hats, saluting reverently, for what heart but must be touched. Others growl and howl. Adam Lux, of Mentz, declares that she is greater than Brutus, that it were beautiful to die with her, the head of this young man seems turned. At the place de la Revolution, the countenance of Charlotte wears the same still smile. The executioners proceed to bind her feet, she resists, thinking it meant as an insult, on a word of explanation, she submits with cheerful apology. As the last act, all being now ready, they take the neckerchief from her neck, a blush of maidenly shame overspreads that fair face and neck. The cheeks were still tinged with it, when the executioner lifted the severed head, to shew it to the people. It is most true, says Foster, that he struck the cheek insultingly, for I saw it with my eyes, the police imprisoned him for it. In this manner have the beautifulest and the squalidest come in collision, and extinguished one another. Jean-Paul Marat and Marie-Anne Charlotte Corday both, suddenly, are no more. Day of the Preparation of Peace Alas, how were peace possible or preparable, while, for example, the hearts of lovely maidens, in their convent stillness, are dreaming not of love paradises, and the light of life, but of cadre sacrifices, and death well earned. That twenty-five million hearts have got to such temper, this is the anarchy, the soul of it lies in this, whereof not peace can be the embodiment. The death of Marat, wedding old animosities tenfold, will be worse than any life. O ye hapless two, mutually extinctive, the beautiful and the squalid, sleep ye well, in the mother's bosom that bore you both. This was the history of Charlotte Corday, most definite, most complete, angelic demonic, like a star. Adam Lux goes home, half delirious, to pour forth his apotheosis of her, in paper and print, to propose that she have a statue with this inscription, greater than Brutus. Friends represent his danger, Lux is reckless. Thinks it were beautiful to die with her. Chapter 3.4.2 In Civil War But during these same hours, another guillotine is at work, on another, Charlotte, for the Girondins, dies at Paris today. Chalier, by the Girondins, dies at Lyons tomorrow. From rumbling of cannon along the streets of that city, it has come to firing of them, to rabid fighting, Nivercole and the Girondins triumph. Behind whom there is, as everywhere, a royalist faction waiting to strike in. Trouble enough at Lyons, and the dominant party carrying it with a high hand. For indeed, the whole South is astir, incarcerating Jacobins. Arming for Girondins, wherefore we have got a, Congress of Lions, also a, Revolutionary Tribunal of Lions, and anarchists shall tremble. So Chalier was soon found guilty, of Jacobinism, of murderous plot, address with drawn dagger on the 6th of February last. And, on the morrow, he also travels his final road, along the streets of Lyons, by the side of an ecclesiastic, with whom he seems to speak earnestly, the axe now glittering high. He could weep, in old years, this man, and, fall on his knees on the pavement, blessing heaven at sight of federation programs or like, then he pilgrimed to Paris, to worship Marat and the mountain, now Marat and he are both gone. We said he could not end well. Jacobinism groans inwardly, at Lyons, but dare not outwardly. Chalier, when the tribunal sentenced him, made answer, My death will cost this city dear. Montelamart town is not buried under its ruins. Yet Marseilles is actually marching, under order of a Lions Congress, is incarcerating patriots, the very royalists now shooing face. Against which a general Carteau fights, 
though in small force. And with him an artillery major, of the name of, Napoleon Bonaparte. This Napoleon, to prove that the Marseillese have no chance ultimately, not only fights but writes, publishes his Supper of Beaucaire, a dialogue which has become curious. Unfortunate cities, with their actions and their reactions. Violence to be paid with violence in geometrical ratio, royalism and anarchism both striking in, the final net amount of which geometrical series, what man shall sum. The bar of iron has never yet floated in Marseille's harbour, but the body of Rebecqui was found floating, self-drowned there. Hot Rebecqui seeing how confusion deepened, and respectability grew poisoned with royalism, felt that there was no refuge for a republican but death. Rebecqui disappeared, no one knew whither. Till, one morning, they found the empty case or body of him risen to the top, tumbling on the salt waves, and perceived that Rebecqui had withdrawn forever. Toulon likewise is incarcerating patriots, sending delegates to Congress. Intriguing, in case of necessity, with the royalists and English. Montpellier, Bordeaux, Nantes, all France, that is not under the swoop of Austria and Samaria, seems rushing into madness and suicidal ruin. The mountain labors. Like a volcano in a burning volcanic land. Convention committees, of surety, of salvation, are busy night and day, convention commissioners whirl on all highways, bearing olive branch and sword, or now perhaps sword only. Chaumet and municipals come daily to the Tilleries demanding a constitution, it is some weeks now since he resolved, in town hall, that a deputation should go every day and demand a constitution, till one were got. Whereby suicidal France might rally and pacify itself, a thing inexpressibly desirable. This then is the fruit your anti anarchic Girondins have got from that levying of war in Calvados. This fruit, we may say, and no other whatsoever. For indeed, before either Charlotte's or Chalier's head had fallen, the Calvados war itself had, as it were, vanished, dreamlike, in a shriek. With seventy two departments on one side, one might have hoped better things. But it turns out that respectabilities, though they will vote, will not fight. Possession is always nine points in law, but in lawsuits of this kind, one may say, it is ninety and nine points. Men do what they were wont to do. And have immense irresolution and inertia, they obey him who has the symbols that claim obedience. Consider what, in modern society, this one fact means, the metropolis is with our enemies. Metropolis, mother city. Rightly so named, all the rest are but as her children, her nurslings. Why, there is not a leathern diligence, with its post bags and luggage boots, that lumbers out from her, but is as a huge life pulse, she is the heart of all. Cut short that one leathern diligence, how much is cut short, General Wimpfen, looking practically into the matter, can see nothing for it but that one should fall back on royalism, get into communication with Pitt. Dark innuendos he flings out, to that effect, whereat we Girondins start, horror-struck. He produces as his second in command a certain Ciedevant, one Comte Puisse, entirely unknown to Louvet, greatly suspected by him. Few wars, accordingly, were ever levied of a more insufficient character than this of Calvados. He that is curious in such things may read the details of it in the memoirs of that same Ciedevant Puisse, the much enduring man and royalist, how our Girondin national forces, marching off with plenty of wind music, were drawn out about the old chateau of Bricourt, in the wood country near Vernon, to meet the mountain national forces advancing from Paris. How on the fifteenth afternoon of July, they did meet, and, as it were, shrieked mutually, and took mutually to flight without loss. How Puisay thereafter, for the mountain nationals fled first, and we thought ourselves the victors, was roused from his warm bed in the castle of Bricourt, and had to gallop without boots. Our nationals, in the night watches, having fallen unexpectedly into Sauve Caput, and in brief the Calvados war had burnt priming, and the only question now was, whitherward to vanish, in what hole to hide oneself. The national volunteers rush homewards, faster than they came. The seventy-two respectable departments, says Milan, all turned round, and forsook us, in the space of four and twenty hours. 
unhappy those who, as at Lyons for instance, have gone too far for turning. One morning, we find placarded on our intendant's mansion, the decree of convention which casts us or La Loy, into outlawry, placarded by our can magistrates. Clear hint that we also are to vanish. Vanish, indeed, but whitherward? Gorses has friends in Wren, he will hide there, unhappily will not lie hid. Guadet, Lanjou and I's are on cross roads, making for Bordeaux. To Bordeaux! cries the general voice, of valor alike and of despair. Some flag of respectability still floats there, or is thought to float. Thitherward therefore, each as he can. Eleven of these ill-fated deputies, among whom we may count, as twelfth, friend Rioff the man of letters, do an original thing. Take the uniform of national volunteers, and retreat southward with the Breton battalion, as private soldiers of that corps. These brave Bretons had stood truer by us than any other. Nevertheless, at the end of a day or two, they also do now get dubious, self-divided, we must part from them, and, with some half-dozen as convoy or guide, retreat by ourselves, a solitary marching detachment, through waste regions of the West. Chapter 3.4.3 .3. Retreat of the Eleven It is one of the notablest retreats, this of the Eleven, that history presents the handful of forlorn legislators retreating there, continually, with shouldered firelock and well-filled cartridge box, in the yellow autumn. Long hundreds of miles between them and Bordeaux, the country all getting hostile, suspicious of the truth, simmering and buzzing on all sides, more and more. Louvet has preserved the itinerary of it, a piece worth all the rest he ever wrote. O virtuous Pession, with thy early white head, O brave young Barbarous, has it come to this? Weary ways, worn shoes, light purse, encompassed with perils as with a sea. Revolutionary committees are in every township, of Jacobin temper. Our friends all cowed, our cause the losing one. In the borough of Moncontour, by ill chance, it is market day, to the gaping public such transit of a solitary marching detachment is suspicious. We have need of energy, of promptitude and luck, to be allowed to march through. Hasten, ye weary pilgrims. The country is getting up. Noise of you is brooded day after day, a solitary twelve retreating in this mysterious manner, with every new day, a wider wave of inquisitive pursuing tumult is stirred up till the whole west will be in motion. Cussy is tormented with gout, Buzet is too fat for marching. Rioff, blistered, bleeding, marching only on tiptoe, Barbara's limps with sprained ankle, yet ever cheery, full of hope and valor. Light Louvet glances hair-eyed, not hair-hearted, only virtuous Pession serenity was but once seen ruffled. They lie in straw lofts, in woody breaks, rudest palliasse on the floor of a secret friend is luxury. They are seized in the dead of night by Jacobin mayors and tap of drum, get off by firm countenance, rattle of muskets, and ready wit. Of Bordeaux, through fiery lavade and the long geographical spaces that remain, it were madness to think, well, if you can get to Camper on the sea coast and take shipping there. Faster, ever faster. Before the end of the march, so hot has the country grown, it is found advisable to march all night. They do it, under the still night canopy they plod along, and yet behold, rumor has outplotted them. In the paltry village of Carhay, be its thatched huts, and bottomless peat bogs, long notable to the traveller, one is astonished to find light still glimmering, citizens are awake, with rushlights burning, in that nook of the terrestrial planet. As we traverse swiftly the one poor street, a voice is heard saying, There they are, les voila que Swifter, ye doomed lame twelve, speed ere they can arm, gain the woods of Camper before day, and lie squatted there. The doomed twelve do it, though with difficulty, with loss of road, with peril, and the mistakes of a night. In Camper are Girondin friends, who perhaps will harbor the homeless, till a Bordeaux ship way. Wayworn, heart-worn, in agony of suspense, till Camper friendship get warning, they lie there, squatted under the thick wet boskage, suspicious of the face of man. Some pity to the brave, to the unhappy. Unhappiest of all legislators, oh when ye packed your luggage, some score, or two score months ago. 
and mounted this or the other leathern vehicle, to be conscript fathers of a regenerated France, and reap deathless laurels, did ye think your journey was to lead hither? The Camper Samaritans find them squatted, lift them up to help and comfort. We'll hide them in sure places. Thence let them dissipate gradually, or there they can lie quiet, and write memoirs, till a Bordeaux ship sail. And thus, in Calvados all is dissipated, Ram is out of prison, meditating his calendar. Ringleaders are locked in his room. At Ken the Corday family mourns in silence, Busett's house is a heap of dust and demolition. And amid the rubbish sticks a gallows, with this inscription, here dwelt the traitor Busett who conspired against the Republic. Busett and the other vanished deputies are or la loy, as we saw, their lives free to take where they can be found. The worse fares it with the poor arrested visible deputies at Paris. Arrestment at home threatens to become confinement in the Luxembourg, to end, where? For example, what pale-visaged thin man is this, journeying toward Switzerland as a merchant of Neuchâtel, whom they arrest in the town of Moulins? To Revolutionary Committee he is suspect. To Revolutionary Committee, on probing the matter, he is evidently, Deputy Brissett. Back to thy arrestment, poor Brissett, or indeed to straight confinement, whither others are fared to follow. Rabot has built himself a false partition, in a friend's house, lives, in invisible darkness, between two walls. It will end, this same arrestment business, in prison, and the revolutionary tribunal. Nor must we forget de Perret, and the seal put on his papers by reason of Charlotte. One paper is there, fit to breed woe enough a secret solemn protest against that suprema dies of the 2nd of June. This secret protest our poor Duperet had drawn up, the same week, in all plainness of speech, waiting the time for publishing it, to which secret protest his signature, and that of other honorable deputies not a few, stands legibly appended. And now, if the seals were once broken, the mountain still victorious. Such protesters, your merciers, Baliols, 73 by the tail, what yet remains of respectable Girondism in the convention, may tremble to think. These are the fruits of levying civil war. Also we find, that, in these last days of July, the famed siege of Mentz is finished, the garrison to march out with honors of war, not to serve against the coalition for a year. Lovers of the picturesque, and Goethe standing on the chaussée of Mentz, saw, with due interest, the procession issuing forth, in all solemnity. Escorted by Prussian horse came first the French garrison. Nothing could look stranger than this latter, a column of Marseillaise, slight, swarthy, party-colored, in patched clothes, came tripping on, as if King Edwin had opened the dwarf hill, and sent out his nimble host of dwarfs. Next followed regular troops, serious, sullen, not as if downcast or ashamed. But the remarkablest appearance, which struck every one, was that of the chasers, chasseurs, coming out mounted, they had advanced quite silent to where we stood, when their band struck up the Marseillaise. This revolutionary Te Deum has in itself something mournful and bodeful, however briskly played, but at present they gave it an altogether slow time, proportionate to the creeping step they rode at. It was piercing and fearful, and a most serious-looking thing, as these cavaliers, long, lean men, of a certain age, with means suitable to the music, came pacing on, singly you might have likened them to Don Quixote. In mass, they were highly dignified. But now a single troop became notable, that of the commissioners or representants. Merlin of Thionville, in hussar uniform, distinguishing himself by wild beard and look, had another person in similar costume on his left, the crowd shouted out, with rage, at sight of this latter, the name of a Jacobin townsman and clubist and shook itself to seize him. Merlin drew bridle, referred to his dignity as French representative, to the vengeance that should follow any injury done. He would advise everyone to compose himself, for this was not the last time they would see him here. Thus rode Merlin, threatening in defeat. But what now shall stem that tide of Prussians setting in through the open northeast? Lucky, if fortified lines of Weissenburg, and impassibilities of Vosges Mountains, confine it to French Alsace, keep it from submerging the very heart of the country. Furthermore, precisely in the same days, Valenciennes siege is finished, 
in the northwest, fallen, under the red hail of York. Condé fell some fortnight since. Cimmerian coalition presses on. What seems very notable too, on all these captured French towns there flies not the royalist fleur de lis, in the name of a new Louis the Pretender, but the Austrian flag flies, as if Austria meant to keep them for herself. Perhaps General Custines, still in Paris, can give some explanation of the fall of these strong places. Mother Society, from Tribune and Gallery, growls loud that he ought to do it. Remarks, however, in a splenetic manner that the messieurs of the Palais Royal are calling long life to this general. The Mother Society, purged now by successive scrutinies or epurations from all taint of Girondism, has become a great authority, what we can call shield bearer or bottle holder, nay call it fugleman, to the purged National Convention itself. The Jacobins' debates are reported in the Moniteur, like parliamentary ones. Chapter 3.4.4 O Nature! But looking more specially into Paris City, what is this that history, on the 10th of August, year 1 of Liberty, by old style, year 1793, discerns there? Praised be the heavens, a new feast of pikes! For Chaumet's deputation every day has worked out its result, a constitution. It was one of the repeatest constitutions ever put together. Made, some say in eight days, by Harold Seychelles and others, probably a workmanlike, roadworthy constitution enough, on which point, however, we are, for some reasons, little called to form a judgment. Workmanlike or not, the 44,000 communes of France, by overwhelming majorities, did hasten to accept it, glad of any constitution whatsoever. Nay departmental deputies have come, the venerablest republicans of each department, with solemn message of acceptance, and now what remains but that our new final constitution be proclaimed, and sworn to, in Feast of Pikes. The departmental deputies, we say, are come some time ago, Chamet very anxious about them, lest Girondin messieurs, agio jobbers, or were it even fias de joie of a Girondin temper, corrupt their morals. 10th of August, immortal anniversary, greater almost than Bastille July, is the day. Painter David has not been idle. Thanks to David and the French genius, there steps forth into the sunlight, this day, a scenic phantasmagory unexampled, whereof history, so occupied with real phantasmagories, will say but little. For one thing, history can notice with satisfaction, on the ruins of the Bastille, a statue of nature, gigantic, spouting water from her two mammals. Not a dream this, but a fact, palpable visible. There she spouts, great nature. Dim, before daybreak. But as the coming sun ruddies the east, come countless multitudes, regulated and unregulated, come departmental deputies, come mother society and daughters, comes national convention, led on by handsome Herald. Soft wind music breathing note of expectation. Lo, as great soul scatters his first fire handful, tipping the hills and chimney heads with gold, Herald is at great nature's feet, she is plaster of Paris merely. Herald lifts, in an iron saucer, water spouted from the sacred breasts, drinks of it, with an eloquent pagan prayer, beginning, O nature. And all the departmental deputies drink, each with what best suitable ejaculation or prophetic utterance is in him, amid breathings, which become blasts, of wind music. And the roar of artillery and human throats, finishing well the first act of this solemnity. Next are processionings along the boulevards, deputies or officials bound together by long indivisible tricolor ribboned. General, members of the sovereign, walking pell-mell, with pikes, with hammers, with the tools and emblems of their crafts, among which we notice a plough, and ancient bosses and filament seated on it, drawn by their children. Many-voiced harmony and dissonance filling the air. Through triumphal arches enough, at the basis of the first of which, we descry, whom thinkest thou, the heroines of the insurrection of women. Strong dames of the market, they sit there, Thorough and too ill to attend, one fears, with oak branches, tricolor bedizenment, firm seated on their cannons. To whom handsome Herald, making pause of admiration, addresses soothing eloquence. Whereupon they rise and fall into the march. And now mark, in the place de la Revolution, 
what other august statue may this be, veiled in canvas, which swiftly we shear off by pulley and cord? The Statue of Liberty. She too is of plaster, hoping to become of metal, stands where a tyrant Louis Quinn's once stood. Three thousand birds, are let loose, into the whole world, with labels round their neck, we are free, imitate us. Holocaust of royalist and sea avant trumpery, such as one could still gather, is burnt, pontifical eloquence must be uttered, by handsome herald and pagan orisons offered up. And then forward across the river, where is new enormous statuary. Enormous plaster mountain, Hercules Pupple, with uplifted all-conquering club, many-headed dragon of Girondin federalism rising from fetid marsh, needing new eloquence from Heralt. To say nothing of Champ de Mars, and Fatherland's altar there. With urn of slain defenders, carpenter's level of the law, and such exploding, gesticulating and perorating, that Heralt's lips must be growing white and his tongue cleaving to the roof of his mouth. Towards six o'clock let the wearied president, let Paris patriotism generally sit down to what repast, and social repasts, can be had, and with flowing tankard or light mantling glass, usher in this new and newest era. In fact, is not Rom's new calendar getting ready? On all house stops flicker little tricolor flags, their flagstaff a pike and liberty cap. On all house walls, for no patriot, not suspect, will be behind another, there stand printed these words, Republic one and indivisible, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. As to the new calendar, we may say here rather than elsewhere that speculative men have long been struck with the inequalities and incongruities of the old calendar, that a new one has long been as good as determined on. Marichal the Atheist, almost ten years ago, proposed a new calendar, free at least from superstition, this the Paris municipality would now adopt, in defect of a better. At all events, let us have either this of Marichal's or a better, the new era being come. Petitions, more than once, have been sent to that effect. And indeed, for a year past, all public bodies, journalists, and patriots in general, have dated first year of the Republic. It is a subject not without difficulties. But the convention has taken it up, and Ram, as we say, has been meditating it. Not Marichal's new calendar, but a better new one of Ram's in our own. Ram, aided by Amange, a Lagrange and others, furnishes mathematics. Fabre d'Eglantine furnishes poetic nomenclature, and so, on the 5th of October, 1793, after trouble enough, they bring forth this new republican calendar of theirs, in a complete state, and by law, get it put in action. For equal seasons, twelve equal months of thirty days each, this makes three hundred and sixty days, and five odd days remain to be disposed of. The five odd days we will make festivals, and name the five sansculottides, or days without breeches. Festival of genius, festival of labor, of actions, of rewards, of opinion, these are the five sansculottides. Whereby the great circle, or year, is made complete, solely every fourth year, while I'm called leap year, we introduce a sixth sansculottide, and name it Festival of the Revolution. Now as to the day of commencement, which offers difficulties, is it not one of the luckiest coincidences that the Republic herself commenced on the 21st of September, close on the vernal equinox? Vernal equinox, at midnight for the meridian of Paris, in the year Wylam Christian 1792, from that moment shall the new era reckon itself to begin. Vendemiaire, Brumaire, Fremaire. Or as one might say, in mixed English, Vintagerius, Vulgarius, Frosterius, these are our three autumn months. Nivos, Pluvios, Ventos, or say Snowus, Rainus, Windus, make our winter season. Germinal, Florial, Prairial, or Bud Dal, Floral, Meadowal, are our spring season. Mesador, Thermidor, Fructidor, that is to say, Dor being Greek for gift, Riapidor, Hiatidor, for tighter, our republican summer. These twelve, in a singular manner, divide the republican year. Then as to minuter subdivisions, let us venture at once on a bold stroke, adopt your decimal subdivision, and instead of world old week, or say a night, make it a ten night or decade. Not without results. 
There are three decades, then, in each of the months, which is very regular, and the decade, or tenth day, shall always be, the day of rest. And the Christian Sabbath, in that case, shall shift for itself. This, in brief, in this new calendar of Ram and the Convention, calculated for the meridian of Paris, and Gospel of Jean-Jacques, not one of the least afflicting occurrences for the actual British reader of French history. Confusing the soul with messeters, metawalls, till at last, in self-defense, one is forced to construct some ground scheme, or rule of commutation from new style to old style, and have it lying by him. Such ground scheme, almost worn out in our service, but still legible and printable, we shall now, in a note, present to the reader. For the wrong calendar, in so many newspapers, memoirs, public acts, has stamped itself deep into that section of time, a new era that lasts some twelve years and odd is not to be despised. Let the reader, therefore, with such ground scheme, help himself, where needful, out of new style into old style, called also, slave style, style esclave, whereof we, in these pages, shall as much as possible use the latter only. Thus with new feast of pikes, and new era or new calendar, did France accept her new constitution, the most democratic constitution ever committed to paper. How it will work in practice. Patriot deputations from time to time solicit fruition of it. That it be set a going. Always, however, this seems questionable, for the moment, unsuitable. Till, in some weeks, Salat Public, through the organ of St. Just, makes report, that, in the present alarming circumstances, the state of France is revolutionary, that her government must be revolutionary till the peace. Solely as paper, then, and as a hope, must this poor new constitution exist, in which shape we may conceive it lying, even now, with an infinity of other things, in that limbo near the moon. Further than paper it never got, nor ever will get. Chapter 3.4.V Sort of sharpness. In fact it is something quite other than paper theorems, it is iron and audacity that France now needs. Is not La Vade still blazing, alas too literally, rogue Rossignol burning the very corn mills? General Santerre could do nothing there, General Rossignol, in blind fury, often in liquor, can do less than nothing. Rebellion spreads, grows ever matter. Happily those lean Quixote figures, whom we saw retreating out of Mentz, bound not to serve against the coalition for a year, have got to Paris. National Convention packs them into post vehicles and conveyances. Sends them swiftly, by post, into La Vade. They're valiantly struggling, in obscure battle and skirmish, under rogue Rossignol, let them, unlaureled, save the Republic, and, be cut down gradually to the last man. Does not the coalition, like a fire tide, pour in, Prussia through the open northeast, Austria, England through the northwest. General Houchard prospers no better there than General Custine did, let him look to it. Through the eastern and the western Pyrenees Spain has deployed itself, spreads, rustling with bourbon banners, over the face of the south. Ashes and embers of confused Girondin civil war covered that region already. Marseilles is damped down, not quenched, to be quenched in blood. Toulon, terror-struck, too far gone for turning, has flung itself, ye righteous powers, into the hands of the English. On Toulon arsenal there flies a flag, nay not even the fleur de lis of a Louis pretender, there flies that accursed St. George's cross of the English and Admiral Hood. What remnants of sea craft, arsenals, roperies, war navy France had, has given itself to these enemies of human nature, enemies du genre humain. Beleaguer it, Bombard it, ye commissioners Barris, Frerin, Robespierre Jr. Thou General Carteau, General de Gamier, above all, thou remarkable artillery major, Napoleon Bonaparte. Hood is fortifying himself, vittling himself, means, apparently, to make a new Gibraltar of it. But lo, in the autumn night, late night, among the last of August, what sudden red sun blaze is this that has risen over Lion City, with a noise to deafen the world? It is the powder tower of lions, nay the arsenal with four powder towers, which has caught fire in the bombardment, and sprung into the air, carrying, a hundred and seventeen houses, after it. With a light, one fancies, 
as of the noon sun. With a roar second only to the last trumpet. All living sleepers far and wide it has awakened. What a sight was that, which the eye of history saw, in the sudden nocturnal sun blaze. The roofs of hapless lions, and all its domes and steeples made momentarily clear. Roan and sown streams flashing suddenly visible, and height and hollow, hamlet and smooth stubblefield, and all the region round. Heights, alas, all scarped and counterscarped, into trenches, curtains, red outs, blue artillery men, little powder devilkins, plying their hell trade there, through the not ambrosial night. Let the darkness cover it again, for it pains the eye. Of a truth, Chalier's death is costing this city dear. Convention commissioners, Lyons congresses have come and gone, and action there was and reaction, bad ever growing worse. Till it has come to this, Commissioner Du Bois Grains, with seventy thousand men, and all the artillery of several provinces, bombarding Lyons day and night. Worse things still are in store. Famine is in Lyons, and ruin, and fire. Desperate are the sallies of the besieged, brave Preki, their national colonel and commandant, doing what is in man, desperate but ineffectual. Provisions cut off, nothing entering our city but shot and shells. The arsenal has roared aloft. The very hospital will be battered down, and the sick buried alive. A black flag hung on this latter noble edifice, appealing to the pity of the besiegers, for though maddened, were they not still our brethren? In their blind wrath, they took it for a flag of defiance, and aimed thitherward the more. Bad is growing ever worse here, and how will the worst stop, till it have grown worst of all? Commissioner Du Bois will listen to no pleading, to no speech, save this only, we surrender at discretion. Lyons contains in its subdued Jacobins, dominant Girondins, secret royalists. And now, mere death madness and cannon shot enveloping them, will not the desperate municipality fly, at last, into the arms of royalism itself? Majesty of Sardinia was to bring help, but it failed. Emigrant Autochamp, in name of the two pretender royal highnesses, is coming through Switzerland with help, coming, not yet come, Preki hoists the fleur de lis. At sight of which, all true Girondins sorrowfully fling down their arms, let our tricolor brethren storm us, then, and slay us in their wrath, with you we conquer not. The famishing women and children are sent forth, deaf Du Bois sends them back. Reigns in mere fire and madness. Our red outs of cotton bags are taken, retaken, Preki under his fleur de lis is valiant as despair. What will become of lions? It is a siege of seventy days. Or see, in these same weeks, far in the western waters, breasting through the Bay of Biscay, a greasy dingy little merchant ship, with Scotch skipper. Under hatches whereof sit, disconsolate, the last forlorn nucleus of Girondism, the deputies from Camper. Several have dissipated themselves, whithersoever they could. Poor Rio fell into the talons of Revolutionary Committee, and Paris prison. The rest sit here under hatches, Reverend Pession with his grey hair, angry Buzet, suspicious Louvet, brave young Barbarous, and others. They have escaped from Camper, in this sad craft, are now tacking and struggling. In danger from the waves, in danger from the English, in still worse danger from the French, banished by heaven and earth to the greasy belly of this Scotch skipper's merchant vessel, unfruitful Atlantic raving round. They are for Bordeaux, if peradventure hope yet linger there. Enter not Bordeaux, O oh friends! Bloody convention representatives, Taulin and such like, with their edicts, with their guillotine, have arrived there. Respectability is driven underground, Jacobinism lords it on high. From that Rio landing place, or beak of Ams, as it were, pale death, waving his revolutionary sword of sharpness, waves you elsewhither. On one side or the other of that Beck Diams, the Scotch skipper with difficulty moors, a dexterous greasy man, with difficulty lands his Girondins, who, after reconnoitering, must rapidly burrow in the earth. And so, in subterranean ways, in friends' back closets, in cellars, barn lofts, in caves of St. Emilian and Liborne, stave off cruel death. Unhappiest of all senators. Chapter 3.4.VI 
risen against tyrants. Against all which incalculable impediments, horrors and disasters, what can a Jacobin convention oppose? The uncalculating spirit of Jacobinism, and sans culotic sans formulistic frenzy. Our enemies press in on us, says Danton, but they shall not conquer us, we will burn France to ashes rather, nous brûlerons la France. Committees, of charite or salat, have raised themselves, à la hauteur, to the height of circumstances. Let all mortals raise themselves à la hauteur. Let the forty-four thousand sections and their revolutionary committees stir every fibre of the Republic, and every Frenchman feel that he is to do or die. They are the life circulation of Jacobinism, these sections and committees, Danton, through the organ of Barrère and Salat public, gets decreed, that there be in Paris, by law, two meetings of section weekly. Also, that the poorer citizen be paid for attending, and have his day's wages of forty sous. This is the celebrated law of the forty sous, fiercely stimulant to sansculottism, to the life circulation of Jacobinism. On the 23rd of August, Committee of Public Salvation, as usual through Barrere, had promulgated, in words not unworthy of remembering, their report, which is soon made into a law, of levy in mass. All France, and whatsoever it contains of men or resources, is put under requisition, says Barrere, really in Tertian words, the best we know of his. The Republic is one vast besieged city. Two hundred and fifty forges shall, in these days, be set up in the Luxembourg Garden, and round the outer wall of the Tilleries, to make gun barrels, in sight of earth and heaven. From all hamlets, towards their departmental town. From all their departmental towns, towards the appointed camp and seat of war, the sons of freedom shall march, their banner is to bear, le peuple français devout contre les tyrants, the French people risen against tyrants. The young men shall go to the battle, it is their task to conquer, the married men shall forge arms, transport baggage and artillery, provide subsistence, the women shall work at soldiers' clothes, make tents, serve in the hospitals. The children shall scrape old linen into surgeon's lint, the aged men shall have themselves carried into public places, and there, by their words, excite the courage of the young, preach hatred to kings and unity to the republic. Tertian words, which tingle through all French hearts. In this humour, then, since no other serves, will France rush against its enemies. Headlong, reckoning no cost or consequence. Heeding no law or rule but that supreme law, salvation of the people. The weapons are all the iron that is in France, the strength is that of all the men, women and children that are in France. There, in their two hundred and fifty shedsmithies, in Garden of Luxembourg or Tilleries, let them forge gun barrels, in sight of heaven and earth. Nor with heroic daring against the foreign foe, can black vengeance against the domestic be wanting. Life circulation of the revolutionary committees being quickened by that law of the forty sous, Deputy Merlin, not the Thienviller, whom we saw ride out of Mentz, but Merlin of Douay, named subsequently Merlin Suspect, comes, about a week after. With his world-famous law of the suspect, ordering all sections, by their committees, instantly to arrest all persons suspect. And explaining withal who the arrestable and suspect specially are. Our suspect, says he, all who by their actions, by their connections, speakings, writings have, in short become suspect. Nay Chaumet, illuminating the matter still further, in his municipal placards and proclamations, will bring it about that you may almost recognize a suspect on the streets, and clutch him there, off to committee, and prison. Watch well your words, watch well your looks, if suspect of nothing else, you may grow, as came to be a saying, suspect of being suspect. For are we not in a state of revolution? No frightful law ever ruled in a nation of men. All prisons and houses of arrest in French land are getting crowded to the ridge tile, 44,000 committees, like as many companies of reapers or gleaners, gleaning France, are gathering their harvest and storing it in these houses. Harvest of aristocrat tares. Nay, lest the 44,000, each on its own harvest field, prove insufficient, we are to have an ambulant, revolutionary army, 6,000 strong, under right captains, this shall perambulate the country at large. And strike in wherever it finds such harvest work slack. 
so have municipality and mother society petitioned, so has convention decreed. Let aristocrats, federalists, messieurs vanish, and all men tremble, the soil of liberty shall be purged, with a vengeance. Neither hitherto has the revolutionary tribunal been keeping holy day. Blanchelland, for losing St. Domingo. Conspirators of Orleans, for assassinating, for assaulting the sacred deputy Leonard Borden, these with many nameless, to whom life was sweet, have died. Daily the great guillotine has its due. Like a black spectre, daily at eventide, glides the death tumbrel through the variegated throng of things. The variegated street shudders at it, for the moment, next moment forgets it, the aristocrats. They were guilty against the republic. Their death, were it only that their goods are confiscated, will be useful to the republic, vive la republic. In the last days of August, fell a notabler head, General Custines. Custine was accused of harshness, of unskillfulness, perfidiousness. Accused of many things, found guilty, we may say, of one thing, unsuccessfulness. Hearing his unexpected sentence, Custine fell down before the crucifix, silent for the space of two hours, he fared, with moist eyes and a book of prayer, towards the place de la Revolution, glanced upwards at the clear suspended axe. Then mounted swiftly aloft, swiftly was struck away from the lists of the living. He had fought in America, he was a proud, brave man, and his fortune led him hither. On the second of this same month, at three in the morning, a vehicle rolled off, with closed blinds, from the temple to the conciergerie. Within it were two municipals, and Marie Antoinette, once Queen of France. There in that conciergerie, in ignominious dreary cell, she, cut off from children, kindred, friend and hope, sits long weeks, expecting when the end will be. The guillotine, we find, gets always a quicker motion, as other things are quickening. The guillotine, by its speed of going, will give index of the general velocity of the Republic. The clanking of its huge axe, rising and falling there, in horrid systole diastole, is portion of the whole enormous life movement and pulsation of the sans culottic system. Orleans conspirators and assaulters had to die, in spite of much weeping and entreating, so sacred is the person of a deputy. Yet the sacred can become desecrated, your very deputy is not greater than the guillotine. Poor deputy journalist Gorses, we saw him hide at Rennes, when the Calvados were burnt priming. He stole afterwards, in August, to Paris, lurked several weeks about the Palais C.I. de Vent Royal, was seen there, one day. Was clutched, identified, and without ceremony, being already, out of the law, was sent to the place de la Revolution. He died, recommending his wife and children to the pity of the Republic. It is the ninth day of October 1793. Gorses is the first deputy that dies on the scaffold, he will not be the last. Ex-Mayor Bailey is in prison, ex-Procure Manuel. Brissett and our poor arrested Girondins have become incarcerated indicted Girondins. Universal Jacobinism clamoring for their punishment. Duperet seals are broken. Those seventy-three secret protesters, suddenly one day, are reported upon, are decreed accused. The convention doors being, previously shut, that none implicated might escape. They were marched, in a very rough manner, to prison that evening. Happy those of them who chanced to be absent. Condorcet has vanished into darkness. Perhaps, like Rabot, sits between two walls, in the house of a friend. Chapter 3.4.7 Marie Antoinette on Monday, the 14th of October, 1793, a cause is pending in the Palais de Justice, in the new revolutionary court, such as these old stone walls never witnessed, the trial of Marie Antoinette. The once brightest of queens, now tarnished, defaced, forsaken, stands here at Fouquier Tinville's judgment bar, answering for her life. The indictment was delivered her last night. To such changes of human fortune what words are adequate? Silence alone is adequate. There are few printed things one meets with, of such tragic almost ghastly significance as those bald pages of the Bulletin du Tribunal Revolutionnaire, which bear title, Trial of the Widow Capet. Dim, dim, as if in disastrous eclipse, 
like the pale kingdoms of Dis. Plutonic judges, Plutonic Tinville, encircled, nine times, with Styx and Lethe, with Fire Phlegathon and Cositis named of lamentation. The very witnesses summoned are like ghosts, exculpatory, inculpatory, they themselves are all hovering over death and doom, they are known, in our imagination, as the prey of the guillotine. Tall C.I. Devant Count de Stang, anxious to shew himself patriot, cannot escape, nor Bailey, who, when asked if he knows the accused, answers with a reverent inclination towards her, Ah, yes, I know madam. Expatriates are here, sharply dealt with, as procure Manuel, ex-ministers, shorn of their splendor. We have cold aristocratic impassivity, faithful to itself even in Tartarus. Rabid stupidity, of patriot corporals, patriot washerwomen, who have much to say of plots, treasons, August 10, old insurrection of women. For all now has become a crime, in her who has lost. Marie Antoinette, in this her utter abandonment and hour of extreme need, is not wanting to herself, the imperial woman. Her look, they say, as that hideous indictment was reading, continued calm. She was sometimes observed moving her fingers, as when one plays on the piano. You discern, not without interest, across that dim revolutionary bulletin itself, how she bears herself queenlike. Her answers are prompt, clear, often of laconic brevity, resolution, which has grown contemptuous without ceasing to be dignified, veils itself in calm words. You persist then in denial. My plan is not denial, it is the truth I have said, and I persist in that. Scandalous Hébert has borne his testimony as to many things, as to one thing, concerning Marie Antoinette and her little son, wherewith human speech had better not further be soiled. She has answered Hébert. A juryman begs to observe that she has not answered as to this. I have not answered, she exclaims with noble emotion, because nature refuses to answer such a charge brought against a mother. I appeal to all the mothers that are here. Robespierre, when he heard of it, broke out into something almost like swearing at the brutish blockheadism of this Hébert, on whose foul head his foul lie has recoiled. At four o'clock on Wednesday morning, after two days and two nights of interrogating, jury charging, and other darkening of counsel, the result comes out, sentence of death. Have you anything to say? The accused shook her head, without speech. Night's candles are burning out, and with her two time is finishing, and it will be eternity and day. This hall of Tinville's is dark, ill-lighted except where she stands. Silently she withdraws from it, to die. Two processions, or royal progresses, three and twenty years apart, have often struck us with a strange feeling of contrast. The first is of a beautiful archduchess and dauphiness, quitting her mother's city, at the age of fifteen. Towards hope such as no other daughter of Eve then had, on the morrow, says Weber an eyewitness, the Dauphiness left Vienna. The whole city crowded out, at first with a sorrow which was silent. She appeared, you saw her sunk back into her carriage, her face bathed in tears, hiding her eyes now with her handkerchief, now with her hands. Several times putting out her head to see yet again this palace of her father's, whither she was to return no more. She motioned her regret, her gratitude to the good nation, which was crowding here to bid her farewell. Then arose not only tears, but piercing cries, on all sides. Men and women alike abandoned themselves to such expression of their sorrow. It was an audible sound of wail, in the streets and avenues of Vienna. The last courier that followed her disappeared, and the crowd melted away. The young imperial maiden of fifteen has now become a worn discrowned widow of thirty-eight. Grey before her time, this is the last procession, few minutes after the trial ended, the drums were beating to arms in all sections. At sunrise the armed force was on foot, cannons getting placed at the extremities of the bridges, in the squares, crossways, all along from the Palais de Justice to the Place de la Revolution. By ten o'clock, numerous patrols were circulating in the streets, thirty thousand foot and horse drawn up under arms. At eleven, Marie Antoinette was brought out. She had on an undress of pique blanc, she was led to the place of execution, in the same manner as an ordinary criminal, bound, on a cart, 
accompanied by a constitutional priest in lay dress, escorted by numerous detachments of infantry and cavalry. These, and the double row of troops all along her road, she appeared to regard with indifference. On her countenance there was visible neither abashment nor pride. To the cries of Vive la Republic and down with tyranny, which attended her all the way, she seemed to pay no heed. She spoke little to her confessor. The tricolor streamers on the housetops occupied her attention, in the streets du Rule and Saint Honore, she also noticed the inscriptions on the house fronts. On reaching the place de la Revolution, her looks turned towards the Jardin National, while Tilleries, her face at that moment gave signs of lively emotion. She mounted the scaffold with courage enough, at a quarter past twelve, her head fell. The executioner shoot it to the people, amid universal long-continued cries of, Vive la Republic. Chapter 3.4.8 The Twenty-Two Whom next, O Tinville? The next are of a different color, our poor arrested Girondin deputies. What of them could still be laid hold of, our Vergniad, Brissett, Fauchet, Belays, Jensan? The once flower of French patriotism, twenty-two by the tail, hither, at Tinville's bar, onward from, safeguard of the French people, from confinement in the Luxembourg, imprisonment in the conciergerie, have they now, by the course of things. Arrived. Fouquier Tinville must give what account of them he can. Undoubtedly this trial of the Girondins is the greatest that Fouquier has yet had to do. Twenty-two, all chief republicans, ranged in a line there, the most eloquent in France, lawyers too. Not without friends in the auditory. How will Tinville prove these men guilty of royalism, federalism, conspiracy against the Republic? Vergniad's eloquence awakes once more, draws tears, they say. And journalists report, and the trial lengthens itself out day after day, threatens to become eternal, murmur many. Jacobinism and municipality rise to the aid of Fouquier. On the 28th of the month, Hébert and others come in deputation to inform a patriot convention that the revolutionary tribunal is quite shackled by forms of law. That a patriot jury ought to have the power of cutting short of terminer less debats when they feel themselves convinced. Which pregnant suggestion of cutting short passes itself with all dispatch into a decree. Accordingly, at 10 o'clock on the night of the 30th of October, the 22, summoned back once more, receive this information, that the jury feeling themselves convinced have cut short, have brought in their verdict. That the accused are found guilty, and the sentence on one and all of them is death with confiscation of goods. Loud natural clamor rises among the poor Girondins, tumult, which can only be repressed by the gendarmes. Valais stabs himself. Falls down dead on the spot. The rest, amid loud clamor and confusion, are driven back to their conciergerie, Laysource exclaiming, I die on the day when the people have lost their reason, ye will die when they recover it. No help. Yielding to violence, the doomed uplift the hymn of the Marseillaise, return singing to their dungeon. Riouf, who was their prison mate in these last days, has lovingly recorded what death they made. To our notions, it is not an edifying death. Gay satirical potpourri by Ducas, rhymed scenes of tragedy, wherein Berayer and Robespierre discourse with Satan. Death's Eve spent in singing and sallies of gaiety, with discourses on the happiness of peoples, these things, and the like of these, we have to accept for what they are worth. It is the manner in which the Girondins make their last supper. Valais, with bloody breast, sleeps cold in death, hears not their singing. Vergniad has his dose of poison, but it is not enough for his friends, it is enough only for himself, wherefore he flings it from him. Presides at this last supper of the Girondins, with wild coruscations of eloquence, with song and mirth. Poor human will struggles to assert itself, if not in this way, then in that. But on the morrow morning all Paris is out. Such a crowd as no man had seen. The death carts, Valais's cold corpse stretched among the yet living twenty one, roll along. Bareheaded, hands bound, in their shirt sleeves, coat flung loosely round the neck, so fare the eloquent of France. Bemurmured, beshouted. 
To the shouts of Vive la Republic, some of them keep answering with countershouts of Vive la Republic. Others, as Brissett, sit sunk in silence. At the foot of the scaffold they again strike up, with appropriate variations, the hymn of the Marseillaise. Such an act of music, conceive it well. The yet living chant there, the chorus so rapidly wearing weak. Samson's axe is rapid. One head per minute, or little less. The chorus is worn out, farewell for evermore ye Girondins. Te Deum Fawcett has become silent, the Lazes dead head is lopped, the sickle of the guillotine has reaped the Girondins all away. The eloquent, the young, the beautiful and brave, exclaims Riouf. O oh death, what feast is toward in thy ghastly halls? Nor alas, in the far Bordeaux region, will Girondism fare better. In caves of St. Emilion, in loft and cellar, the weariest months, roll on, apparel worn, purse empty, wintry November come, under Tauline and his guillotine, all hope now gone. Danger drawing ever nigher, difficulty pressing ever straighter, they determine to separate. Not unpathetic the farewell. Tall Barbarous, cheeriest of brave men, stoops to clasp his louvet, in what place soever thou findest my mother, cries he, try to be instead of a son to her, no resource of mine but I will share with thy wife. Should chance ever led me where she is. Louvet went with Guadet, with Sales and Valadi, Barbarous with Buzet and Peshin. Valadi soon went southward, on a way of his own. The two friends and Louvet had a miserable day and night, the 14th of November month, 1793. Sunk in wet, weariness and hunger, they knock, on the morrow, for help, at a friend's country house, the faint-hearted friend refuses to admit them. They stood therefore under trees, in the pouring rain. Flying desperate, Louvet thereupon will to Paris. He sets forth, there and then, splashing the mud on each side of him, with a fresh strength gathered from fury or frenzy. He passes villages, finding the sentry asleep in his box in the thick rain. He is gone, before the man can call after him. He bilks revolutionary committees, rides in carriers' carts, covered carts and open. Lies hidden in one, under knapsacks and cloaks of soldiers' wives on the street of Orleans, while men search for him, has hairbreadth escapes that would fill three romances, finally he gets to Paris to his fair helpmate. Gets to Switzerland, and waits better days. Poor Guadet and Sales were both taken, ere long, they died by the guillotine in Bordeaux, drums beating to drown their voice. Valadi also is caught, and guillotined. Barbarous and his two comrades weathered it longer, into the summer of 1794, but not long enough. One July morning, changing their hiding place, as they have often to do, about a league from St. Emilion, they observe a great crowd of country people, doubtless Jacobins come to take them. Barbarous draws a pistol, shoots himself dead. Alas, and it was not Jacobins, it was harmless villagers going to a village wake. Two days afterwards, Buzet and Peshin were found in a cornfield, their bodies half-eaten with dogs. Such was the end of Girondism. They arose to regenerate France, these men, and have accomplished this. Alas, whatever quarrel we had with them, has not their cruel fate abolished it? Pity only survives. So many excellent souls of heroes sent down to Hades. They themselves given as a prey of dogs and all manner of birds. But, here too, the will of the supreme power was accomplished. As Verdmiad said, the revolution, like Saturn, is devouring its own children. Book 3.V. Terror the Order of the Day. Chapter 3.5.I. Rushing Down. We are now, therefore, got to that black precipitous abyss, whither all things have long been tending. Where, having now arrived on the giddy verge, they hurl down, in confused ruin, headlong, pell-mell, down, down, till sansculottism have consummated itself. And in this wondrous French Revolution, as in a doomsday, a world have been rapidly, if not born again, yet destroyed and engulfed. Terror has long been terrible, but to the actors themselves it has now become manifest that their appointed course is one of terror, and they say, be it so. 
que la terror soit à l'ordre du jour. So many centuries, say only from Hugh Capet downwards, had been adding together, century transmitting it with increase to century, the sum of wickedness, of falsehood, oppression of man by man. Kings were sinners, and priests were, and people. Open scoundrels rode triumphant, be diademed, becoroneted, bemitered. Or the still fataler species of secret scoundrels, in their fair-sounding formulas, speciosities, respectabilities, hollow within, the race of quacks was grown many as the sands of the sea. Till at length such a sum of quackery had accumulated itself as, in brief, the earth and the heavens were weary of. Slow seemed the day of settlement, coming on, all imperceptible, across the bluster and fanfaronade of courtierisms, conquering heroisms, most Christian grand monarchisms. Well-beloved pompadorisms, yet behold it was always coming. Behold it has come, suddenly, unlooked for by any man. The harvest of long centuries was ripening and whitening so rapidly of late, and now it is grown white, and is reaped rapidly, as it were, in one day. Reaped, in this reign of terror. And carried home, to Hades and the pit, unhappy sons of Adam, it is ever so, and never do they know it, nor will they know it. With cheerfully smoothed countenances, day after day, and generation after generation, they, calling cheerfully to one another, well speed ye, are at work, sowing the wind. And yet, as God lives, they shall reap the whirlwind, no other thing, we say, is possible, since God is a truth and his world is a truth. History, however, in dealing with this reign of terror, has had her own difficulties. While the phenomenon continued in its primary state, as mere horrors of the French Revolution, there was abundance to be said and shrieked. With and also without profit. Heaven knows there were terrors and horrors enough, yet that was not all the phenomenon, nay, more properly, that was not the phenomenon at all, but rather was the shadow of it, the negative part of it. And now, in a new stage of the business, when history, ceasing to shriek, would try rather to include under her old forms of speech or speculation this new amazing thing. That so some accredited scientific law of nature might suffice for the unexpected product of nature, and history might get to speak of it articulately, and draw inferences and profit from it. In this new stage, history, we must say, babbles and flounders perhaps in a still painfuler manner. Take, for example, the latest form of speech we have seen propounded on the subject as adequate to it, almost in these months, by our worthy M. Rue, in his Histoire Parlementaire. The latest and the strangest, that the French Revolution was a deadlift effort, after 1800 years of preparation, to realize, the Christian religion. Unity, indivisibility, brotherhood or death did indeed stand printed on all houses of the living. Also, on cemeteries, or houses of the dead, stood printed, by order of Procure Chamet, here is eternal sleep, but a Christian religion realized by the guillotine and death eternal, is suspect to me, as Robespierre was wont to say. M. S. suspect. Alas, no, M. Rue. A gospel of brotherhood, not according to any of the four old evangelists, and calling on men to repent, and amend each his own wicked existence, that they might be saved. But a gospel rather, as we often hint, according to a new fifth evangelist John Jacques, calling on men to amend each the whole world's wicked existence, and be saved by making the constitution. A thing different and distant toto silla, as they say, the whole breadth of the sky, and further if possible. It is thus, however, that history, and indeed all human speech and reason does yet, what Father Adam began life by doing, strive to name the new things it sees of nature's producing, often helplessly enough. But what if history were to admit, for once, that all the names and theorems yet known to her fall short? That this grand product of nature was even grand, and new, in that it came not to range itself under old recorded laws of nature at all. But to disclose new ones. In that case, history renouncing the pretension to name it at present, will look honestly at it, and name what she can of it. Any approximation to the right name has value, were the right name itself once here, the thing is known thenceforth, the thing is then ours, and can be dealt with. Now surely not realization, of Christianity, 
or of aught earthly, do we discern in this reign of terror, in this French Revolution of which it is the consummating. Destruction rather we discern, of all that was destructible. It is as if twenty-five millions, risen at length into the Pythian mood, had stood up simultaneously to say, with a sound which goes through far lands and times, that this untruth of an existence had become insupportable. O ye hypocrisies and speciosities, royal mantles, cardinal plush cloaks, ye credos, formulas, respectabilities, fair painted sepulchres full of dead men's bones, behold, ye appear to us to be altogether a lie. Yet our life is not a lie. Yet our hunger and misery is not a lie. Behold we lift up, one and all, our twenty-five million right hands, and take the heavens, and the earth and also the pit of Tophet to witness, that either ye shall be abolished, or else we shall be abolished. No inconsiderable oath, truly, forming, as has been often said, the most remarkable transaction in these last thousand years. Wherefrom likewise there follow, and will follow, results. The fulfillment of this oath. That is to say, the black desperate battle of men against their whole condition and environment, a battle, alas, withal, against the sin and darkness that was in themselves as in others, this is the reign of terror. Transcendental despair was the purport of it, though not consciously so. False hopes, of fraternity, political millennium, and what not, we have always seen, but the unseen heart of the whole, the transcendental despair, was not false. Neither has it been of no effect. Despair, pushed far enough, completes the circle, so to speak, and becomes a kind of genuine productive hope again. Doctrine of fraternity, out of old Catholicism, does, it is true, very strangely in the vehicle of a Jean-Jacques Evangel, suddenly plump down out of its cloud firmament, and from a theorem determined to make itself a practice. But just so do all creeds, intentions, customs, knowledges, thoughts and things, which the French have, suddenly plump down. Catholicism, classicism, sentimentalism, cannibalism, all isms that make up man in France, are rushing and roaring in that gulf, and the theorem has become a practice, and whatsoever cannot swim sinks. Not evangelist John Jacques alone. There is not a village schoolmaster but has contributed his quota, do we not thou one another, according to the free peoples of antiquity? The French patriot, in red Phrygian nightcap of liberty, christens his poor little red infant Cato, censor, or else of Utica. Gracchus has become Babouf and edits newspapers. Mutius Sivola, cordwainer of that ilk, presides in the section Mutius Sivola, and in brief, there is a world wholly jumbling itself, to try what will swim. Wherefore we will, at all events, call this reign of terror a very strange one. Dominant sansculottism makes, as it were, free arena, one of the strangest temporary states humanity was ever seen in. A nation of men, full of wants and void of habits. The old habits are gone to wreck because they were old, men, driven forward by necessity and fierce Pythian madness, have, on the spur of the instant, to devise for the want the way of satisfying it. The wanted tumbles down. By imitation, by invention, the unwanted hastily builds itself up. What the French national head has in it comes out, if not a great result, surely one of the strangest. Neither shall the reader fancy that it was all blank, this reign of terror, far from it. How many hammermen and square men, bakers and brewers, washers and ringers, over this France, must ply their old daily work, let the government be one of terror or one of joy. In this Paris there are twenty-three theatres nightly. Some count as many as sixty places of dancing. The playwright manufactures, pieces of a strictly republican character. Ever fresh novel garbage, as of old, fodders the circulating libraries. The cesspool of Agio, now in the time of paper money, works with a vivacity unexampled, unimagined, exhales from itself sudden fortunes, like Aladdin palaces, really a kind of miraculous fata morganas, since you can live in them, for a time. Terror is as a sable ground, on which the most variegated of scenes paints itself. In startling transitions, in colors all intensated, the sublime, the ludicrous, the horrible succeed one another. Or rather, in crowding tumult, accompany one another. Here, accordingly, if anywhere, 
the hundred tongues, which the old poets often clamor for, were of supreme service. In defect of any such organ on our part, let the reader stir up his own imaginative organ, let us snatch for him this or the other significant glimpse of things, in the fittest sequence we can. Chapter 3.5.2 Death In the early days of November, there is one transient glimpse of things that is to be noted, the last transit to his long home of Philippe d'Orlans Egalité. Philippe was, decreed accused, along with the Girondins, much to his and their surprise. But not tried along with them. They are doomed and dead, some three days, when Philippe, after his long half-year of durance at Marseilles, arrives in Paris. It is, as we calculate, the 3rd of November 1793. On which same day, two notable female prisoners are also put in ward there, Dame Dubarry and Josephine Beauharnais. Dame Wylam Countess Dubarry, unfortunate female, had returned from London. They snatched her, not only as ex-harlot of a Wylam majesty, and therefore suspect, but as having, furnished the emigrants with money. Contemporaneously with whom, there comes the wife of Beauharnais, soon to be the widow, she that is Josephine Tasher Beauharnais. That shall be Josephine Empress Bunaparte, for a black diviners of the tropics prophesied long since that she should be a queen and more. Likewise, in the same hours, poor Adam Lux, nigh turned in the head, who, according to Foster, has taken no food these three weeks, marches to the guillotine for his pamphlet on Charlotte Corday, he sprang to the scaffold. Said he died for her with great joy. Amid such fellow travellers does Philippe arrive. For, be the month named Brumaire Year II of Liberty, or November Year 1793 of Slavery, the guillotine goes always, guillotine va toujours. Enough, Philippe's indictment is soon drawn, his jury soon convinced. He finds himself made guilty of royalism, conspiracy, and much else, nay, it is a guilt in him that he voted Louis's death, though he answers, I voted in my soul and conscience. The doom he finds is death forthwith, this present sixth dim day of November is the last day that Philippe is to see. Philippe, says Montgaillard, thereupon called for breakfast, sufficiency of oysters, two cutlets, best part of an excellent bottle of claret, and consumed the same with apparent relish. A revolutionary judge, or some official convention emissary, then arrived, to signify that he might still do the state some service by revealing the truth about a plot or two. Philippe answered that, on him, in the past things had come to, the state had, he thought, small claim. That nevertheless, in the interest of liberty, he, having still some leisure on his hands, was willing, were a reasonable question asked him, to give reasonable answer. And so, says Montgaillard, he lent his elbow on the mantelpiece, and conversed in an undertone, with great seeming composure, till the leisure was done, or the emissary went his ways. At the door of the conciergerie, Philippe's attitude was erect and easy, almost commanding. It is five years, all but a few days, since Philippe, within these same stone walls, stood up with an air of graciosity, and asked King Louis, whether it was a royal session, then, or a bed of justice. Oh heaven! Three poor blackguards were to ride and die with him, some say, they objected to such company, and had to be flung in, neck and heels, but it seems not true. Objecting or not objecting, the gallows vehicle gets under way. Philippe's dress is remarked for its elegance, green frock, waistcoat of white peak, yellow buckskins, boots clear as Warren, his air, as before, entirely composed, impassive, not to say easy and bromelian polite. Through street after street. Slowly, amid execrations, past the Palais Egalité Wylam Palais Royal. The cruel populace stopped him there, some minutes, Dame de Buffon, it is said, looked out on him, in Jezebel head tire. Along the Ashler wall, there ran these words in huge tricolor print, Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death, National Property. Philippe's eyes flashed hellfire, one instant. But the next instant it was gone, and he sat impassive, Bromelian polite. On the scaffold, Samson was for drawing of his boots, Tush, said Philippe, they will come better off after, let us have done, Depicon's noose. 
so Philippe was not without virtue, then. God forbid that there should be any living man without it. He had the virtue to keep living for five and forty years, other virtues perhaps more than we know of. Probably no mortal ever had such things recorded of him, such facts, and also such lies. For he was a Jacobin prince of the blood, consider what a combination. Also, unlike any Nero, any Borgia, he lived in the age of pamphlets. Enough for us, chaos has reabsorbed him, may it late or never bear his like again, brave young Orleans Egalite, deprived of all, only not deprived of himself, is gone to Quar in the Grisons, under the name of Corby, to teach mathematics. The Egalite family is at the darkest depths of the Nadir. A far nobler victim follows, one who will claim remembrance from several centuries, Jean-Marie Flippon, the wife of Roland. Queenly, sublime in her uncomplaining sorrow, seems she to reoff in her prison. Something more than is usually found in the looks of women painted itself, says Rioff, in those large black eyes of hers, full of expression and sweetness. She spoke to me often, at the grate, we were all attentive round her, in a sort of admiration and astonishment. She expressed herself with a purity, with a harmony and prosody that made her language like music, of which the ear could never have enough. Her conversation was serious, not cold. Coming from the mouth of a beautiful woman, it was frank and courageous as that of a great man. And yet her maid said, Before you, she collects her strength. But in her own room, she will sit three hours sometimes, leaning on the window, and weeping. She had been in prison, liberated once, but recaptured the same hour, ever since the first of June, in agitation and uncertainty. Which has gradually settled down into the last stern certainty, that of death. In the Abbey prison, she occupied Charlotte Corday's apartment. Here in the conciergerie, she speaks with Rioff, with ex-minister Clavier. Calls the beheaded twenty-two, Nos Amos, our friends, whom we are soon to follow. During these five months, those memoirs of hers were written, which all the world still reads. But now, on the 8th of November, clad in white, says Rioff, with her long black hair hanging down to her girdle, she is gone to the judgment bar. She returned with a quick step. Lifted her finger, to signify to us that she was doomed, her eyes seemed to have been wet. Fouquier Tinville's questions had been, brutal, offended female honor flung them back on him, with scorn, not without tears. And now, short preparation soon done, she shall go her last road. There went with her a certain Lamarche, director of Assignat Printing, whose dejection she endeavored to cheer. Arrived at the foot of the scaffold, she asked for pen and paper, to write the strange thoughts that were rising in her, a remarkable request, which was refused. Looking at the Statue of Liberty which stands there, she says bitterly, O Liberty, what things are done in thy name. For Lamarche's sake, she will die first, shew him how easy it is to die, contrary to the order, said Samson. Shaw, you cannot refuse the last request of a lady, and Samson yielded. Noble white vision, with its high queenly face, its soft proud eyes, long black hair flowing down to the girdle, and as brave a heart as ever beat in woman's bosom. Like a white Grecian statue, serenely complete, she shines in that black wreck of things, long memorable. Honor to great nature who, in Paris city, in the era of noble sentiment and pompadourism, can make a gene flip on, and nourish her to clear perennial womanhood, though but on logics, encyclopedies, and the gospel according to Jean-Jacques. Biography will long remember that trait of asking for a pen to write the strange thoughts that were rising in her. It is as a little light beam, shedding softness and a kind of sacredness over all that preceded, so in her too there was an unnameable, she too was a daughter of the infinite, there were mysteries which philosophism had not dreamt of. She left long written counsels to her little girl, she said her husband would not survive her. Still crueler was the fate of poor Bailey, first national president, first mayor of Paris, doomed now for royalism, fayetteism. For that red flag business of the Champ de Mars, one may say in general, for leaving his astronomy to meddle with revolution. It is the 10th of November, 1793, a cold bitter drizzling rain, as poor Bailey is led through the streets. 
howling populace covering him with curses, with mud, waving over his face a burning or smoking mockery of a red flag. Silent, unpitied, sits the innocent old man. Slow faring through the sleety drizzle, they have got to the Champtomars, not there. Vociferates the cursing populace, such blood ought not to stain an altar of the fatherland, not there, but on that dung heap by the riverside. So vociferates the cursing populace, officiality gives ear to them. The guillotine is taken down, though with hands numbed by the sleety drizzle, is carried to the riverside, is there set up again, with slow numbness, pulse after pulse still counting itself out in the old man's weary heart. Four hours long. Amid curses and bitter frost rain. Bailey, thou tremblest, said one. Mon ami, it is for cold, said Bailey, say de Freud. Crueler end had no mortal. Some days afterwards, Roland hearing the news of what happened on the 8th, embraces his kind friends at Rouen, leaves their kind house which had given him refuge, goes forth, with farewell too sad for tears. On the morrow morning, 16th of the month, some four leagues from Rouen, Paris Ward, near Bourg Baudouin, in M. Mormons Avenue, there is seen sitting lent against a tree, the figure of rigorous wrinkled man, stiff now in the rigor of death. A cane sword run through his heart, and at his feet this writing, Whoever thou art that findest me lying, respect my remains, they are those of a man who consecrated all his life to being useful, and who has died as he lived, virtuous and honest. Not fear, but indignation, made me quit my retreat, on learning that my wife had been murdered. I wished not to remain longer on an earth polluted with crimes. Barnave's appearance at the Revolutionary Tribunal was of the bravest. But it could not stead him. They have sent for him from Grenoble, to pay the common smart, vain is eloquence, forensic or other, against the dumb clotho shears of Tinville. He is still but two and thirty, this Barnave, and has known such changes. Short while ago, we saw him at the top of fortune's wheel, his word a law to all patriots, and now surely he is at the bottom of the wheel, in stormful altercation with a Tinville tribunal, which is dooming him to die. And Pession, once also of the extreme left, and named Pession Virtue, where is he? Civilly dead, in the caves of St. Emilion, to be devoured of dogs. And Robespierre, who rode along with him on the shoulders of the people, is in committee of Sallet. Civilly alive, not to live always. So Giddy Swift whirls and spins this immeasurable tormentum of a revolution, wild booming, not to be followed by the eye. Barnave, on the scaffold, stamped his foot. And looking upwards was heard to ejaculate, This then is my reward. Deputy ex procure Manuel is already gone. And Deputy Ocelin, famed also in August and September, is about to go, and Rabot, discovered treacherously between his two walls, and the brother of Rabot. National deputies not a few. And generals, the memory of General Custine cannot be defended by his son, his son is already guillotined. Custine the ex-noble was replaced by Houchard the plebeian, he too could not prosper in the north, for him too there was no mercy. He has perished in the place de la Revolution, after attempting suicide in prison. And Generals Byron, Beauharnais, Brunette, whatsoever general prospers not, tough old Luckner, with his eyes grown roomy. Alsatian Westermen, valiant and diligent in Lavade, none of them can, as the psalmist sings, his soul from death deliver. How busy are the revolutionary committees, sections with their forty halfpence a day. Arrestment on arrestment falls quick, continual, followed by death. Ex-Minister Clavier has killed himself in prison. Ex-Minister Lebrun, seized in a hayloft, under the disguise of a working man, is instantly conducted to death. Nay, withal, is it not what Barrere calls, coining money on the place de la Revolution? For always the, property of the guilty, if property he have, is confiscated. To avoid accidents, we even make a law that suicide shall not defraud us. That a criminal who kills himself does not the less incur forfeiture of goods. Let the guilty tremble, therefore, and the suspect, and the rich, and in a word all manner of collotic men. Luxembourg Palace, once Messieurs, has become a huge loathsome prison, Chantilly Palace too, once Condé's, 
and their landlords are at Blankenberg, on the wrong side of the Rhine. In Paris are now some twelve prisons. In France some forty-four thousand, thitherward, thick as brown leaves in autumn, rustle and travel the suspect, shaken down by revolutionary committees, they are swept thitherward, as into their storehouse, to be consumed by Samson and Tinville. The guillotine goes not ill, la guillotine en eva pas mal. Chapter 3.5.3 .3. Destruction The suspect may well tremble, but how much more the open rebels, the Girondin cities of the south. Revolutionary army is gone forth, under Ronson the playwright, six thousand strong, in red nightcap, in tricolor waistcoat, in black shag trousers, black shag spencer, with enormous mustachios, enormous saber, in carmignol complete. And has portable guillotines. Representative Carrier has got to Nantes, by the edge of blazing Lavade, which Rossignol has literally set on fire, Carrier will try what captives you make, what accomplices they have, Royalist or Girondin, his guillotine goes always. V.A. Toujours. And his wool-capped, company of Marat. Little children are guillotined, and aged men. Swift as the machine is, it will not serve, the headsman and all his valets sink, worn down with work, declare that the human muscles can no more. Whereupon you must try fusillading, to which perhaps still frightfuler methods may succeed. In Brest, to like purpose, rules Jean Bon Saint Andre, with an army of red nightcaps. In Bordeaux rules Tauline, with his Isabeau and henchmen, Guadets, Cussis, Solaces, Mayfall, the bloody pike and nightcap bearing supreme sway, the guillotine coining money. Bristly fox haired Tauline, once able editor, still young in years, is now become most gloomy, potent, a Pluto on earth, and has the keys of Tartarus. One remarks, however, that a certain Senorina Cabras, or call her rather Senora and wedded not yet widowed Dame de Fontenay, brown beautiful woman, daughter of Cabras the Spanish merchant, has softened the red bristly countenance. Pleading for herself and friends, and prevailing. The keys of Tartarus, or any kind of power, are something to a woman, gloomy Pluto himself is not insensible to love. Like a new proserpine, she, by this red gloomy dis, is gathered. And, they say, softens his stone heart a little. Maynet, at Orange in the south, Leban, at Eris in the north, become world's wonders. Jacobin Popular Tribunal, with its national representative, perhaps where Girondin Popular Tribunal had lately been, rises here and rises there, wheresoever needed. Fouchés, Maynets, Barrises, Freron scour the southern departments. Like reapers, with their guillotine sickle. Many are the laborers, great is the harvest. By the hundred and the thousand, men's lives are cropped, cast like brands into the burning. Marseilles is taken, and put under martial law, lo, at Marseilles, what one besmutted red-bearded corneer is this which they cut, one gross man, we mean, with copper-studded face, plenteous beard, or beard stubble, of a tile color. By Nemesis and the Fatal Sisters, it is Jordan Couptet. Him they have clutched, in these martial law districts, him too, with their, national razor, their reservoir national, they sternly shave away. Lo now is Jordan the headsman's own head. Lo as de Schutzes and Verignes, which he sent on pikes, in the insurrection of women. No more shall he, as a copper portent, be seen gyrating through the cities of the south, no more sit judging, with pipes and brandy, in the ice tower of Avignon. The all hiding earth has received him, the bloated tile beard, may we never look upon his like again, Jordan one names, the other hundreds are not named. Alas, they, like confused faggots, lie massed together for us. Counted by the cartload, and yet not an individual faggot twig of them but had a life and history, and was cut, not without pangs as when a Kaiser dies. Least of all cities can lions escape. Lions, which we saw in dread sun blaze, that autumn night when the powder tower sprang aloft, was clearly verging towards a sad end. Inevitable, what could desperate valor and precky do? Du Bois cranes, deaf as destiny, stern as doom, capturing their red outs of cotton bags, hemming them in, ever closer, with his artillery lava. 
Never would that C.I. Devant D'Autochamp arrive, never any help from Blankenberg. The lion's jacobins were hidden in cellars, the Girondin municipality waxed pale, in famine, treason and red fire. Preki drew his sword, and some fifteen hundred with him, sprang to saddle, to cut their way to Switzerland. They cut fiercely. And were fiercely cut and cut down, not hundreds, hardly units of them ever saw Switzerland. Lyons, on the 9th of October, surrenders at discretion, it has become a devoted town. Abbe Lamourette, now Bishop Lamourette, whilom legislator, he of the old Bazerel Lamourette or Delilah Kiss, is seized here, is sent to Paris to be guillotined, he made the sign of the cross. They say when Tinville intimated his death sentence to him. And died as an eloquent constitutional bishop. But when now to all bishops, priests, aristocrats and federalists that are in Lyons. The manies of Chalier are to be appeased, the Republic, maddened to the Sibylline pitch, has bared her right arm. Behold! Representative Fouché, it is Fouché of Nantes, a name to become well known, he with a patriot company goes duly, in wondrous procession, to raise the corpse of Chalier. An ass, housed in priest's cloak, with a mitre on its head, and trailing the mass books, some say the very Bible, at its tail, paces through lion streets, escorted by multitudinous patriotism, by clangor as of the pit. Towards the grave of martyr Chalier. The body is dug up and burnt, the ashes are collected in an urn, to be worshipped of Paris patriotism. The holy books were part of the funeral pile, their ashes are scattered to the wind. Amid cries of, Vengeance! Vengeance! Which, writes Fouché, shall be satisfied. Lyons in fact is a town to be abolished, not Lyons henceforth but, Commune Franchi, Township Freed, the very name of it shall perish. It is to be raised, this once great city, if Jacobinism prophesy right, and a pillar to be erected on the ruins, with this inscription, Lyons rebelled against the Republic, Lyons is no more. Fouché, Cuthin, Collot, convention representatives succeed one another, there is work for the hangman, work for the hammerman, not in building. The very houses of aristocrats, we say, are doomed. Paralytic Cuthin, born in a chair, taps on the wall, with emblematic mallet, saying, La loi te frappe, the law strikes thee, masons, with wedge and crowbar, begin demolition. Crash of downfall, dim ruin and dust clouds fly in the winter wind. Had lions been of soft stuff, it had all vanished in those weeks, and the Jacobin prophecy had been fulfilled. But towns are not built of soap froth, Lyons town is built of stone. Lyons, though it rebelled against the Republic, is to this day. Neither have the Lyons Girondins all one neck, that you could dispatch it at one swoop. Revolutionary tribunal here, and military commission, guillotining, fusillating, do what they can, the kennels of the place de terreaux run red. Mangled corpses roll down the Rhone. Collot de Herboys, they say, was once hissed on the lion stage, but with what sibilation, of world catcall or horse Tartarian trumpet, will ye hiss him now, in this his new character of convention representative, not to be repeated. Two hundred and nine men are marched forth over the river, to be shot in mass, by musket and cannon, in the promenade of the Brados. It is the second of such scenes, the first was of some seventy. The corpses of the first were flung into the Rhone, but the Rhone stranded some, so these now, of the second lot, are to be buried on land. Their one long grave is dug, they stand ranked, by the loose mold ridge. The younger of them singing the Marseillaise. Jacobin National Guards give fire, but have again to give fire, and again, and to take the bayonet and the spade, for though the doomed all fall, they do not all die. And it becomes a butchery too horrible for speech. So that the very nationals, as they fire, turn away their faces. Collot, snatching the musket from one such national, and leveling it with unmoved countenance, says, it is thus a republican ought to fire. This is the second fusillade, and happily the last, it is found too hideous, even inconvenient. They were two hundred and nine marched out, one escaped at the end of the bridge, yet behold, when you count the corpses, they are two hundred and ten. 
Read us this riddle, O Kalat. After long guessing, it is called to mind that two individuals, here in the Brado's ground, did attempt to leave the rank, protesting with agony that they were not condemned men, that they were police commissaries, which too we repulsed. And disbelieved, and shot with the rest. Such is the vengeance of an enraged republic. Surely this, according to Barrere's phrase, is justice under rough forms, suda forms acerbis. But the republic, as Fouché says, must march to liberty over corpses. Or again, as Barrere has it, none but the dead do not come back, Illinois NY a K less morts can e revine and pa. Terror hovers far and wide, the guillotine goes not ill. But before quitting those southern regions, over which history can cast only glances from aloft, she will alight for a moment, and look fixedly at one point, the siege of Toulon. Much battering and bombarding, heating of balls in furnaces or farmhouses, serving of artillery well and ill, attacking of Alios passes, forts Malbesquite, there has been, as yet to small purpose. We have had General Carteau here, a whilom painter elevated in the troubles of Marseilles, General Doppet, a whilom medical man elevated in the troubles of Piedmont, who, under cranes, took lions, but cannot take Toulon. Finally we have General de Gamier, a pupil of Washington. Convention representants also we have had. Barrises, Salicetis, Robespierre's the Younger, also an artillery chef de brigade, of extreme diligence, who often takes his nap of sleep among the guns. A short taciturn, olive-complexioned young man, not unknown to us, by name Bunaparte, one of the best artillery officers yet met with. And still Toulon is not taken. It is the fourth month now, December, in slave style. Frustarius or Fremer, in new style, and still their cursed red-blue flag flies there. They are provisioned from the sea, they have seized all heights, felling wood, and fortifying themselves. Like the Coney, they have built their nest in the rocks. Meanwhile, Frosterius is not yet become Snoas or Nivos, when a council of war is called, instructions have just arrived from government and Salat Public. Carnot, in Salat Public, has sent us a plan of siege, on which plan General de Gamier has this criticism to make, Commissioner Salicetti has that, and criticisms and plans are very various, when that young artillery officer ventures to speak. The same whom we saw snatching sleep among the guns, who has emerged several times in this history, the name of him Napoleon Bonaparte. It is his humble opinion, for he has been gliding about with spyglasses, with thoughts, that a certain Fort de l'Aiguillette can be clutched, as with Lion Spring, on the sudden. Where from, were at once ours, the very heart of Toulon might be battered, the English lines were, so to speak, turned inside out, and Hood and our natural enemies must next day either put to sea, or be burnt to ashes. Commissioners arched their eyebrows, with negatory sniff, who is this young gentleman with more wit than we all? Brave veteran de Gamier, however, thinks the idea worth a word, questions the young gentleman, becomes convinced. And there is for issue, try it. On the taciturn bronze countenance, therefore, things being now all ready, there sits a grimmer gravity than ever, compressing a hotter central fire than ever. Yonder, thou sayest, is Fort Elegoulet. A desperate lion spring, yet a possible one, this day to be tried, tried it is, and found good. By stratagem and valor, stealing through ravines, plunging fiery through the fire tempest, Fort Elegoulet is clutched at, is carried. The smoke having cleared, wiser the tricolor fly on it, the bronze-complexioned young man was right. Next morning, Hood, finding the interior of his lines exposed, his defenses turned inside out, makes for his shipping. Taking such royalists as wished it on board with him, he weighs anchor, on this 19th of December, 1793, Toulon is once more the Republic's. Cannonading has ceased at Toulon, and now the guillotining and fusillading may begin. Civil horrors, truly, but at least that infamy of an English domination is purged away. Let there be civic feast universally over France, so reports Barrere, or painter David, and the convention assist in a body. Nay, it is said, these infamous English, 
with an attention rather to their own interests than to ours, set fire to our storehouses, arsenals, warships in Toulon Harbor, before weighing, some score of brave warships, the only ones we now had. However, it did not prosper, though the flame spread far and high, some two ships were burnt, not more, the very galley slaves ran with buckets to quench. These same proud ships, ships Lorient and the rest, have to carry this same young man to Egypt first, not yet can they be changed to ashes, or to sea nymphs. Not yet to sky rockets, O ship Lorient, nor became the prey of England, before their time. And so, over France universally, there is civic feast and high tide, and Toulon sees fusillading, grape shotting in mass, as lions saw. And death is poured out in great floods, Vomi a grands flots and twelve thousand masons are requisitioned from the neighboring country, to raise Toulon from the face of the earth. For it is to be raised, so reports Barrier. All but the national shipping establishments, and to be called henceforth not Toulon, but Port of the Mountain. There in black death cloud we must leave it, hoping only that Toulon too is built of stone. That perhaps even twelve thousand masons cannot pull it down, till the fit pass. One begins to be sick of, death vomited in great floods. Nevertheless hearest thou not, O reader, for the sound reaches through centuries, in the dead December and January nights, over Nantes town, confused noises, as of musketry in tumult, as of rage and lamentation. Mingling with the everlasting moan of the lawyer waters there. Nantes town is sunk in sleep, but representant carrier is not sleeping, the wool-capped company of Marat is not sleeping. Why unmoors that flat-bottomed craft, that gabar? About eleven at night, with ninety priests under hatches? They are going to Belle Isle. In the middle of the lawyer stream, on signal given, the gabar is scuttled, she sinks with all her cargo. Sentence of deportation, writes carrier, was executed vertically. The ninety priests, with their gabar coffin, lie deep. It is the first of the moyads, what we may call drownages, of carrier, which have become famous forever. Guillotining there was at Nantes, till the headsmen sank worn out, then fusillading, in the plain of St. Mauve, little children fusillade, and women with children at the breast, children and women, by the hundred and twenty. And by the five hundred, so hot is Lavade, till the very Jacobins grew sick, and all but the company of Marat cried, Hold! Wherefore now we have got Moyadding. And on the twenty-fourth night of Frosterius year two, which is fourteenth of December, seventeen ninety-three, we have a second Moyad, consisting of a hundred and thirty-eight persons. Or why waste a gabar, sinking it with them? Fling them out. Fling them out, with their hands tied, pour a continual hail of lead over all the space, till the last struggler of them be sunk. Unsound sleepers of Nantes, and the sea villages thereabouts, hear the musketry amid the night winds. Wonder what the meaning of it is. And women were in that gabar, whom the red nightcaps were stripping naked, who begged, in their agony, that their smocks might not be stripped from them. And young children were thrown in, their mothers vainly pleading, wolflings, answered the company of Marat, who would grow to be wolves. By degrees, daylight itself witnesses noyades, women and men are tied together, feet and feet, hands and hands, and flung in, this they call mariage republicain, republican marriage. Cruel is the panther of the woods, the she-bear bereaved of her whelps, but there is in man a hatred crueler than that. Dumb, out of suffering now, as pale swollen corpses, the victims tumble confusedly seaward along the lawyer stream. The tide rolling them back, clouds of ravens darken the river, wolves prowl on the shoal places, carrier writes, quell torrent revolutionaire, what a torrent of revolution. For the man is rabid, and the time is rabid. These are the noyades of carrier, twenty-five by the tail, for what is done in darkness comes to be investigated in sunlight, not to be forgotten for centuries, we will turn to another aspect of the consummation of Sansculottism. Leaving this as the blackest. But indeed men are all rabid, as the time is. Representative Levin, at Eris, dashes his sword into the blood flowing from the guillotine, exclaims, how I like it. Mothers, they say, by his order, have to stand by while the guillotine devours their children, 
a band of music is stationed near, and, at the fall of every head, strikes up its CAIRA. In the Burg of Bedouin, in the Orange region, the Liberty Tree has been cut down overnight. Representative Maynet, at Orange, hears of it, burns Bedouin Burg to the last dog hutch. Guillotines the inhabitants, or drives them into the caves and hills. Republic One and Indivisible. She is the newest birth of nature's waste inorganic deep, which men name Orcus, Chaos, Primeval Night, and knows one law, that of self-preservation. Tigress Nationale, meddle not with a whisker of her. Swift crushing is her stroke, look what a paw she spreads, pity has not entered her heart. Prudhomme, the dull blustering printer and able editor, as yet a Jacobin editor, will become a renegade one, and publish large volumes on these matters, crimes of the revolution, adding innumerable lies withal, as if the truth were not sufficient. We, for our part, find it more edifying to know, one good time, that this republic and national tigress is a new birth, a fact of nature among formulas, in an age of formulas. And to look, oftenest in silence, how the so genuine nature fact will demean itself among these. For the formulas are partly genuine, partly delusive, suppositious, we call them, in the language of metaphor, regulated modeled shapes. Some of which have bodies and life still in them, most of which, according to a German writer, have only emptiness, glass eyes glaring on you with a ghastly affectation of life, and in their interior unclean accumulation of beetles and spiders. But the fact, let all men observe, is a genuine and sincere one, the sincerest of facts, terrible in its sincerity, as very death. Whatsoever is equally sincere may front it and beard it, but whatsoever is not. Chapter 3.5.4 Carmagnole Complete Simultaneously with this Tophet black aspect, there unfolds itself another aspect, which one may call a Tophet red aspect, the destruction of the Catholic religion, and indeed, for the time being of religion itself. We saw Ram's new calendar establish its tenth day of rest, and asked, what would become of the Christian Sabbath? The calendar is hardly a month old, till all this is set at rest. Very singular, as Mercier observes, last Corpus Christi Day 1792, the whole world, and sovereign authority itself, walked in religious gala, with a quite devout air. Butcher Legendre, supposed to be irreverent, was like to be massacred in his gig, as the thing went by. A Gallican hierarchy, and church, and church formulas seemed to flourish, a little brown-leaved or so, but not browner than of late years or decades, to flourish, far and wide, in the sympathies of an unsophisticated people. Defying philosophism, legislature, and the encyclopedia. Far and wide, alas, like a brown-leaved Vallombrosa, which waits but one whirlblast of the November wind, and in an hour stands bare. Since that Corpus Christi day, Brunswick has come, and the emigrants, and Lavade, and eighteen months of time, to all flourishing, especially to brown-leaved flourishing, there comes, were it never so slowly, an end. On the 7th of November, a certain Cidoyen Perens, curate of Boissy's Le Bertrand, writes to the convention that he has all his life been preaching a lie, and is grown weary of doing it. Wherefore he will now lay down his curacy and stipend, and begs that an august convention would give him something else to live upon. Mention honorable, shall we give him? Or, reference to committee of finances. Hardly is this got decided, when Goose Gobel, constitutional bishop of Paris, with his chapter, with municipal and departmental escort in red nightcaps, makes his appearance, to do as Perens has done. Goose Gobel will now acknowledge, no religion but liberty, therefore he doffs his priest gear, and receives the fraternal embrace. To the joy of departmental Mamoro, of municipal Chaumets and Heberts, of Vincent and the Revolutionary Army. Chaumet asks, ought there not, in these circumstances, to be among our intercalary days sans breeches, a feast of reason? Proper surely. Let atheist Marichal, Lalandi, and little atheist Najin rejoice. Let Klutz, speaker of mankind, present to the convention his evidences of the Mahometan religion, a work evincing the nullity of all religions, with thanks. There shall be universal republic now, thinks Klutz, and, one God only, Le Puppel. 
The French nation is of gregarious imitative nature, it needed but a fugal motion in this matter, and Goose Gobel, driven by municipality in force of circumstances, has given one. What cure will be behind him of Boissy's? What bishop behind him of Paris? Bishop Grégoire, indeed, courageously declines, to the sound of, we force no one, let Grégoire consult his conscience, but Protestant and Romish by the hundred volunteer and assent. From far and near, all through November into December, till the work is accomplished, come letters of renegation, come curates who are learning to be carpenters, curates with their new wedded nuns, has not the day of reason dawned, very swiftly. And become noon. From sequestered townships comes addresses, stating plainly, though in Patois dialect, that, they will have no more to do with the black animal called Kurai, animal noir, appel Kurai. Above all things there come patriotic gifts, of church furniture. The remnant of bells, except for toxin, descend from their belfries, into the national melting pot, to make cannon. Censers and all sacred vessels are beaten broad. Of silver, they are fit for the poverty-stricken mint, of pewter, let them become bullets to shoot the enemies of du genre Hamain. Dalmatics of plush make breeches for him who has none. Linen stoles will clip into shirts for the defenders of the country, old clothesmen, Jew or heathen, drive the briskest trade. Chalier's ass procession, at Lyons, was but a type of what went on, in those same days, in all towns. In all towns and townships as quick as the guillotine may go, so quick goes the axe and the wrench, sacristies, lutrins, altar rails are pulled down, the mass books torn into cartridge papers, men dance the carmagnole all night about the bonfire. All highways jingle with metallic priest tackle, beaten broad, sent to the convention, to the poverty-stricken mint. Good St. Genevieve's chasse is let down, alas, to be burst open, this time, and burnt on the place to grieve. St. Louis's shirt is burnt, might not a defender of the country have had it? At St. Denis town, no longer St. Denis but Franciade, patriotism has been down among the tombs, rummaging, the revolutionary army has taken spoil. This, accordingly, is what the streets of Paris saw. Most of these persons were still drunk, with the brandy they had swallowed out of chalices, eating mackerel on the patinas. Mounted on asses, which were housed with priests' cloaks, they reined them with priests' stoles, they held clutched with the same hand communion cup and sacred wafer. They stopped at the doors of dram shops. Held out ciboriums, and the landlord, stoop in hand, had to fill them thrice. Next came mules high-laden with crosses, chandeliers, censers, holy water vessels, hyssops. Recalling to mind the priests of Sibylle, whose panniers, filled with the instruments of their worship, served at once as storehouse, sacristy and temple. In such equipage did these profaners advance towards the convention. They enter there, in an immense train, ranged in two rows, all masked like mummers in fantastic sacerdotal vestments, bearing on hand barrows their heaped plunder, ciboriums, suns, candelabras, plates of gold and silver. The address we do not give. For indeed it was in strophes, sung viva voce, with all the parts, Danton glooming considerably, in his place, and demanding that there be prose and decency in future. Nevertheless the captors of such spolia opima crave, not untouched with liquor, permission to dance the carmagnole also on the spot, where to an exhilarated convention cannot but exceed. Nay, several members, continues the exaggerative Mercier, who was not there to witness, being in limbo now, as one of Duperet's seventy-three, several members, quitting their curule chairs, took the hand of girls flaunting in priests' vestures, and danced the carmagnole along with them. Such old hallowtide have they, in this year, once named of grace, 1793 out of which strange fall of formulas, tumbling there in confused welter, betrampled by the patriotic dance, is it not passing strange to see a new formula arise? For the human tongue is not adequate to speak what triviality run distracted there is in human nature. Black mumbo-jumbo of the woods, and most Indian wow-wows, one can understand, but this of procure an exagoras whilom John Peter Chaumet? We will say only, Man is a born idol-worshipper, sight-worshipper, 
so sensuous imaginative is he, and also partakes much of the nature of the ape. For the same day, while this brave Carmagnol dance has hardly jigged itself out, there arrive procure chamet and municipals and departmentals, and with them the strangest freightage, a new religion. Demoiselle Candle, of the Opera A woman fair to look upon, when well rouge, she, born on palanquin shoulder high, with red woolen nightcap, in azure mantle, garlanded with oak, holding in her hand the pike of the Jupiter Pupple, sails in. Heralded by white young women girt in tricolor. Let the world consider it. This, O oh National Convention Wonder of the Universe, is our new divinity, goddess of reason, worthy, and alone worthy of revering. Nay, were it too much to ask of an august national representation that it also went with us to the C.I. Devant Cathedral called of Notre Dame, and executed a few strophes in worship of her. President and secretaries give goddess candle, born at due height round their platform, successively the fraternal kiss, whereupon she, by decree, sails to the right hand of the president and their alights. And now, after due pause and flourishes of oratory, the convention, gathering its limbs, does get under way in the required procession towards Notre Dame. Reason, again in her litter, sitting in the van of them, borne, as one judges, by men in the Roman costume, escorted by wind music, red nightcaps, and the madness of the world. And so straightway, reason taking seat on the high altar of Notre Dame, the requisite worship or quasi-worship is, say the newspapers, executed, national convention chanting, the hymn to liberty, words by Chenier, music by Gossack. It is the first of the feasts of reason, first communion service of the new religion of Chaumet. The corresponding festival in the church of St. Eustache, says Mercier, offered the spectacle of a great tavern. The interior of the choir represented a landscape decorated with cottages and baskets of trees. Round the choir stood tables overloaded with bottles, with sausages, pork puddings, pastries and other meats. The guests flowed in and out through all doors, whosoever presented himself took part of the good things, children of eight, girls as well as boys, put hand to plate, in sign of liberty. They drank also of the bottles, and their prompt intoxication created laughter. Reason sat in azure mantle aloft, in a serene manner, cannoneers, pipe in mouth, serving her as acolytes. And out of doors, continues the exaggerative man, were mad multitudes dancing round the bonfire of chapel balustrades, of priests and cannon stalls. And the dancers, I exaggerate nothing, the dancers nigh bare of breeches, neck and breast naked, stockings down, went whirling and spinning, like those dust vortexes, forerunners of tempest and destruction. At St. Gervais Church again there was a terrible, smell of herrings, section or municipality having provided no food, no condiment, but left it to chance. Other mysteries, seemingly of a Kabyric or even Paphian character, we heave under the veil, which appropriately stretches itself, along the pillars of the aisles, not to be lifted aside by the hand of history. But there is one thing we should like almost better to understand than any other, what reason herself thought of it, all the while. What articulate words poor Mrs. Mamoro, for example, uttered. When she had become ungoddess again, and the bibliopolist and she sat quiet at home, at supper. For he was an earnest man, bookseller Mamoro, and had notions of agrarian law. Mrs. Mamoro, it is admitted, made one of the best goddesses of reason though her teeth were a little defective. And now if the reader will represent to himself that such visible adoration of reason went on, all over the Republic, through these November and December weeks, till the church woodwork was burnt out, and the business otherwise completed. He will feel sufficiently what an adoring Republic it was, and without reluctance quit this part of the subject. Such gifts of church spoil are chiefly the work of the army revolutionnaire, raised, as we said, some time ago. It is an army with portable guillotine, commanded by playwright Ron Sin in terrible mustachios. And even by some uncertain shadow of Usher Maillard, the old Bastille hero, leader of the Menads, September Man in Grey. Clerk Vincent of the War Office, one of Patch's old clerks, with a head heated by the ancient orators, had a main hand in the appointments, at least in the staff appointments. But of the marchings and retreatings of these six thousand no Xenophon exists. Nothing, 
but an inarticulate hum, of cursing and sooty frenzy, surviving dubious in the memory of ages. They scour the country round Paris, seeking prisoners. Raising requisitions, seeing that edicts are executed, that the farmers have thrashed sufficiently, lowering church bells or metallic virgins. Detachments shoot forth dim, towards remote parts of France. Nay new provincial revolutionary armies rise dim, here and there, as carriers company of Marat, as Italians Bordeaux troop, like sympathetic clouds in an atmosphere all electric. Ronsin, they say, admitted, in candid moments, that his troops were the elixir of the rascality of the earth. One sees them drawn up in marketplaces. Travel plashed, rough bearded, in Carmagnole complete, the first exploit is to prostrate what royal or ecclesiastical monument, crucifix or the like, there may be. To plant a cannon at the steeple, fetch down the bell without climbing for it, bell and belfry together. This, however, it is said, depends somewhat on the size of the town, if the town contains much population, and these perhaps of a dubious choleric aspect, the revolutionary army will do its work gently, by ladder and wrench. Nay perhaps will take its billet without work at all, and, refreshing itself with a little liquor and sleep, pass on to the next stage. Pipe in cheek, saber on thigh, in Carmagnole complete. Such things have been, and may again be. Charles II sent out his highland host over the western Scotch Whigs. Jamaica planters got dogs from the Spanish main to hunt their maroons with, France too is bescoured with a devil's pack, the baying of which, at this distance of half a century, still sounds in the mind's ear. Chapter 3.5.V Like a thunder cloud. But the grand, and indeed substantially primary and generic aspect of the consummation of terror remains still to be looked at. Nay blinkered history has for most part all but overlooked this aspect, the soul of the whole, that which makes it terrible to the enemies of France. Let despotism and Sumerian coalitions consider. All French men and French things are in a state of requisition, fourteen armies are got on foot, patriotism, with all that it has a faculty in heart or in head, in soul or body or breeches pocket, is rushing to the frontiers, to prevail or die. Busy sits Carnot, in salad public, busy for his share, in organizing victory. Not swifter pulses that guillotine, in dread systole diastole in the place de la revolution, then smites the sword of patriotism, smiting Samaria back to its own borders, from the sacred soil. In fact the government is what we can call revolutionary, and some men are à la hauteur, on a level with the circumstances, and others are not à la hauteur, so much the worse for them. But the anarchy, we may say, has organized itself, society is literally overset, its old forces working with mad activity, but in the inverse order, destructive and self-destructive. Curious to see how all still refers itself to some head and fountain, not even an anarchy but must have a center to revolve round. It is now some six months since the Committee of Salat Public came into existence, some three months since Danton proposed that all power should be given it and a sum of fifty millions, and that government be declared revolutionary. He himself, since that day, would take no hand in it, though again and again solicited, but sits private in his place on the mountain. Since that day, the nine, or if they should even rise to twelve have become permanent, always re-elected when their term runs out, Salat Public, Sharit General have assumed their ulterior form and mode of operating. Committee of Public Salvation, as Supreme, of General Shurdi, as Subaltern, these like a lesser and greater council, most harmonious hitherto, have become the center of all things. They ride this whirlwind. They, raised by force of circumstances, insensibly, very strangely, thither to that dread height, and guide it, and seem to guide it. Stranger set of cloud compellers the earth never saw. A Robespierre, a Bill Laud, a Collot, Cuthin, Saint Just. Not to mention still meaner Amars, Vadiers, in Charit General, these are your cloud compellers. Small intellectual talent is necessary, indeed where among them, except in the head of Carnot, busied organizing victory, would you find any? The talent is one of instinct rather. It is that of divining aright what this great dumb whirlwind wishes and wills, that of willing, 
with more frenzy than any one, what all the world wills. To stand at no obstacles. To heed no considerations human or divine, to know well that, of divine or human, there is one thing needful, triumph of the Republic, destruction of the enemies of the Republic. With this one spiritual endowment, and so few others, it is strange to see how a dumb inarticulately storming whirlwind of things puts, as it were, its reins into your hand, and invites and compels you to be leader of it. Hard by, sits a municipality of Paris, all in red nightcaps since the 4th of November last, a set of men fully on a level with circumstances, or even beyond it. Sleek Mayor Patch, studious to be safe in the middle. Chaumettes, Heberts, Varlets, and Henriot their great commandant. Not to speak of Vincent the war clerk, of Mamoros, Dobsons, and such like, all intent to have churches plundered, to have reason adored, suspects cut down, and the revolution triumph. Perhaps carrying the matter too far. Danton was heard to grumble at the civic strophes, and to recommend prose and decency. Robespierre also grumbles that in overturning superstition we did not mean to make a religion of atheism. In fact, your Chaumet and company constitute a kind of hyperjacobinism, or rabid, faction de enrages, which has given orthodox patriotism some umbrage, of late months. To know a suspect on the streets what is this but bringing the law of the suspect itself into ill odor? Men half frantic, men zealous over much, they toil there, in their red nightcaps, restlessly, rapidly, accomplishing what of life is allotted them. And the forty-four thousand other townships, each with revolutionary committee, based on Jacobin daughter society, enlightened by the spirit of Jacobinism, quickened by the forty sous a day. The French constitution spurned always at anything like two chambers, and yet behold, has it not verily got two chambers? National convention, elected for one, mother of patriotism, self-elected, for another. Mother of Patriotism has her debates reported in the Moniteur, as important state procedures, which indisputably they are. A second chamber of legislature we call this Mother Society. If perhaps it were not rather comparable to that old Scotch body named Lords of the Articles, without whose origination, and signal given, the so-called Parliament could introduce no bill, could do no work. Robespierre himself, whose words are a law, opens his incorruptible lips copiously in the Jacobins' hall. Smaller Council of Salat Public, Greater Council of Charit General, all active parties, come here to plead. To shape beforehand what decision they must arrive at, what destiny they have to expect. Now if a question arose, which of those two chambers, convention, or lords of the articles, was the stronger? Happily they as yet go hand in hand. As for the National Convention, truly it has become a most composed body. Quenched now the old effervescence, the seventy-three locked in ward. Once noisy friends of the Girondins sunk all into silent men of the plain, called even, frogs of the marsh, crapos du marais. Addresses come, revolutionary church plunder comes, deputations, with prose, or strophes, these the Convention receives. But beyond this, the convention has one thing mainly to do, to listen what Salat Public proposes, and say, yeah. Bazir followed by Chabot, with some impetuosity, declared, one morning, that this was not the way of a free assembly. There ought to be an opposition side, a coty droit, cried Chabot, if none else will form it, I will, people say to me, you will all get guillotined in your turn, first you and Bazir, then Danton, then Robespierre himself. So spake the disfrocked, with a loud voice, next week, Bazir, and he lie in the abbey, wending, one may fear, towards Tinville and the axe, and, people say to me, what seems to be proving true. Bazir's blood was all inflamed with revolution fever. With coffee and spasmodic dreams. Chabot, again, how happy with his rich Jew-Austrian wife, late Fräulein Fry. But he lies in prison, and his two Jew Austrian brothers in law, the bankers Fry, lie with him, waiting the urn of doom. Let a national convention, therefore, take warning, and know its function. Let the convention, all as one man, set its shoulder to the work, not with bursts of parliamentary eloquence, but in quite other and serviceable ways. 
Convention commissioners, what we ought to call representatives, representants on mission, fly, like the Herald Mercury, to all points of the territory, carrying your behests far and wide. In their round hat plumed with tricolor feathers, girt with flowing tricolor taffeta, in close frock, tricolor sash, sword and jack boots, these men are powerfuler than king or kaiser. They say to whomso they meet, do. And he must do it, all men's goods are at their disposal, for France is as one huge city in siege. They smite with requisitions, and forced loan, they have the power of life and death. St. Just and Libas order the rich classes of Strasbourg to strip off their shoes, and send them to the armies where as many as, ten thousand pairs, are needed. Also, that within four and twenty hours, a thousand beds, are to be got ready. Wrapped in matting, and sent under way. For the time presses, like swift bolts, issuing from the fuliginous Olympus of Salat public rush these men, oftenest in pairs, scatter your thunder orders over France. Make France one enormous revolutionary thundercloud. Chapter 3.5.VI Do thy duty. Accordingly alongside of these bonfires of church balustrades, and sounds of fusillading and moyotting, there rise quite another sort of fires and sounds, smithy fires and proof follies for the manufacture of arms. Cut off from Sweden and the world, the Republic must learn to make steel for itself, and, by aid of chemists, she has learnt it. Towns that knew only iron, now know steel, from their new dungeons at Chantilly, aristocrats may hear the rustle of our new steel furnace there. Do not bells transmute themselves into cannon. Iron stanchions into the white weapon, arm blanche, by sword cutlery. The wheels of Langres scream, amid their sputtering fire halo, grinding mere swords. The stithies of Charleville ring with gunmaking. What say we, Charleville? 258 forges stand in the open spaces of Paris itself, 140 of them in the esplanade of the Invalids, 54 in the Luxembourg Garden, so many forges stand. Grim smiths beating and forging at lock and barrel there. The clockmakers have come, requisitioned, to do the touch holes, the hard solda and file work. Five great barges swing at anchor on the Seine stream, loud with boring. The great press drills grating harsh thunder to the general ear and heart. And deft stockmakers do gouge and rasp. And all men bestir themselves, according to their cunning, in the language of hope, it is reckoned that a thousand finished muskets can be delivered daily. Chemists of the Republic have taught us miracles of swift tanning. The cordwainer bores and stitches, not of wood and pasteboard, or he shall answer it to Tinville. The women sew tents and coats, the children scrape surgeons' lint, the old men sit in the marketplaces, able men are on march. All men in requisition, from town to town flutters, on the heavens winds, this banner, the French people risen against tyrants. All which is well. But now arises the question, what is to be done for Saltpetri? Interrupted commerce and the English navy shut us out from Saltpetri and without saltpetry there is no gunpowder. Republican science again sits meditative. Discovers that saltpetry exists here and there, though in attenuated quantity, that old plaster of walls holds a sprinkling of it, that the earth of the Paris cellars holds a sprinkling of it, diffused through the common rubbish. That with these dug up and washed, saltpetry might be had. Whereupon swiftly, see, the Citoyens, with upshoved bonnet rouge, or with doffed bonnet, and hair toil wetted, digging fiercely, each in his own cellar, for saltpetri. The earth heap rises at every door, the Citoyens with hod and bucket carrying it up, the Citoyens, pith in every muscle, shoveling and digging, for life and saltpetri. Dig my braves, and write well speed ye. What of saltpetri is essential the Republic shall not want. Consummation of sansculottism has many aspects and tints, but the brightest tint, really of a solar or stellar brightness, is this which the armies give it. That same fervor of Jacobinism which internally fills France with hatred, suspicions, scaffolds and reason worship, does, on the frontiers, shew itself as a glorious pro patria mori. Ever since de Maurier's defection, three convention representatives attend every general. Committee of Salat has sent them, 
often with this laconic order only, do thy duty, face ton de voir. It is strange, under what impediments the fire of Jacobinism, like other such fires, will burn. These soldiers have shoes of wood and pasteboard, or go booted in hay ropes, in dead of winter. They skewer a base mat round their shoulders, and are destitute of most things. What then? It is for rights of Frenchhood, of manhood, that they fight, the unquenchable spirit, here as elsewhere, works miracles. With steel and bread, says the convention representative, one may get to China. The generals go fast to the guillotine, justly and unjustly. From which what inference? This among others, that ill success is death, that in victory alone is life. To conquer or die is no theatrical palabra, in these circumstances, but a practical truth and necessity. All Girondism, halfness, compromise is swept away. Forward, ye soldiers of the Republic, captain and man. Dash with your Gaelic impetuosity, on Austria, England, Prussia, Spain, Sardinia, Pitt, Coburg, York, and the devil and the world. Behind us is but the guillotine, before us is victory, apotheosis and millennium without end. See accordingly, on all frontiers, how the sons of night, astonished after short triumph, do recoil, the sons of the Republic flying at them, with wild C.A.R.A. or Marseillaise A.U.X. arms, with the temper of Cato Mountain, or demon incarnate. Which no son of night can stand. Spain, which came bursting through the Pyrenees, rustling with Bourbon banners, and went conquering here and there for a season, falters at such Cato Mountain welcome, draws itself in again. Too happy now were the Pyrenees impassable. Not only does de Gamier, conqueror of Toulon, drive Spain back, he invades Spain. General de Gamier invades it by the eastern Pyrenees, General Muller shall invade it by the western. Shall, that is the word, Committee of Salat Public has said it, Representative Kavaniak, on mission there, must see it done. Impossible. Cries Muller, infallible. Answers Kavaniak. Difficulty, impossibility, is to no purpose. The committee is deaf on that side of its head, answers Kavaniak, and intend pas de set royal law. How many wantest thou, of men, of horses, cannons? Thou shalt have them. Conquerors, conquered or hanged, forward we must. Which things also, even as the representative spake them, were done. The spring of the new year sees Spain invaded, and redoubts are carried, and passes and heights of the most scarp description. Spanish field officerism struck mute at such Cato Mountain spirit, the cannon forgetting to fire. Swept are the Pyrenees, town after town flies up, burst by terror or the petard. In the course of another year, Spain will crave peace. Acknowledge its sins and the Republic, nay, in Madrid, there will be joy as for a victory, that even peace is got. Few things, we repeat, can be notabler than these convention representatives, with their power more than kingly. Nay at bottom are they not kings, able men, of a sort, chosen from the 749 French kings, with this order, do thy duty? Representative Levasseur, of small stature, by trade a mere Pacific surgeon of couture, has mutinies to quell, mad hosts, mad at the doom of Custine, bellowing far and wide. He alone amid them, the one small representative, small, but as hard as flint, which also carries fire in it. So too, at Hanshutten, far in the afternoon, he declares that the battle is not lost, that it must be gained. And fights, himself, with his own obstetric hand, horse shot under him, or say on foot, up to the haunches in tide water. Cutting staccato and passato there, in defiance of water, earth, air, and fire, the choleric little representative that he was. Whereby, as natural, Royal Highness of York had to withdraw, occasionally at full gallop. Like to be swallowed by the tide, and his siege of Dunkirk became a dream, realizing only much loss of beautiful siege artillery and of brave lives. General Houchard, it would appear, stood behind the hedge, on this Hanshutten occasion. Wherefore they have since guillotined him. A new General Jordan, late Sergeant Jordan, commands in his stead, 
he, in long-winded battles of Wadigny, murderous artillery fire mingling itself with sound of revolutionary battle hymns, forces Austria behind the Sambra again. Has hopes of purging the soil of liberty. With hard wrestling, with artillerying and CAIRNG, it shall be done. In the course of a new summer, Valenciennes will see itself beleaguered, Conde beleaguered. Whatsoever is yet in the hands of Austria beleaguered and bombarded, nay, by convention decree, we even summon them all either to surrender in twenty-four hours, or else be put to the sword. A high saying, which, though it remains unfulfilled, may shew what spirit one is of. Representative Druet, as an old dragoon, could fight by a kind of second nature, but he was unlucky. Him, in a night foray at Maubeuge, the Austrians took alive, in October last. They stripped him almost naked, he says, making a shoe of him, as king-taker of Varennes. They flung him into carts. Sent him far into the interior of Samaria, to a fortress called Spitzberg, on the Danube River, and left him there, at an elevation of perhaps a hundred and fifty feet, to his own bitter reflections. Reflections, and also devices. For the indomitable old dragoon constructs wing machinery, of paper kite, saws window bars, determines to fly down. He will seize a boat, will follow the river's course, land somewhere in Crim Tartary, in the Black Sea or Constantinople region, a la Sinbad. Authentic history, accordingly, looking far into Samaria, discerns dimly a phenomenon. In the dead night watches, the Spitzberg sentry is near fainting with terror, is it a huge vague portent descending through the night air? It is a huge national representative old dragoon, descending by paper kite. Too rapidly, alas. For Druet had taken with him, a small provision store, twenty pounds weight or thereby, which proved accelerative, so he fell, fracturing his leg. And lay there, moaning, till day dawned, till you could discern clearly that he was not a portent but a representative. Or see St. Just, in the lines of Weissenburg, though physically of a timid apprehensive nature, how he charges with his Alsatian peasants armed hastily, for the nonce, the solemn face of him blazing into flame. His black hair and tricolor hat taffeta flowing in the breeze, these are lines of Weissenburg were indeed forced, and Prussia and the emigrants rolled through, but we reforced the lines of Weissenburg. And Prussia and the emigrants rolled back again still faster, hurled with bayonet charges and fiery CRNG. C.I. Devant Sergeant Pichigrew, C.I. Devant Sergeant Hoche, risen now to be generals, have done wonders here. Tall Pichigrew was meant for the church, was teacher of mathematics once, in Brienne School, his remarkablest pupil there was the boy Napoleon Bonaparte. He then, not in the sweetest humor, enlisted exchanging Farola for musket. And had got the length of the halberd, beyond which nothing could be hoped, when the Bastille barriers falling made passage for him, and he is here. Hoche bore a hand at the literal overturn of the Bastille. He was, as we saw, a sergeant of the Guards Francaises, spending his pay in rushlights and cheap editions of books. How the mountains are burst, and many an Enceladus is disimprisoned, and captains founding on four parchments of nobility, are blown with their parchments across the Rhine, into lunar limbo. What high feats of arms, therefore, were done in these fourteen armies, and how, for love of liberty and hope of promotion, low-born valor cut its desperate way to generalship. And, from the central Carnot in Salat public to the outmost drummer on the frontiers, men strove for their republic, let readers fancy. The snows of winter, the flowers of summer continue to be stained with warlike blood. Gaelic impetuosity mounts ever higher with victory, spirit of Jacobinism weds itself to national vanity, the soldiers of the Republic are becoming, as we prophesied, very sons of fire. Barefooted, barebacked, but with bread and iron you can get to China. It is one nation against the whole world, but the nation has that within her which the whole world will not conquer. Samaria, astonished, recoils faster or slower. All round the Republic there rises fiery, as it were, a magic ring of musket volleying in CAIRNG. Majesty of Prussia, as Majesty of Spain, will by and by acknowledge his sins and the Republic, and make a piece of bail. Foreign commerce, colonies, factories in the East and in the West, 
are fallen or falling into the hands of sea ruling pit, enemy of human nature. Nevertheless what sound is this that we hear, on the 1st of June, 1794. Sound of as war thunder born from the ocean too, of tone most piercing. War thunder from off the breast waters, Villaret Joyous and English how, after long maneuvering have ranked themselves there, and are belching fire. The enemies of human nature are on their own element, cannot be conquered, cannot be kept from conquering. Twelve hours of raging cannonade, sun now sinking westward through the battle smoke, six French ships taken, the battle lost. What ships whoever can still sail, making off. But how is it, then, with that Venger ship, she neither strikes nor makes off? She is lamed, she cannot make off, strike she will not. Fire rakes her fore and aft, from victorious enemies. The Venger is sinking. Strong are ye, tyrants of the sea, yet we also, are we weak. Lo! All flags, streamers, jacks, every rag of tricolor that will yet run on rope, fly rustling aloft, the whole crew crowds to the upper deck. And, with universal soul-maddening yell, shouts vive la republic, sinking, sinking. She staggers, she lurches, her last drunk whirl. Ocean yawns abysmal, down rushes the vengeur, carrying vive la republic along with her, unconquerable, into eternity. Let foreign despots think of that. There is an unconquerable in man, when he stands on his rights of man, let despots and slaves and all people know this, and only them that stand on the wrongs of man tremble to know it that, so has history written, nothing doubting, of the sunk venture. Reader. Mendez Pinto, Munchausen, Cagliostro, Salmanazar have been great, but they are not the greatest. O Berreir, Berreir, Anacreon of the Guillotine. Must inquisitive pictorial history, in a new edition, ask again, how is it with the Venger, in this its glorious suicidal sinking, and, with resentful brush, dash a bend sinister of contumelious lamp black through thee and it. Alas, alas! The Venger, after fighting bravely, did sink altogether as other ships do, her captain and above two hundred of her crew escaping gladly in British boats. And this same enormous inspiring feat, and rumor, of sound most piercing, turns out to be an enormous inspiring non-entity, extant nowhere save, as falsehood, in the brain of Berreir. Actually so. Founded, like the world itself, on nothing. Proved by convention report, by solemn convention decree in decrees, and wooden, model of the Venger, believed, bewept, besung by the whole French people to this hour, it may be regarded as Berreir's masterpiece. The largest, most inspiring piece of blog manufactured, for some centuries, by any man or nation. As such, and not otherwise, be it henceforth memorable. Chapter 3.5.7 Flame Picture In this manner, mad blazing with flame of all imaginable tints, from the red of Tophet to the stellar bright, blazes off this consummation of Sansculottism. But the hundredth part of the things that were done, and the thousandth part of the things that were projected and decreed to be done, would tire the tongue of history. Statue of the Puppel Souverain, high as Strasbourg steeple. Which shall fling its shadow from the Pont Neuf over Jardin National and Convention Hall, enormous, in painter David's head. With other the like enormous statues not a few, realized in paper decree. For, indeed, the Statue of Liberty herself is still but plaster in the place de la Revolution. Then equalization of weights and measures, with decimal division, institutions, of music and of much else, institute in general. School of Arts, School of Mars, Elives de la Patterie, normal schools, amid such gun boring, altar burning, salt petri digging, and miraculous improvements in tannery. What, for example, is this that engineer chap is doing, in the park of Vincennes? In the park of Vincennes, and onwards, they say, in the park of Le Pelletier Saint Fargeau, the assassinated deputy, and still onwards to the heights of Echouen and further, he has scaffolding set up, has posts driven in. Wooden arms with elbow joints are jerking and fugling in the air, in the most rapid mysterious manner. Citoyens ran up suspicious. Yes, O oh Citoyens, we are signaling, it is a device this, worthy of the Republic. 
a thing for what we will call far writing without the aid of postbags, in Greek, it shall be named telegraph. Telegraph Saker. Answer Satoyanism, for writing to traitors, to Austria, and tears it down. Chap had to escape, and get a new legislative decree. Nevertheless, he has accomplished it, the indefatigable chap, this is far writer, with its wooden arms and elbow joints, can intelligibly signal. And lines of them are set up, to the north frontiers and elsewhere. On an autumn evening of the year two, Far Rider having just written that Condé Town has surrendered to us, we send from Tillery's Convention Hall this response in the shape of decree, the name of Condé is changed to Nord Libre, North Free. The army of the North ceases not to merit well of the country. To the admiration of men. For lo, in some half hour, while the convention yet debates, there arrives this new answer, I inform thee, J. E. T. Anantz, citizen president, that the decree of convention, ordering change of the name Condé into North Free. And the other declaring that the army of the North ceases not to merit well of the country, are transmitted and acknowledged by telegraph. I have instructed my officer at Lille to forward them to North Free by express signed, chap. Or C, over Fleurus in the Netherlands, where General Jordan, having now swept the soil of liberty, and advanced thus far, is just about to fight, and sweep or be swept, things there not in the heaven's vault, some prodigy. Seen by Austrian eyes and spyglasses, in the similitude of an enormous windbag, with netting and enormous saucer depending from it. A Jove's balance, O oh ye Austrian spyglasses! One saucer hole of a Jove's balance, your poor Austrian scale having kicked itself quite aloft, out of sight. By heaven, answer the spyglasses, it is a Montgolfier, a balloon, and they are making signals. Austrian cannon battery barks at this Montgolfier, harmless as dog at the moon, the Montgolfier makes its signals, detects what Austrian ambuscade there may be, and descends at its ease. What will not these devils incarnate contrive? On the whole, is it not, O oh reader, one of the strangest flame pictures that ever painted itself, flaming off there, on its ground of guillotine black? And the nightly theatres are twenty-three. And the salons de danse are sixty, full of mere égalité, fraternité and carmignol. And section committee rooms are forty-eight, redolent of tobacco and brandy, vigorous with twenty pence a day, coercing the suspect. And the houses of arrest are twelve for Paris alone, crowded and even crammed. And at all turns, you need your certificate of civism, be it for going out, or for coming in, nay without it you cannot, for money, get your daily ounces of bread. Dusky red-capped bakers' queues, wagging themselves, not in silence. For we still live by maximum, in all things, waited on by these two, scarcity and confusion. The faces of men are darkened with suspicion, with suspecting, or being suspect. The streets lie unswept, the ways unmended. Law has shut her books, speaks little, save impromptu, through the throat of Tinville. Crimes go unpunished, not crimes against the revolution. The number of foundling children, as some compute, is doubled. How silent now sits royalism, sits all aristocratism, respectability that kept its gig. The honor now, and the safety, is to poverty, not to wealth. Your citizen, who would be fashionable, walks abroad, with his wife on his arm, in red wool nightcap, black shag spencer, and carmignol complete. Aristocratism crouches low, in what shelter is still left, submitting to all requisitions, vexations. Too happy to escape with life. Ghastly chateaus stare on you by the wayside, disroofed, diswindowed, which the national housebroker is peeling for the lead in Ashler. The old tenants hover disconsolate, over the Rhine with Condé. A spectacle to men. C.I. Devant Seigneur, exquisite in palate, will become an exquisite restaurateur cook in Hamburg, C.I. Devant Madame, exquisite in dress, a successful march in de modes in London. In Newgate Street, you meet M. Le Marquis, with a rough deal on his shoulder, adds, and Jack Plain under arm, he has taken to the joiner trade, it being necessary to live, full vivre, dot, higher than all Frenchmen the domestic stock jobber flourishes, in a day of paper money. The farmer also flourishes, farmer's houses, says Mercier, 
have become like pawnbrokers' shops, all manner of furniture, apparel, vessels of gold and silver accumulate themselves there, bread is precious. The farmer's rent is paper money, and he alone of men has bread, farmer is better than landlord, and will himself become landlord. And daily, we say, like a black spectre, silently through that life tumult, passes the revolution cart. Writing on the walls its mean, mean, thou art weighed, and found wanting. A specter with which one has grown familiar. Men have adjusted themselves, complaint issues not from that death tumbrel. Weak women and siaidavans, their plumage and finery all tarnished, sit there, with a silent gaze, as if looking into the infinite black. The once light lip wears a curl of irony, uttering no word, and the tumbrel fares along. They may be guilty before heaven, or not, they are guilty, we suppose, before the revolution. Then, does not the republic, coin money, of them, with its great axe? Red nightcaps howl dire approval, the rest of Paris looks on. If with a sigh, that is much, fellow creatures whom sighing cannot help, whom black necessity and tinville have clutched. One other thing, or rather two other things, we will still mention, and no more, the blonde perukes, the tannery at Mutin. Great talk is of these perukes blondes, O oh reader, they are made from the heads of guillotined women. The locks of a duchess, in this way, may come to cover the scalp of a cordwainer, her blonde German francism his black Gaelic pole, if it be bald. Or they may be worn affectionately, as relics, rendering one suspect. Citizens use them, not without mockery, of a rather cannibal sort. Still deeper into one's heart goes that tannery at Mutin, not mentioned among the other miracles of tanning. At Mutin, says Montgaillard with considerable calmness, there was a tannery of human skins, such of the guillotined as seemed worth flaying, of which perfectly good wash leather was made for breeches and other uses. The skin of the men, he remarks, was superior in toughness, consistence, and quality to chamois, that of women was good for almost nothing, being so soft in texture. History looking back over cannibalism, through purchases pilgrims and all early and late records, will perhaps find no terrestrial cannibalism of a sort on the whole so detestable. It is a manufactured, soft-feeling, quietly elegant sort. A sort perfide. Alas then, is man's civilization only a rapage, through which the savage nature of him can still burst, infernal as ever? Nature still makes him, and has an infernal in her as well as a celestial. Book 3.VI Thermidor Chapter 3.6.I The gods are athirst. What then is this thing, called La Revolution, which, like an angel of death, hangs over France, moyotting, fusillading, fighting, gun-boring, tanning human skins. La Revolution is but so many alphabetic letters, a thing nowhere to be laid hands on, to be clapped under lock and key, where is it? What is it? It is the madness that dwells in the hearts of men. In this man it is, and in that man. As a rage or as a terror, it is in all men. Invisible, impalpable, and yet no black Azrael, with wings spread over half a continent, with swords sweeping from sea to sea, could be a truer reality. To explain, what is called explaining, the march of this revolutionary government, be no task of ours. Men cannot explain it. A paralytic Cuthan, asking in the Jacobins, what hast thou done to be hanged if the counter-revolution should arrive? A somber Saint Just, not yet six and twenty, declaring that, for revolutionists there is no rest but in the tomb, a sea-green Robespierre converted into vinegar and gall. Much more an Amar and Vadir, a Collot and Billaud, to inquire what thoughts, predetermination or provision, might be in the head of these men. Record of their thought remains not, death and darkness have swept it out utterly. Nay if we even had their thought, all they could have articulately spoken to us, how insignificant a fraction were that of the thing which realized itself, which decreed itself, on signal given by them. As has been said more than once, this revolutionary government is not a self-conscious but a blind fatal one. Each man, enveloped in his ambient atmosphere of revolutionary fanatic madness, rushes on, impelled and impelling. And has become a blind brute force, 
no rest for him but in the grave. Darkness and the mystery of horrid cruelty cover it for us, in history, as they did in nature. The chaotic thundercloud, with its pitchy black, and its tumult of dazzling jagged fire, in a world all electric, thou wilt not undertake to shew how that comported itself, what the secrets of its dark womb were. From what sources, with what specialties, the lightning it held did, in confused brightness of terror, strike forth, destructive and self-destructive, till it ended. Like a blackness naturally of Erebus, which by will of providence had for once mounted itself into dominion and the azure, is not this properly the nature of Sanskilatism consummating itself? Of which Erebus blackness be it enough to discern that this and the other dazzling firebolt, dazzling fire torrent, does by small volition and great necessity, verily issue, in such and such succession. Destructive so and so, self-destructive so and so, till it end. Royalism is extinct, sunk, as they say, in the mud of the lawyer, republicanism dominates without and within, what, therefore, on the fifteenth day of March, 1794, is this. Arrestment, sudden really as a bolt out of the blue, has hit strange victims, a bear Père Duchesne, bibliopolist Mamoro, clerk Vincent, General Ronsin. High courtelier patriots, red-capped magistrates of Paris, worshippers of reason, commanders of revolutionary army. Eight short days ago, their courtelier club was loud, and louder than ever, with patriot denunciations. Hébert Père Duchesne had held his tongue in his heart these two months, at sight of moderates, crypto-aristocrats, Camilles, Cellarats in the convention itself, but could not do it any longer. Would, if other remedy were not, invoke the sacred right of insurrection. So spake Hébert in courtelier session, with vivats, till the roofs rang again. Eight short days ago, and now already. They rub their eyes, it is no dream. They find themselves in the Luxembourg. Goose Gobel too, and they that burnt churches. Chaumet himself, potent procure, agent national as they now call it, who could recognize the suspect by the very face of them, he lingers but three days. On the third day he too is hurled in. Most chop fallen, blue, enters the national agent this limbo whither he has sent so many. Prisoners crowd round, jibing and jeering, sublime national agent, says one, in virtue of thy immortal proclamation, lo there. I am suspect, thou art suspect, he is suspect, we are suspect, ye are suspect, they are suspect. The meaning of these things. Meaning. It is a plot, plot of the most extensive ramifications, which, however, Berayer holds the threads of. Such church-burning and scandalous masquerades of atheism, fit to make the revolution odious, where indeed could they originate but in the gold of Pitt? Pitt indubitably, as preternatural insight will teach one, did hire this faction of enrages, to play their fantastic tricks, to roar in their courtiliers' club about moderatism, to print their Père Duchesne, worship sky-blue reason in red nightcap. Rob all altars, and bring the spoil to us. Still more indubitable, visible to the mere bodily sight, is this, that the Cordeliers Club sits pale, with anger and terror, and has, veiled the rights of man, without effect. Likewise that the Jacobins are in considerable confusion, busy, purging themselves, as separant, as, in times of plot and public calamity, they have repeatedly had to do. Not even Camille de Moulin but has given offence, nay there have risen murmurs against Danton himself, though he bellowed them down, and Robespierre finished the matter by embracing him in the tribune. Whom shall the Republic and a jealous mother society trust? In these times of temptation, of preternatural insight. For there are factions of the stranger, the L. Etranger, factions of moderates, of enraged. All manner of factions, we walk in a world of plots, strings, universally spread, of deadly gins and fall traps, baited by the gold of pit. Klutz, speaker of mankind so-called, with his evidences of Mahometan religion, and babble of universal republic, him an incorruptible Robespierre has purged away. Baron Klutz, and Payne rebellious needleman lie, these two months, in the Luxembourg, limbs of the faction de Elitranger. Representative Felipos is purged out, he came back from Lavade with an ill report in his mouth against Rogue Rossignol, 
and our method of warfare there. Recant it, O Philippos, we entreat thee. Philippos will not recant. And is purged out. Representative Fabre d'Eglantine, famed nomenclator of Rom's calendar, is purged out, nay, is cast into the Luxembourg, accused of legislative swindling, in regard to monies of the India Company. There with his chabots, bazires, guilty of the like, let Fabre wait his destiny. And Westerman friend of Danton, he who led the Marseillese on the 10th of August, and fought well in Lavade, but spoke not well of Rogue Rossignol, is purged out. Lucky, if he too go not to the Luxembourg. And your prolis, Guzmans, of the faction of the stranger, they have gone, Pereira, though he fled is gone, taken in the disguise of a tavern cook. I am suspect, thou art suspect, he is suspect. The great heart of Danton is weary of it. Danton is gone to native Arsis, for a little breathing time of peace, away, black arachne webs, thou world of fury, terror, and suspicion. Welcome, thou everlasting mother, with thy spring greenness, thy kind household loves and memories, true art thou, were all else untrue. The great titan walks silent, by the banks of the murmuring Ob, in young native haunts that knew him when a boy, wonders what the end of these things may be. But strangest of all, Camille de Moulat is purged out. Cuthin gave as a test in regard to Jacobin purgation the question, what hast thou done to be hanged if counter-revolution should arrive? Yet Camille, who could so well answer this question, is purged out. The truth is, Camille, early in December last, began publishing a new journal, or series of pamphlets, entitled The View Cordelier, Old Cordelier. Camille, not afraid at one time to embrace liberty on a heap of dead bodies, begins to ask now, whether among so many arresting and punishing committees there ought not to be a committee of mercy. St. Just, he observes, is an extremely solemn young Republican, who carries his head as if it were a saint sacrament, adorable host tie, or divine real presence. Sharply enough, this old cordelier, Danton and he were of the earliest primary cordeliers, shoots his glittering war shafts into your new cordeliers, your Heberts, Mamoros, with their brawling brutalities and despicabilities, say. As the sun god, for poor Camille is a poet, shot into that python serpent sprung of mud. Whereat, as was natural, the Hebertist python did hiss and writhe amazingly, and threaten, sacred right of insurrection, and, as we saw, get cast into prison. Nay, with all the old wit, dexterity, and light graceful poignancy, Camille, translating, out of Tacitus, from the reign of Tiberius, pricks into the law of the suspect itself, making it odious. Twice, in the decade, his wild leaves issue. Full of wit, nay of humor, of harmonious ingenuity and insight, one of the strangest phenomenon of that dark time. And smite, in their wild sparkling way, at various monstrosities, saint sacrament heads, and juggernaut idols, in a rather reckless manner. To the great joy of Josephine Beauharnais, and the other five thousand and odd suspect, who fill the twelve houses of arrest, on whom a ray of hope dawns. Robespierre, at first approbatory, knew not at last what to think. Then thought, with his Jacobins, that Camille must be expelled. A man of true revolutionary spirit, this Camille, but with the unwisest sallies, whom aristocrats and moderates have the art to corrupt. Jacobinism is an uttermost crisis and struggle, and meshed wholly in plots, corruptibilities, neck gins and baited fall traps of pit enemy du genre Hamine. Camille's first number begins with O Pit. His last is dated 15 Pluvios Year 2, 3d February 1794, and ends with these words of Montezuma's, Les du ONT Soif, the gods are athirst. Be this as it may, the Hebertists lie in prison only some nine days. On the 24th of March, therefore, the revolution tumbrils carry through that life tumult a new cargo, Hebert, Vincent, Mamoro, Ron Sin, nineteen of them in all, with whom, curious enough, sits Clut speaker of mankind. They have been massed swiftly into a lump, this miscellany of nondescripts, and travel now their last road. No help. They too must, look through the little window, they too, must sneeze into the sack, eternuer dawn le sac. 
As they have done to others so is it done to them. Saint Guillotine, me seems, is worse than the old saints of superstition, a man-devouring saint. Klutz, still with an air of polished sarcasm, endeavors to jest, to offer cheering, arguments of materialism, he requested to be executed last, in order to establish certain principles, which philosophy has not retained. General Ronson too, he still looks forth with some air of defiance, eye of command, the rest are sunk in a stony paleness of despair. Mamoro, poor bibliopolist, no agrarian law yet realized, they might as well have hanged the Edivro, twenty months ago, when Gerond and Buzet hindered them. A bare pair du chêne shall never in this world rise in sacred right of insurrection. He sits there low enough, head sunk on breast, red nightcaps shouting round him, in frightful parody of his newspaper articles, grand collar of the pair du chêne. Thus perish they, the sack receives all their heads. Through some section of history, nineteen spectre chimeras shall flit, speaking and gibbering, till oblivion swallow them. In the course of a week, the revolutionary army itself is disbanded, the general having become spectral. This faction of rabbits, therefore, is also purged from the republican soil, here also the baited fall traps of that pit have been wrenched up harmless, and anew there is joy over a plot discovered. The revolution then is verily devouring its own children. All anarchy, by the nature of it, is not only destructive but self-destructive. Chapter 3.6.2 Danton, no weakness. Danton, meanwhile, has been pressingly sent for from Arsis, he must return instantly, cried Camille, cried Felipos and friends, who scented danger in the wind. Danger enough. A Danton, a Robespierre, chief products of a victorious revolution, are now arrived in immediate front of one another, must ascertain how they will live together, rule together. One conceives easily the deep mutual incompatibility that divided these two, with what terror of feminine hatred the poor sea-green formula looked at the monstrous colossal reality, and grew greener to behold him. The reality, again, struggling to think no ill of a chief product of the revolution, yet feeling at bottom that such chief product was little other than a chief windbag, blown large by popular air. Not a man with the heart of a man, but a poor spasmodic incorruptible pedant, with a logic formula instead of heart, of Jesuit or Methodist parson nature, full of sincere cant, incorruptibility, of virulence, poltroonery, barren as the east wind. Two such chief products are too much for one revolution. Friends, trembling at the results of a quarrel on their part, brought them to meet. It is right, said Danton, swallowing much indignation, to repress the royalists, but we should not strike except where it is useful to the republic, we should not confound the innocent and the guilty. And who told you, replied Robespierre with a poisonous look, that one innocent person had perished? Qua, said Danton, turning round to friend Paris self-named Fabricius, juryman in the revolutionary tribunal, qua, not one innocent. What sayest thou of it, Fabricius? Friends, Westermen, this Paris and others urged him to shew himself, to ascend the tribune and act. The man Danton was not prone to shew himself, to act, or uproar for his own safety. A man of careless, large, hoping nature, a large nature that could rest, he would sit whole hours, they say, hearing Camille talk, and liked nothing so well. Friends urged him to fly, his wife urged him, whither fly? Answered he, if freed France cast me out, there are only dungeons for me elsewhere. One carries not his country with him at the sole of his shoe. The man Danton sat still. Not even the arrestment of friend Herault, a member of Salat, yet arrested by Salat, can rouse Danton. On the night of the 30th of March, juryman Paris came rushing in. Haste looking through his eyes, a clerk of the Salat committee had told him Danton's warrant was made out he is to be arrested this very night. Entreaties there are and trepidation, of poor wife, of Paris and friends, Danton sat silent for a while. Then answered, ILS and Ozerayant, they dare not, and would take no measures. Murmuring, they dare not, he goes to sleep as usual. And yet, on the morrow morning, strange rumor spreads over Paris city, Danton, Camille, Felipos, Lacroix have been arrested overnight. It is verily so, 
the corridors of the Luxembourg were all crowded, prisoners crowding forth to see this giant of the revolution among them. Messers, said Danton politely, I hope soon to have got you all out of this, but here I am myself. And one sees not where it will end. Rumor may spread over Paris, the convention clusters itself into groups, wide-eyed, whispering, Danton arrested. Who then is safe? Legendre, mounting the tribune, utters, at his own peril, a feeble word for him, moving that he be heard at that bar before indictment, but Robespierre frowns him down, did you hear Chabot, or Bazire? Would you have two weights and measures? Legendre cowers low, Danton, like the others, must take his doom. Danton's prison thoughts were curious to have, but are not given in any quantity, indeed few such remarkable men have been left so obscure to us as this titan of the revolution. He was heard to ejaculate, this time twelve month, I was moving the creation of that same revolutionary tribunal. I crave pardon for it of God and man. They are all brothers Cain, Brissett would have had me guillotined as Robespierre now will. I leave the whole business in a frightful welter, Gacky's epavantable not one of them understands anything of government. Robespierre will follow me, I drag down Robespierre. Oh, it were better to be a poor fisherman than to meddle with governing of men. Camille's young beautiful wife, who had made him rich not in money alone, hovers round the Luxembourg, like a disembodied spirit, day and night. Camille's stolen letters to her still exist, stained with the mark of his tears. I carry my head like a saint sacrament, so Saint Just was heard to mutter, perhaps he will carry his like a Saint Denis. Unhappy Danton, thou still unhappier like Camille, once light procured de la lantern, ye also have arrived, then, at the bourne of creation, where, like Ulysses Polyvlas at the limit and utmost gaieties of his voyage. Gazing into that dim waste beyond creation, a man does see the shade of his mother, pale, ineffectual. And days when his mother nursed and wrapped him are all too sternly contrasted with this day. Danton, Camille, Herault, Westerman, and the others, very strangely massed up with Bazires, Swindler Chabots, Fabre d'Eglantines, Banker Frays, a most motley batch, Forny, as such things will be called, stand ranked at the bar of Tinville. It is the 2d of April 1794. Danton has had but three days to lie in prison, for the time presses. What is your name? Place of abode? And the like, Fouquier asks, according to formality. My name is Danton, answers he. A name tolerably known in the revolution, my abode will soon be annihilation, dawn lament, but I shall live in the pantheon of history. A man will endeavor to say something forcible, be it by nature or not. Herald mentions epigrammatically that he sat in this hall, and was detested of parliamenteers. Camille makes answer, my age is that of the bon sans culotte Jesus, an age fatal to revolutionists. O oh Camille, Camille! And yet in that divine transaction, let us say, there did lie, among other things, the fatalist reproof ever uttered here below to worldly right honorableness, the highest fact, so devout Novalis calls it, in the rights of man. Camille's real age, it would seem, is thirty-four. Danton is one year older. Some five months ago, the trial of the twenty-two Girondins was the greatest that Fouquier had then done. But here is a still greater to do. A thing which tasks the whole faculty of Fouquier, which makes the very heart of him waver. For it is the voice of Danton that reverberates now from these domes, in passionate words, piercing with their wild sincerity, winged with wrath. Your best witnesses he shivers into ruin at one stroke. He demands that the committee men themselves come as witnesses, as accusers, he will cover them with ignominy. He raises his huge stature, he shakes his huge black head, fire flashes from the eyes of him, piercing to all Republican hearts, so that the very galleries, though we filled them by ticket, murmur sympathy. And are like to burst down, and raise the people, and deliver him. He complains loudly that he is classed with Chabots, with swindling stockjobbers, that his indictment is a list of platitudes and horrors. Danton hidden on the 10th of August. Reverberates he, with the roar of a lion in the toils, where are the men that had to press Danton to shoe himself, that day. 
Where are these high-gifted souls of whom he borrowed energy? Let them appear, these accusers of mine, I have all the clearness of my self-possession when I demand them. I will unmask the three shallow scoundrels, Les Trois-Platz Kokens, Saint Just, Cuthin, Libas, who fawn on Robespierre, and lead him towards his destruction. Let them produce themselves here. I will plunge them into nothingness, out of which they ought never to have risen. The agitated president agitates his bell, enjoins calmness, in a vehement manner, what is it to thee how I defend myself? Cries the other, the right of dooming me is thine always. The voice of a man speaking for his honor and his life may well drown the jingling of thy bell. Thus Danton, higher and higher. Till the lion voice of him dies away in his throat speech will not utter what is in that man. The galleries murmur ominously, the first day's session is over. O Tinville, President Herman, what will ye do? They have two days more of it, by strictest revolutionary law. The galleries already murmur. If this Danton were to burst your meshwork, very curious indeed to consider. It turns on a hair, and what a hoity-toity were there, justice and culprit changing places, and the whole history of France running changed. For in France there is this Danton only that could still try to govern France. He only, the wild amorphous titan, and perhaps that other olive-complexioned individual, the artillery officer at Toulon, whom we left pushing his fortune in the south. On the evening of the second day, matters looking not better but worse and worse, Fouquier and Herman, distraction in their aspect, rush over to Salat Public. What is to be done? Salat Public rapidly concocts a new decree. Whereby if men, insult justice, they may be, thrown out of the debates. For indeed, withal, is there not, a plot in the Luxembourg prison? See I devant General Dillon, and others of the suspect, plotting with Camille's wife to distribute assignats. To force the prisons, overset the Republic. Citizen Laflotte, himself suspect but desiring enfranchisement, has reported said plot for us, a report that may bear fruit. Enough, on the morrow morning, an obedient convention passes this decree. Salat rushes off with it to the aid of Tinville, reduced now almost to extremities. And so, hors de debats, out of the debates, ye insolence. Policemen do your duty. In such manner, with a deadlift effort, Salat, Tinville Herman, Leroy Dixate, and all stanch jurymen setting heart and shoulder to it, the jury becomes sufficiently instructed. Sentence is passed, is sent by an official, and torn and trampled on, death this day. It is the 5th of April, 1794. Camille's poor wife may cease hovering about this prison. Nay let her kiss her poor children, and prepare to enter it, and to follow. Danton carried a high look in the death cart. Not so Camille, it is but one week, and all is so topsy-turvied, angel wife left weeping, love, riches, revolutionary fame, left all at the prison gate, carnivorous rabble now howling round. Palpable, and yet incredible, like a madman's dream. Camille struggles and writhes, his shoulders shuffle the loose coat off them, which hangs knotted, the hands tied, calm my friend, said Danton. He'd not that vile canale, laissez la set vile canale, dot. At the foot of the scaffold, Danton was heard to ejaculate, Oh my wife, my well-beloved, I shall never see thee more then. But, interrupting himself, Danton, no weakness. He said to Harold Seychelles stepping forward to embrace him, our heads will meet there, in the headsman's sack. His last words were to Samson the headsman himself, Thou wilt shew my head to the people, it is worth shewing. So passes, like a gigantic mass, of valor, ostentation, fury, affection and wild revolutionary manhood, this Danton, to his unknown home. He was of Arsasarob, born of, good farmer people, there. He had many sins. But one worst sin he had not, that of Kant. No hollow formalist, deceptive and self-deceptive, ghastly to the natural sense, was this, but a very man, with all his dross he was a man, fiery real, from the great fire bosom of nature herself. He saved France from Brunswick, he walked straight his own wild road, whither it led him. He may live for some generations in the memory of men. 
Chapter 3.6.3 The Tumbrils Next week, it is still but the 10th of April, there comes a new 19, Shamet, Gobel, Abers widow, the widow of Camille, these also roll their fated journey, black death devours them. Mean Abers widow was weeping, Camille's widow tried to speak comfort to her. O oh ye kind heavens, azure, beautiful, eternal behind your tempests and time clouds, is there not pity for all? Gobel, it seems, was repentant. He begged absolution of a priest, did as a Gobel best could. For Anaxagoras Chaumet, the sleek head now stripped of its bonnet rouge, what hope is there? Unless death were an eternal sleep. Wretched Anaxagoras, God shall judge thee, not I. A bear, therefore, is gone, and the Hebridists, they that robbed churches, and adored blue reason in red nightcap. Great Danton, and the Dantonists, they also are gone. Down to the catacombs, they are become silent men. Let no Paris municipality, no sect or party of this hue or that, resist the will of Robespierre and Sallet. Mayor Patch, not prompt enough in denouncing these pits plots, may congratulate about them now. Never so heartily, it skills not. His course likewise is to the Luxembourg. We appoint one Fleuriot Lescott interim mayor in his stead, an architect from Belgium, they say, this Fleuriot, he is a man one can depend on. Our new agent national is Pion, lately juryman. Whose sinusure also is Robespierre. Thus then, we perceive, this confusedly electric Erebus cloud of revolutionary government has altered its shape somewhat. Two masses, or wings, belonging to it. An over-electric mass of quarterlier rabbits, and an under-electric of Dantonist moderates and clemency men, these two masses, shooting bolts at one another, so to speak, have annihilated one another. For the Erebus cloud, as we often remark, is of suicidal nature, and, in jagged irregularity, darts its lightning withal into itself. But now these two discrepant masses being mutually annihilated, it is as if the Erebus cloud had got to internal composure and did only pour its hellfire lightning on the world that lay under it. In plain words, terror of the guillotine was never terrible till now. Systole, diastole, swift and ever swifter goes the axe of Samson. Indictment cease by degrees to have so much as plausibility, Fouquier chooses from the twelve houses of arrest what he calls batches, for knees, a score or more at a time. His jurymen are charged to make foot a file, fire filing till the ground be clear. Citizen Laflotte's report of plot in the Luxembourg is verily bearing fruit. If no speakable charge exist against a man, or batch of men, Fouquier has always this, a plot in the prison. Swift and ever swifter goes Samson, up, finally, to three score and more at a batch. It is the high day of death, none but the dead return not. O dusky dies preminal, what a day is this, the twenty-two d of April, by last day. The Palais Hall here is the same stone hall, where thou, five years ago, stoodest perorating, amid endless pathos of rebellious parliament, in the grey of the morning, bound to march with Diagaust to the Isles of Hears. The stones are the same stones, but the rest, men, rebellion, pathos, peroration, see. It has all fled, like a gibbering troop of ghosts, like the phantasms of a dying brain. With Dies Bremenal, in the same line of tumbrils, goes the mournfulest medley. Chapelier goes, C.I. Devant popular president of the constituent, whom the Menads and Maillard met in his carriage, on the Versailles Road. Thouret likewise, C.I. Devant president, father of constitutional law acts, he whom we heard saying, long since, with a loud voice, the constituent assembly has fulfilled its mission. And the noble old Malherbe, who defended Louis and could not speak, like a grey old rock dissolving into sudden water, he journeys here now, with his kindred, daughters, sons and grandsons, his Lamoignons, Chateaubriands, silent, towards death. One young Chateaubriand alone is wandering amid the Natchez, by the roar of Niagara Falls, the moan of endless forests, welcome thou great nature, savage, but not false, not unkind, unmotherly. No formula thou, or rapid jangle of hypothesis, parliamentary eloquence, constitution building, and the guillotine, 
speak thou to me, O mother, and sing my sick heart thy mystic everlasting lullaby song, and let all the rest be far. Another row of tumbrils we must notice, that which holds Elizabeth, the sister of Louis. Her trial was like the rest, four plots, four plots. She was among the kindliest, most innocent of women. There sat with her, amid four and twenty others, a once timorous Martianist de Crussell, courageous now, expressing towards her the liveliest loyalty. At the foot of the scaffold, Elizabeth with tears in her eyes, thanked this Martianess. Said she was grieved she could not reward her. Ah, madam, would your royal highness deign to embrace me, my wishes were complete. Right willingly, Marquise de Crussell, and with my whole heart. Thus they, at the foot of the scaffold. The royal family is now reduced to two, a girl and a little boy. The boy, once named Dauphin, was taken from his mother while she yet lived. And given to one Simon, by trade a cordwainer, on service then about the temple prison, to bring him up in principles of sansculottism. Simon taught him to drink, to swear, to sing the Carmagnole. Simon is now gone to the municipality, and the poor boy, hidden in a tower of the temple, from which in his fright and bewilderment and early decrepitude he wishes not to stir out, lies perishing, his shirt not changed for six months. Amid squalor and darkness, lamentably, so as none but poor factory children and the like are wont to perish and not be lamented. The spring sends its green leaves and bright weather, bright may brighter than ever, death pauses not. Lavoisier famed chemist, shall die and not live, chemist Lavoisier was farmer general Lavoisier too, and now, all the farmers general are arrested, all, and shall give an account of their monies and incomings. And die for, putting water in the tobacco, they sold. Lavoisier begged a fortnight more of life, to finish some experiments, but, the republic does not need such, the axe must do its work. Cynic Chamfort, reading these inscriptions of brotherhood or death, says, it is a brotherhood of Cain, arrested, then liberated, then about to be arrested again, this Chamfort cuts and slashes himself with frantic uncertain hand. Gains, not without difficulty, the refuge of death. Condorcet has lurked deep, these many months, Argus eyes watching and searching for him. His concealment is become dangerous to others and himself. He has to fly again, to skulk, round Paris, in thickets and stone quarries. And so at the village of Clamars, one bleared May morning, there enters a figure, ragged, rough-bearded, hunger-stricken, asks breakfast in the tavern there. Suspect, by the look of him. Servant out of place, sayest thou. Committee president of forty sous finds a Latin Horace on him, art thou not one of those C.I. devants that were wont to keep servants? Suspect. He is hailed forthwith, breakfast unfinished, towards Borg Lorraine, on foot, he faints with exhaustion, is set on a peasant's horse, is flung into his damp prison cell, on the morrow, recollecting him, you enter, Condorcet lies dead on the floor. They die fast, and disappear, the notabilities of France disappear, one after one, like lights in a theatre, which you are snuffing out. Under which circumstances, is it not singular, and almost touching, to see Paris city drawn out, in the meek May nights, in civic ceremony, which they call, super fraternel, brotherly supper. Spontaneous, or partially spontaneous, in the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth nights of this May month, it is seen. Along the Rue Saint-Honoré, and main streets and spaces, each citoyen brings forth what of supper the stingy maximum has yielded him, to the open air, joins it to his neighbor's supper. And with common table, cheerful light burning frequent, and what do modicum of cut glasses and other garnish and relish is convenient, they eat frugally together, under the kind stars. See it o oh night. With cheerfully pledged wine cup, hobnobbing to the reign of liberty, equality, brotherhood, with their wives in best ribbons, with their little ones romping round, the citoyens, in frugal love feast, sit there. Night in her wide empire sees nothing similar. Oh my brothers, why is the reign of brotherhood not come? It is come, it shall come, say the citoyens frugally hobnobbing. Ah me! These everlasting stars, do they not look down, like glistening eyes, bright with immortal pity, over the lot of man? One lamentable thing, 
however, is, that individuals will attempt assassination, of representatives of the people. Representative Collot, member even of Salat, returning home, about one in the morning, probably touched with liquor, as he is apt to be, meets on the stairs, the cry, Cellarat, and also the snap of a pistol, which latter flashes in the pan. Disclosing to him, momentarily, a pair of truculent saucer eyes, swart grim-clenched countenance, recognizable as that of our little fellow lodger, Sito Yen Amro, formerly, a clerk in the lotteries. Kalat shouts murder, with lungs fit to awaken all the roof of art, Amro snaps a second time, a second time flashes in the pan, then darts up into his apartment. And, after their firing, still with inadequate effect, one musket at himself and another at his captor, is clutched and locked in prison. An indignant little man this Amro, of southern temper and complexion, of considerable muscular force. He denies not that he meant to purge France of a tyrant, nay avows that he had an eye to the incorruptible himself, but took Collot as more convenient. Rumor enough hereupon. Heaven high congratulation of Collot, fraternal embracing, at the Jacobins, and elsewhere. And yet, it would seem the assassin mood proves catching. Two days more, it is still but the 23d of May, and towards nine in the evening, Cécile Renault, paper dealer's daughter, a young woman of soft blooming look, presents herself at the cabinet makers in the Rue Saint-Honoré. Desires to see Robespierre. Robespierre cannot be seen, she grumbles irreverently. They lay hold of her. She has left a basket in a shop hard by, in the basket are female change of raiment and two knives. Poor Cécile, examined by committee, declares she, wanted to see what a tyrant was like, the change of raiment was, for my own use in the place I am surely going to. What place? Prison, and then the guillotine, answered she. Such things come of Charlotte Corday, in a people prone to imitation, and monomania. Swart choleric men try Charlotte's feet, and their pistols miss fire, soft blooming young women try it, and, only half resolute, leave their knives in a shop. O oh Pitt, and ye faction of the stranger, shall the Republic never have rest, but be torn continually by baited springs, by wires of explosive spring guns? Swart Amaral, fair young Cecile, and all that knew them, and many that did not know them, lie locked, waiting the scrutiny of Tinville. Chapter 3.6.4 Mumbo Jumbo But on the day they called Decadie, New Sabbath, Twenty Prairial, June 8th by Old Style, what thing is this going forward, in the Jardin National, Wylam Tillery's garden? All the world is there, in holy day's clothes, foul linen went out with the Hebertists, nay Robespierre, for one, would never once countenance that. But went always elegant and frizzled, not without vanity even, and had his room hung round with sea-green portraits and busts. In holy day clothes, we say, are the innumerable citoyens and citoyennes, the weather is of the brightest. Cheerful expectation lights all countenances. Juryman Violet gives breakfast to many a deputy, in his official apartment, in the pavilion Cidevant of Flora. Rejoices in the bright-looking multitudes, in the brightness of leafy June, in the auspicious decadi, or new Sabbath. This day, if it please heaven, we are to have, on improved anti shamet principles, a new religion. Catholicism being burned out, and reason worship guillotined, was there not need of one? Incorruptible Robespierre, not unlike the ancients, as legislator of a free people will now also be priest and prophet. He has donned his sky-blue coat, made for the occasion, white silk waistcoat broidered with silver, black silk breeches, white stockings, shoe buckles of gold. He is president of the convention. He has made the convention decree, so they name it, Decreter the existence of the Supreme Being, and likewise C.E. Principi Consolator of the Immortality of the Soul. These consolatory principles, the basis of rational Republican religion, are getting decreed, and here, on this blessed decadie, by help of heaven and painter David, is to be our first act of worship. See, accordingly, how after decree passed, and what has been called the scraggiest prophetic discourse ever uttered by man, Mohammed Robespierre, in sky-blue coat and black breeches, frizzled and powdered to perfection. 
bearing in his hand a bouquet of flowers and wheat ears, issues proudly from the convention hall. Convention following him, yet, as is remarked, with an interval. Amphitheater has been raised, or at least Montecule or Elevation. Hideous statues of atheism, anarchy and such like, thanks to heaven and painter David, strike abhorrence into the heart. Unluckily however, our Montecule is too small. On the top of it not half of us can stand. Wherefore there arises indecent shoving, nay treasonous irreverent growling. Peace, thou borden the Elwas, peace, or it may be worse for thee. The sea-green pontiff takes a torch, painter David handing it. Mouth some other froth rant of vocables, which happily one cannot hear, strides resolutely forward, in sight of expectant France, sets his torch to atheism and company, which are but made of pasteboard steeped in turpentine. They burn up rapidly. And, from within, there rises, by machinery, an incombustible statue of wisdom, which, by ill hap, gets besmoked a little, but does stand there visible in as serene attitude as it can. And then? Why, then, there is other processioning, scraggy discoursing, and, this is our feast of the Etre Supreme, our new religion, better or worse, is come, look at it one moment, O oh reader, not two. The shabbiest page of human annals, or is there, that thou wottest of, one shabbier? Mumbo jumbo of the African woods to me seems venerable beside this new deity of Robespierre, for this is a conscious mumbo jumbo, and knows that he is machinery. O sea green prophet, unhappiest of windbags blown nigh to bursting, what distracted chimera among realities are thou growing to? This then, this common pitch link for artificial fireworks of turpentine and pasteboard. This is the miraculous errand's rod thou wilt stretch over a hag-ridden hell-ridden France, and bid her plague cease. Vanish, thou in it. Avec ton etre supreme, said Bill Laud, two commences a emmeter, with thy etre supreme thou beginnest to be a bore to me. Catherine Theot, on the other hand, an ancient serving maid seventy-nine years of age, inured to prophecy in the Bastille from of old, sits, in an upper room in the Rue de Contrescarp, poring over the Book of Revelations. With an eye to Robespierre. Finds that this astonishing thrice-potent Maximilian really is the man spoken of by prophets, who is to make the earth young again. With her sit devout old marchionesses, C.I. devant honorable women. Among whom old constituent Dom Girl, with his addle head, cannot be wanting. They sit there, in the Rue de Contrescarp, in mysterious adoration, Mumbo is Mumbo, and Robespierre is his prophet. A conspicuous man this Robespierre. He has his volunteer bodyguard of tapters, let us say strike sharps, fierce patriots with feraled sticks, and Jacobins kissing the hem of his garment. He enjoys the admiration of many, the worship of some. And is well worth the wonder of one and all. The grand question and hope, however, is, will not this feast of the Tillery's mumbo-jumbo be a sign perhaps that the guillotine is to abate? Far enough from that. Precisely on the second day after it, Cuthon, one of the three shallow scoundrels, gets himself lifted into the tribune, produces a bundle of papers. Cuthon proposes that, as plots still abound, the law of the suspect shall have extension, and arrestment new vigor and facility. Further that, as in such case business is like to be heavy, our revolutionary tribunal too shall have extension. Be divided, say, into four tribunals, each with its president, each with its fukier or substitute of fukier, all laboring at once. And any remnant of shackle or dilatory formality be struck off, in this way it may perhaps still overtake the work. Such is Cuthon's decree of the 22nd Prairial, famed in those times. At hearing of which decree the very mountain gasped, awestruck. And one Ruamps ventured to say that if it passed without adjournment and discussion, he, as one representative, would blow his brains out. Vain saying. The incorruptible knit his brows. Spoke a prophetic fateful word or two, the law of Prairial is law, Ruamps glad to leave his rash brains where they are. Death, then, and always death. Even so. Fukier is enlarging his borders. Making room for batches of a hundred and fifty at once, getting a guillotine set up, of improved velocity, and to work under cover, 
in the apartment close by. So that Salad itself has to intervene, and forbid him, wilt thou demoralize the guillotine, asks Callot, reproachfully, demoralizer le supplice. There is indeed danger of that, were not the republican faith great, it were already done. See, for example, on the 17th of June, what a batch, 54 at once. Swart Amaral is here, he of the pistol that missed fire, young Cecile Renault, with her father, family, entire kith and kin, the widow of Dias Preminal, old M. The Sombruil of the Invalids, with his son, poor old Sombruil, seventy-three years old, his daughter saved him in September, and it was but for this. Faction of the Stranger, fifty-four of them. In red shirts and smocks, as assassins and faction of the Stranger, they flit along there, red baleful phantasmagory, towards the land of phantoms. Meanwhile will not the people of the Place de la Revolution, the inhabitants along the Rue Saint-Honoré, as these continual tumbrils pass, begin to look gloomy? Republicans too have bowels. The guillotine is shifted, then again shifted. Finally set up at the remote extremity of the southeast, suburbs Saint-Antoine and Saint-Marceau it is to be hoped, if they have bowels, have very tough ones. Chapter 3.6.V the prisons. It is time now, however, to cast a glance into the prisons. When Desmoulins moved for his committee of mercy, these twelve houses of arrest held five thousand persons. Continually arriving since then, there have now accumulated twelve thousand. They are Seidevants, royalists, in far greater part, they are republicans, of various Girondin, Fayettish, unjacobin color. Perhaps no human habitation or prison ever equaled in squalor, in noisome horror, these twelve houses of arrest. There exist records of personal experience in the memoirs Sir Les Prisons, one of the strangest chapters in the biography of man. Very singular to look into it, how a kind of order rises up in all conditions of human existence. And wherever two or three are gathered together, there are formed modes of existing together, habitudes, observances, nay gracefulnesses, joys. Cito Yen Coitant will explain fully how our lean dinner, of herbs and carrion, was consumed not without politeness and place a ux dames, how seigneur and shoe black, duchess and daltier sheet, flung pell-mell into a heap. Ranked themselves according to method, at what hour the citoyens took to their needlework. And we, yielding the chairs to them, endeavored to talk gallantly in a standing posture, or even to sing and harp more or less. Jealousies, enmities are not wanting, nor flirtations, of an effective character. Alas, by degrees, even needlework must cease, plot in the prison rises, by Cito Yen La Flotte and preternatural suspicion. Suspicious municipality snatches from us all implements. All money in possession, of means, or metal, is ruthlessly searched for, in pocket, in pillow and palliasse, and snatched away, red-capped commissaries entering every cell. Indignation, temporary desperation, at robbery of its very thimble, fills the gentle heart. Old nuns shriek shrill discord, demand to be killed forthwith. No help from shrieking. Better was that of the two shifty male citizens, eager to preserve an implement or two, were it but a pipe-picker, or needle to darn hose with, determined to defend themselves, by tobacco. Swift then, as your fell red caps are heard in the corridor rummaging and slamming, the two citoyens light their pipes and begin smoking. Thick darkness envelopes them. The red nightcaps, opening the cell, breathe but one mouthful. Burst forth into chorus of barking and coughing. Qua, messers, cry the two citoyens, you don't smoke. Is the pipe disagreeable? Sceq vu any fumes pa. But the red nightcaps have fled, with slight search, vu enemes pa la pipe. Cry the citoyens, as their door slams to again. My poor brother citoyens, oh surely, in a reign of brotherhood, you are not the two I would guillotine. Rigor grows, stiffens into horrid tyranny, plot in the prison getting ever riper. This plot in the prison, as we said, is now the stereotype formula of Tinville, against whomsoever he knows no crime, this is a ready-made crime. His judgment bar has become unspeakable, a recognized mockery. 
known only as the wicked one passes through, towards death. His indictments are drawn out in blank, you insert the names after. He has his mutons, detestable traitor jackals, who report and bear witness. That they themselves may be allowed to live, for a time. His fornees, says the reproachful Kalat, shall in no case exceed threescore, that is his maximum. Nightly come his tumbrils to the Luxembourg, with the fatal roll call. List of the fournee of tomorrow. Men rush towards the great, listen, if their name be in it. One deep drawn breath, when the name is not in, we live still one day. And yet some score or scores of names were in. Quick these. They clasp their loved ones to their heart, one last time, with brief adieu, wet eyed or dry eyed, they mount, and are away. This night to the conciergerie, through the polemis named of justice, to the guillotine tomorrow. Recklessness, defiant levity, the stoicism if not of strength yet of weakness, has possessed all hearts. Weak women and siidevants, their locks not yet made into blonde perukes, their skins not yet tanned into breeches, are accustomed to act the guillotine by way of pastime. In fantastic mummery, with towel turbans, blanket ermine, a mock Sanhedrin of judges sits, a mock Tinville pleads, a culprit is doomed, is guillotined by the oversetting of two chairs. Sometimes we carry it farther, Tinville himself, in his turn, is doomed, and not to the guillotine alone. With blackened face, hirsute, horned, a shaggy Satan snatches him not unshrieking. Shoes him, with outstretched arm and voice, the fire that is not quenched, the worm that dies not, the monotony of hell pain, and the what hour? Answered by, it is eternity. And still the prisons fill fuller, and still the guillotine goes faster. On all high roads march flights of prisoners, wending towards Paris. Not Siedevants now, they, the noisy of them, are mown down, it is Republicans now. Chained two and two they march, in exasperated moments, singing their Marseillaise. A hundred and thirty-two men of Nantes for instance, march towards Paris, in these same days, Republicans, or say even Jacobins to the marrow of the bone, but Jacobins who had not approved Noyotting. Vive la Republic rises from them in all streets of towns, they rest by night, in unutterable noisome dens, crowded to choking, one or two dead on the morrow. They are wayworn, weary of heart, can only shout, live the Republic. We, as under horrid enchantment, dying in this way for it. Some four hundred priests, of whom also there is record, ride at anchor, in the roads of the Isle of Aix, long months. Looking out on misery, vacuity, waste sands of Ulran and the ever moaning brine. Ragged, sordid, hungry, wasted to shadows, eating their unclean ration on deck, circularly, in parties of a dozen, with finger and thumb. Beating their scandalous clothes between two stones, choked in horrible miasmata, closed under hatches, seventy of them in a berth, through night, so that the aged priest is found lying dead in the morning, in the attitude of prayer. How long, O Lord! Not forever, no. All anarchy, all evil, injustice, is, by the nature of it, dragon's teeth, suicidal, and cannot endure. Chapter 3.6.VI To finish the terror. It is very remarkable, indeed, that since the Etri Supreme Feast, and the sublime continued harangues on it, which Bill Laud feared would become a bore to him, Robespierre has gone little to committee, but held himself apart, as if in a kind of pet. Nay they have made a report on that old Catherine Theot, and her regenerative man spoken of by the prophets, not in the best spirit. This theat mystery they affect to regard as a plot. But have evidently introduced a vein of satire, of irreverent banter, not against the spinster alone, but obliquely against her regenerative man. Barrere's light pen was perhaps at the bottom of it, read through the solemn snuffling organs of old Vadier of the Charite General, the theat report had its effect, wrinkling the general republican visage into an iron grin. Ought these things to be? We note farther that among the prisoners in the twelve houses of arrest, there is one whom we have seen before. Signora Fontenay, born Cabarrus, the fair proserpine whom Representative Tauline Pluto-like did gather at Bordeaux, not without effect on himself. 
Taolin is home, by recall, long since, from Bordeaux, and in the most alarming position. Vain that he sounded, louder even than ever, the note of Jacobinism, to hide past shortcomings, the Jacobins purged him out, two times has Robespierre growled at him words of omen from the Convention Tribune. And now his fair cabaris, hit by denunciation, lies arrested, suspect, in spite of all he could do, shut in horrid pinfold of death, the Signora smuggles out to her red gloomy Taolin the most pressing entreaties and conjurings, Save me. Save thyself. Sayest thou not that thy own head is doomed, thou with a too fiery audacity, a Dantonist withal, against whom lie grudges? Are ye not all doomed, as in the Polyphemus cavern, the fawningest slave of you will be but eaten last? Taolin feels with a shudder that it is true. Taolin has had words of omen, Borden has had words, Freren is hated and Barris, each man, feels his head if it yet stick on his shoulders. Meanwhile Robespierre, we still observe, goes little to convention, not at all to committee, speaks nothing except to his Jacobin house of lords, amid his bodyguard of captors. These, forty days, for we are now far in July, he has not shewed face in committee, could only work there by his three shallow scoundrels, and the terror there was of him. The incorruptible himself sits apart. Or is seen stalking in solitary places in the fields, with an intensely meditative air, some say, with eyes red spotted, fruit of extreme bile, the lamentablest sea green chimera that walks the earth that July. O oh, hapless chimera! For thou too hadst a life, and a heart of flesh, what is this the stern gods, seeming to smile all the way, have led and let thee to? Art not thou he who, few years ago, was a young advocate of promise? And gave up the heiress judgeship rather than sentence one man to die? What his thoughts might be? His plans for finishing the terror? One knows not. Dim vestiges there flit of agrarian law, a victorious sansculottism become landed proprietor. Old soldiers sitting in national mansions, in hospital palaces of Chambord and Chantilly, peace bought by victory, breaches healed by feast of Etre Supreme. And so, through seas of blood, to equality, frugality, works and blessedness, fraternity, and republic of the virtues. Blessed shore, of such a sea of aristocrat blood, but how to land on it? Through one last wave, blood of corrupt sansculottists. Traitorous or semi-traitorous conventionals, rebellious Taolines, Bill Lods, to whom with my Etre Supreme I have become a bore, with my apocalyptic old woman a laughingstock. So stalks he, this poor Robespierre, like a sea-green ghost through the blooming July. Vestiges of schemes flit dim. But what his schemes or his thoughts were will never be known to man. New catacombs, some say, are digging for a huge simultaneous butchery. Convention to be butchered, down to the right pitch, by General Henriot and Company, Jacobin House of Lords made dominant, and Robespierre dictator. There is actually, or else there is not actually, a list made out, which the hairdresser has got eye on, as he frizzled the incorruptible locks. Each man asks himself, is it I? Nay, as tradition and rumor of anecdotes still convey it, there was a remarkable bachelor's dinner one hot day at Barayer's. For doubt not, O oh reader, this Barayer and others of them gave dinners. Had, country house at Clichy, with elegant enough sumptuosities, and pleasures high rouged. But at this dinner we speak of, the day being so hot, it is said, the guests all stripped their coats, and left them in the drawing room, whereupon Carnot glided out, driven by a necessity, needing of all things paper, groped in Robespierre's pocket. Found a list of forty, his own name among them, and tarried not at the wine cup that day, ye must bestir yourselves, O oh friends, ye dull frogs of the marsh, mute ever since Gerondism sank under, even ye now must croak or die. Councils are held, with word and beck, nocturnal, mysterious as death. Does not a feline Maximilian stalk there, voiceless as yet, his green eyes red-spotted, back-bent, and hair up? Rash Taolin, with his rash temper and audacity of tongue. He shall bell the cat. Fix a day, and be it soon, lest never. Lo, before the fixed day, on the day which they call 8th of Thermidor, July 26, 1794, Robespierre himself reappears in convention, 
mounts to the tribune. The biliary face seems clouded with new gloom, judge whether your tau leans, Bordens listen with interest. It is a voice bodeful of death or of life. Long-winded, unmelodious as the screech owls, sounds that prophetic voice, degenerate condition of republican spirit, corrupt moderatism, charite, salad committees themselves infected, backsliding on this hand and on that. I, Maximilian, alone left incorruptible, ready to die at a moment's warning. For all which what remedy is there? The guillotine, new vigor to the all-healing guillotine, death to traitors of every hue. So sings the prophetic voice. Into its convention sounding board. The old song this, but today, O oh heavens! Has the sounding board ceased to act? There is not resonance in this convention, there is, so to speak, a gasp of silence, nay a certain grating of one knows not what. Le Cointer, our old draper of Versailles, in these questionable circumstances, sees nothing he can do so safe as rise, insidiously, or not insidiously, and move, according to established wont. That the Robespierre speech be, printed and sent to the departments. Hark, gratings, even of dissonance. Honorable members hint dissonance, committee members, inculpated in the speech, utter dissonance, demand, delay in printing. Ever higher rises the note of dissonance. Inquiry is even made by Editor Freren, what has become of the liberty of opinions in this convention? The order to print and transmit, which had got passed, is rescinded. Robespierre, greener than ever before, has to retire, foiled. Discerning that it is mutiny, that evil is nigh. Mutiny is a thing of the fatalist nature in all enterprises whatsoever, a thing so incalculable, swift frightful, not to be dealt with in fright. But mutiny in a Robespierre convention, above all, it is like fire seen sputtering in the ship's powder room. One death-defiant plunge at it, this moment, and you may still tread it out, hesitate till next moment, ship and ship's captain, crew and cargo are shivered far, the ship's voyage has suddenly ended between sea and sky. If Robespierre can, tonight, produce his Henriette and company, and get his work done by them, he and Sansculottism may still subsist some time, if not, probably not. Oliver Cromwell, when that agitator sergeant stepped forth from the ranks, with plea of grievances, and began gesticulating and demonstrating, as the mouthpiece of thousands expectant there, discerned, with those truculent eyes of his. How the matter lay. Plucked a pistol from his holsters, blew agitator and agitation instantly out. Noel was a man fit for such things. Robespierre, for his part, glides over at evening to his Jacobin house of lords. Unfolds there, instead of some adequate resolution, his woes, his uncommon virtues, incorruptibilities, then, secondly, his rejected screech owl oration, reads this latter over again, and declares that he is ready to die at a moment's warning. Thou shalt not die! shouts Jacobinism from its thousand throats. Robespierre, I will drink the hemlock with thee, cries painter David, J. E. Boirai la sigue avec toi, a thing not essential to do, but which, in the fire of the moment, can be said. Our Jacobin sounding board, therefore, does act. Applauses heaven high cover the rejected oration, fire eyed fury lights all Jacobin features, insurrection a sacred duty, the convention to be purged, sovereign people under Henriette and municipality. We will make a new June 2nd of it, to your tents, O Israel. In this key pipes Jacobinism, in sheer tumult of revolt. Let Tallinn and all opposition men make off. Call lot de Herboys, though of the supreme salad, and so lately near shot, is elbowed, bullied, is glad to escape alive. Entering committee room of salad, all disheveled, he finds sleek somber saint just there, among the rest. Who in his sleek way asks, what is passing at the Jacobins? What is passing, repeats Collot, in the unhistrionic Cambyses vein, what is passing? Nothing but revolt and horrors are passing. Ye want our lives, ye shall not have them. Saint just stutters at such Cambyses oratory, takes his hat to withdraw. That report he had been speaking of, report on Republican things in general we may say, which is to be read in convention on the morrow, he cannot shew at them this moment, 
a friend has it. He, Saint Just, will get it, and send it, where he wants home. Once home, he sends not it, but an answer that he will not send it, that they will hear it from the tribune tomorrow. Let every man, therefore, according to a well-known good advice, pray to heaven, and keep his powder dry. Paris, on the morrow, will see a thing. Swift scouts fly dim or invisible, all night, from Charit and Salat, from conclave to conclave. From mother society to town hall. Sleep, can it fall on the eyes of Taulines, Frerons, Kaulots? Puissant Henriot, Mayor Fleuriot, Judge Coffinhal, Procure Pion, Robespierre and all the Jacobins are getting ready. Chapter 3.6.7 Go down to. Talion's eyes beamed bright, on the morrow, ninth of Thermidor, about nine o'clock, to see that the convention had actually met. Paris is in rumor, but at least we are met, in legal convention here, we have not been snatched seriatim. Treated with a pride's purge at the door. Allons, brave men of the plain, late frogs of the marsh. Cried Talion with a squeeze of the hand, as he passed in. St. Just's sonorous organ being now audible from the tribune, and the game of games begun. St. Just is verily reading that report of his, green vengeance, in the shape of Robespierre, watching nigh. Behold, however, St. Just has read but few sentences, when interruption rises, rapid crescendo. When Taulin starts to his feet, and Bill Laud, and this man starts and that, and Taulin, a second time, with his, Citoyens, at the Jacobins last night, I trembled for the Republic. I said to myself, if the Convention dare not strike the tyrant, then I myself dare, and with this I will do it, if need be, said he, whisking out a clear gleaming dagger, and brandishing it there, the steel of Brutus, as we call it. Whereat we all bellow, and brandish, impetuous acclaim. Tyranny, dictatorship. Triumvirate. And the Salic committee men accuse, and all men accuse, and uproar, and impetuously acclaim. And Saint Just is standing motionless, pale of face. Cuthin ejaculating, triumvir, with a look at his paralytic legs. And Robespierre is struggling to speak, but President Thuriot is jingling the bell against him, but the hall is sounding against him like an Aeolus hall, and Robespierre is mounting the tribune steps and descending again. Going and coming, like to choke with rage, terror, desperation, and mutiny is the order of the day. O President Thuriot, thou that wert Elector Thuriot, and from the Bastille battlement sawest Saint Antoine rising like the ocean tide, and hast seen much since, sawest thou ever the like of this? Jingle of bell, which thou jinglest against Robespierre, is hardly audible amid the bedlam storm, and men rage for life. President of Assassins, shrieks Robespierre, I demand speech of thee for the last time. It cannot be had. To you, O virtuous men of the plain, cries he, finding audience one moment, I appeal to you. The virtuous men of the plain sit silent as stones. And Thuriot's bell jingles, and the hall sounds like Aeolus's hall. Robespierre's frothing lips are grown blue, his tongue dry, cleaving to the roof of his mouth. The blood of Danton chokes him, cry they. Accusation. Decree of accusation. Thuriot swiftly puts that question. Accusation passes. The incorruptible Maximilian is decreed accused. I demand to share my brother's fate, as I have striven to share his virtues, cries Augustine, the younger Robespierre, Augustine also is decreed. And Cuthin, and Saint Just, and Libas, they are all decreed, and packed forth, not without difficulty, the ushers almost trembling to obey. Triumvirate and company are packed forth, into Salat committee room. Their tongue cleaving to the roof of their mouth. You have but to summon the municipality, to cashier Commandant Henriot, and launch arrest at him, to regular formalities, hand Tinville his victims. It is noon, the Aeolus Hall has delivered itself. Blows now victorious, harmonious, as one irresistible wind. And so the work is finished. One thinks so, and yet it is not so. Alas, there is yet but the first act finished, three or four other acts still to come, and an uncertain catastrophe. 
A huge city holds in it so many confusions, 700,000 human heads, not one of which knows what its neighbor is doing, nay not what itself is doing. See, accordingly, about three in the afternoon, Commandant Henriot, how instead of sitting cashiered, arrested, he gallops along the quays, followed by municipal gendarmes, trampling down several persons. For the town hall sits deliberating, openly insurgent, barriers to be shut, no jailer to admit any prisoner this day, and Henriot is galloping towards the tilleries, to deliver Robespierre. On the Quai de la Ferrelleri, a young citoyen, walking with his wife, says aloud, Gendarmes, that man is not your commandant, he is under arrest. The gendarmes strike down the young citoyen with the flat of their swords. Representatives themselves, as Merlin the Thionviller, who accost him, this puissant Henriot flings into guardhouses. He bursts towards the Tillery's committee room, to speak with Robespierre with difficulty, the ushers and Tillery's gendarmes, earnestly pleading and drawing sabre, seize this Henriot, get the Henriot gendarmes persuaded not to fight. Get Robespierre and company packed into hackney coaches, sent off under escort, to the Luxembourg and other prisons. This then is the end. May not an exhausted convention adjourn now, for a little repose and sustenance, at five o'clock. An exhausted convention did it, and repented it. The end was not come, only the end of the second act. Hark, while exhausted representatives sit at vittles, toxin bursting from all steeples, drums rolling, in the summer evening, Judge Coffinhal is galloping with new gendarmes to deliver Henriot from Tillery's committee room, and does deliver him. Puissant Henriot vaults on horseback, sets to haranguing the Tillery's gendarmes, corrupts the Tillery's gendarmes too, trots off with them to town hall. Alas, and Robespierre is not in prison, the jailer shoot his municipal order, durst not on pain of his life, admit any prisoner. The Robespierre hackney coaches, in confused jangle and whirl of uncertain gendarmes, have floated safe, into the town hall. There sit Robespierre and company, embraced by municipals and Jacobins, in sacred rite of insurrection. Redacting proclamations, sounding toxins, corresponding with sections and mother society. Is not here a pretty enough third act of a natural Greek drama, catastrophe more uncertain than ever? The hasty convention rushes together again, in the ominous nightfall, President Collot, for the chair is his, enters with long strides, paleness on his face, claps on his hat. Says with solemn tone, Citoyens, armed villains have beset the committee rooms, and got possession of them. The hour is come, to die at our post. We, answer one and all, we swear it. It is no rodomantade, this time, but a sad fact and necessity, unless we do at our posts, we must verily die. Swift therefore, Robespierre, Henriot, the municipality, are declared rebels, put or la loi, out of law. Better still, we appoint Barris commandant of what armed force is to be had, send missionary representatives to all sections and quarters, to preach, and raise force, we'll die at least with harness on our back. What a distracted city! Men riding and running, reporting and hearsaying, the hour clearly in travail, child not to be named till born. The poor prisoners in the Luxembourg hear the rumor, tremble for a new September. They see men making signals to them, on skylights and roofs, apparently signals of hope, cannot in the least make out what it is. We observe however, in the eventide, as usual, the death tumbrils faring southeastward, through Saint Antoine, towards their barrier du trône. Saint Antoine's tough bowels melt, Saint Antoine surrounds the tumbrils, says, it shall not be. Oh heavens, why should it? Henriette and gendarmes, scouring the streets that way, bellow, with waved sabres, that it must. Quit hope, ye poor doomed. The tumbrils move on. But in this set of tumbrils there are two other things notable, one notable person, and one want of a notable person. The notable person is Lieutenant General Loiserols, a nobleman by birth, and by nature, laying down his life here for his son. In the prison of Saint Lazare, the night before last, hurrying to the grate to hear the death list read, he caught the name of his son. The son was asleep at the moment. I am Loiserols, cried the old man, at Tinville's bar, 
an error in the Christian name is little, small objection was made. The want of the notable person, again, is that of Deputy Payne. Payne has sat in the Luxembourg since January. And seemed forgotten, but Fouquier had pricked him at last. The turnkey, list in hand, is marking with chalk the outer doors of tomorrow's fournee. Payne's outer door happened to be open, turned back on the wall. The turnkey marked it on the side next him, and hurried on, another turnkey came, and shut it, no chalk mark now visible, the fourni went without pain. Pain's life lay not there. Our fifth act, of this natural Greek drama, with its natural unities, can only be painted in gross, somewhat as that antique painter, driven desperate, did the foam. For through this blessed July night, there is clangor, confusion very great, of marching troops, of sections going this way, sections going that, of missionary representatives reading proclamations by torchlight. Missionary Legendre, who has raised force somewhere, emptying out the Jacobins, and flinging their key on the convention table, I have locked their door, it shall be virtue that reopens it. Paris, we say, is set against itself, rushing confused, as ocean currents do, a huge maelstrom, sounding there, under cloud of night. Convention sits permanent on this hand, municipality most permanent on that. The poor prisoners hear toxin and rumor, strive to bethink them of the signals apparently of hope. Meet continual twilight streaming up, which will be dawn and a tomorrow, silvers the northern hem of night. It wends and wends there, that meek brightness, like a silent prophecy, along the great ring dial of the heaven. So still, eternal. And on earth all is confused shadow and conflict, dissidence, tumultuous gloom and glare. And destiny as yet shakes her doubtful urn. About three in the morning, the dissident armed forces have met. Henriette's armed force stood ranked in the place to grieve, and now Barris's, which he has recruited, arrives there. And they front each other, cannon bristling against cannon. Citoyens. Cries the voice of discretion, loudly enough, before coming to bloodshed, to endless civil war, hear the convention decree read, Robespierre and all rebels out of law. Out of law. There is terror in the sound, unarmed citoyens disperse rapidly home, municipal cannoneers range themselves on the convention side, with shouting. At which shout, Henriette descends from his upper room, far gone in drink as some say. Finds his place to grieve empty, the cannon's mouth turned towards him, and, on the whole, that it is now the catastrophe. Stumbling in again, the wretched drunk sobered Henriette announces, all is lost. Miserable. It is thou that hast lost it, cry they, and fling him, or else he flings himself, out of window, far enough down, into mason work and horror of cesspool, not into death but worse. Augustine Robespierre follows him, with the like fate. Saint just called on Libas to kill him, who would not. Cuthin crept under a table, attempting to kill himself, not doing it. Dot, on entering that Sanhedrin of insurrection, we find all as good as extinct, undone, ready for seizure. Robespierre was sitting on a chair, with pistol shot blown through, not his head, but his under jaw, the suicidal hand had failed. With prompt zeal, not without trouble, we gather these wretched conspirators. Fish up even Henriette and Augustine, bleeding and foul, pack them all, rudely enough, into carts, and shall, before sunrise, have them safe under lock and key. Amid shoutings and embracings. Robespierre lay in an anteroom of the convention hall, while his prison escort was getting ready, the mangled jaw bound up rudely with bloody linen, a spectacle to men. He lies stretched on a table, a deal box his pillow. The sheath of the pistol is still clenched convulsively in his hand. Men bully him, insult him, his eyes still indicate intelligence, he speaks no word. He had on the sky-blue coat he had got made for the feast of the Etre Supreme, O reader, can thy hard heart hold out against that? His trousers were nankeen, the stockings had fallen down over the ankles. He spake no word more in this world. And so, at six in the morning, a victorious convention adjourns. Report flies over Paris as on golden wings, penetrates the prisons. Irradiates the faces of those that were ready to perish, 
turnkeys and mutons, fallen from their high estate, look mute and blue. It is the 28th day of July, called 10th of Thermidor, year 1794. Fukier had but to identify. His prisoners being already out of law. At four in the afternoon, never before were the streets of Paris seen so crowded. From the Palais de Justice to the Place de la Revolution, for thither again go the tumbrils this time, it is one dense stirring mass, all windows crammed, the very roofs and ridge tiles budding forth human curiosity, in strange gladness. The death tumbrils, with their motley batch of outlaws, some twenty-three or so, from Maximilian to Mayor Fleuriot and Simon the Cordwainer, roll on. All eyes are on Robespierre's tumbril, where he, his jaw bound in dirty linen, with his half-dead brother, and half-dead Henriot, lie shattered, their seventeen hours, of agony about to end. The gendarmes point their swords at him, to shew the people which is he. A woman springs on the tumbril, clutching the side of it with one hand, waving the other sibyl-like, and exclaims, The death of the gladdens my very heart, Emenivre de joie. Robespierre opened his eyes, Celerat, go down to hell, with the curses of all wives and mothers. At the foot of the scaffold, they stretched him on the ground till his turn came. Lifted aloft, his eyes again opened, caught the bloody axe. Samson wrenched the coat off him, wrenched the dirty linen from his jaw, the jaw fell powerless, there burst from him a cry, hideous to hear and see. Samson, thou canst not be too quick. Samson's work done, there burst forth shout on shout of applause. Shout, which prolongs itself not only over Paris, but over France, but over Europe, and down to this generation. Deservedly, and also undeservedly. O unhappiest advocate of Eris, wert thou worse than other advocates? Stricter man, according to his formula, to his credo and his cant, of probities, benevolences, pleasures of virtue, and such like, lived not in that age. A man fitted, in some luckier settled age, to have become one of those incorruptible barren pattern figures, and have had marble tablets and funeral sermons. His poor landlord, the cabinet maker in the Rue Saint Honore, loved him. His brother died for him. May God be merciful to him, and to us. This is end of the reign of terror, new glorious revolution named of Thermidor, of Thermidor IX, year two, which being interpreted into old slave style means 27th of July, 1794. Terror is ended, and death in the place de la Revolution, where the tale of Robespierre once executed, which service Fouquier in large batches is swiftly managing. Book 3.7 Vendmier Chapter 3.7.I Decadent How little did any one suppose that here was the end not of Robespierre only, but of the revolution system itself. Least of all did the mutinying committee men suppose it who had mutinied with no view whatever except to continue the national regeneration with their own heads on their shoulders. And yet so it verily was. The insignificant stone they had struck out, so insignificant anywhere else, proved to be the keystone, the whole archwork and edifice of sansculottism began to loosen, to crack, to yawn. And tumbled, piecemeal, with considerable rapidity, plunge after plunge, till the abyss had swallowed it all, and in this upper world sansculottism was no more. For despicable as Robespierre himself might be, the death of Robespierre was a signal at which great multitudes of men, struck dumb with terror heretofore, rose out of their hiding places, and, as it were, saw one another. How multitudinous they were! And began speaking and complaining. They are countable by the thousand and the million, who have suffered cruel wrong. Ever louder rises the plaint of such a multitude. Into a universal sound, into a universal continuous peal, of what they call public opinion. Camille had demanded a, committee of mercy, and could not get it. But now the whole nation resolves itself into a committee of mercy, the nation has tried sansculottism, and is weary of it. Force of public opinion. What king or convention can withstand it? You in vain struggle. The thing that is rejected as calumnious today must pass as voracious with triumph another day, gods and men have declared that sansculottism cannot be. Sansculottism, on that ninth night of Thermidor suicidally, 
fractured its under jaw, and lies writhing, never to rise more. Through the next fifteenth months, it is what we may call the death agony of Sansculottism. Sansculottism, anarchy of the Jean-Jacques Evangel, having now got deep enough, is to perish in a new singular system of culottism and arrangement. For arrangement is indispensable to man. Arrangement, were it grounded only on that old primary evangel of force, with scepter in the shape of hammer. Be their method, be their order, cry all men, were it that of the drill sergeant. More tolerable is the drilled bayonet rank, than that undrilled guillotine, incalculable as the wind dot, how sansculottism, writhing in death throes, strove some twice, or even three times, to get on its feet again. But fell always, and was flung resupine, the next instant, and finally breathed out the life of it, and stirred no more, this we are now, from a due distance, with due brevity, to glance at, and then, O oh reader, courage, I see land. Two of the first acts of the convention, very natural for it after this thermidor, are to be specified here, the first is renewal of the governing committees. Both Charit General and Salat Public, thinned by the guillotine, need filling up, we naturally fill them up with Taulines, Frerons, victorious Thermidorian men. Still more to the purpose, we appoint that they shall, as law directs, not in name only but in deed, be renewed and changed from period to period, a fourth part of them going out monthly. The convention will no more lie under bondage of committees, under terror of death, but be a free convention, free to follow its own judgment, and the force of public opinion. Not less natural is it to enact that prisoners and persons under accusation shall have right to demand some writ of accusation, and see clearly what they are accused of. Very natural acts, the harbingers of hundreds and not less so. For now Fouquier's trade, shackled by writ of accusation, and legal proof, is as good as gone, effectual only against Robespierre's tale. The prisons give up their suspects, emit them faster and faster. The committees see themselves besieged with prisoners' friends, complain that they are hindered in their work, it is as with men rushing out of a crowded place, and obstructing one another. Turned are the tables, prisoners pouring out in floods. Jailers, moutons and the tale of Robespierre going now whither they were wont to send, the hundred and thirty-two Nantes Republicans, whom we saw marching in irons, have arrived, shrunk to ninety-four, the fifth man of them choked by the road. They arrive, and suddenly find themselves not pleaders for life, but denouncers to death. Their trial is for acquittal, and more. As the voice of a trumpet, their testimony sounds far and wide, mere atrocities of a reign of terror. For a space of nineteen days, with all solemnity and publicity. Representative Carrier, Company of Marat, Moyadings, Lawyer Marriages, Things Done in Darkness, Come Forth into Light, Clear is the Voice of These Poor Resuscitated Nantes. And Journals and Speech and Universal Committee of Mercy reverberated loud enough, into all ears and hearts. Deputation arrives from Eris, denouncing the atrocities of Representative Levin. A tamed convention loves its own life, yet what help? Representative Levin, Representative Carrier must wend towards the Revolutionary Tribunal, struggle and delay as we will, the cry of a nation pursues them louder and louder. Them also Tinville must abolish. If indeed Tinville himself be not abolished. We must note moreover the decrepit condition into which a once omnipotent mother society has fallen. Legendre flung her keys on the convention table, that Thermidor night. Her president was guillotined with Robespierre. The once mighty mother came, some time after, with a subdued countenance, begging back her keys, the keys were restored her, but the strength could not be restored her. The strength had departed forever. Alas, one's day is done. Vain that the tribune in mid-air sounds as of old, to the general ear it has become a horror, and even a weariness. By and by, affiliation is prohibited, the mighty mother sees herself suddenly childless, mourns, as so hoarse a Rachel may. The revolutionary committees, without suspects to prey upon, perish fast, as it were a famine. In Paris the whole forty-eight of them are reduced to twelve, their forty sous are abolished, yet a little while, and revolutionary committees are no more. Maximum will be abolished, 
let Sanskulatism find food where it can. Neither is there now any municipality, any center at the town hall. Mayor Fleuriot and company perished, whom we shall not be in haste to replace. The town hall remains in a broken submissive state, knows not well what it is growing to. Knows only that it is grown weak, and must obey. What if we should split Paris into, say, a dozen separate municipalities, incapable of concert? The sections were thus rendered safe to act with, or indeed might not the sections themselves be abolished. You had then merely your twelve manageable Pacific townships, without center or subdivision. And sacred right of insurrection fell into abeyance. So much is getting abolished, fleeting swiftly into the inane. For the press speaks, and the human tongue. Journals, heavy and light, in Philippic and burlesque, a renegade frarin, a renegade prudhomme, loud they as ever, only the contrary way. And C.I. Devants show themselves, almost parade themselves, resuscitated as from death sleep. Publish what death pains they have had. The very frogs of the marsh croak with emphasis. Your protesting seventy-three shall, with a struggle, be emitted out of prison, back to their seats. Your Louvets, Isnards, Langeuanais, and wrecks of Girondism, recalled from their haylofts, and caves in Switzerland, will resume their place in the convention, natural foes of terror. Thermidorian Taulines, and mere foes of terror, rule in this convention, and out of it. The compressed mountain shrinks silent more and more. Moderatism rises louder and louder, not as a tempest, with threatenings. Say rather, as the rushing of a mighty organ blast, and melodious deafening force of public opinion, from the twenty-five million windpipes of a nation all in committee of mercy, which how shall any detached body of individuals withstand? Chapter 3.7.2 Le Cabarrus How, above all, shall a poor national convention, withstand it? In this poor national convention, broken, bewildered by long terror, perturbations, and guillotinement, there is no pilot, there is not now even a Danton, who could undertake to steer you any whither, in such press of weather. The utmost a bewildered convention can do, is to veer, and trim, and try to keep itself steady, and rush, undrowned, before the wind. Needless to struggle, to fling Helm A. Lee, and make, bout ship. A bewildered convention sails not in the teeth of the wind, but is rapidly blown round again. So strong is the wind, we say, and so changed, blowing fresher and fresher, as from the sweet southwest. Your devastating northeasters, and wild tornado gusts of terror, blown utterly out. All sansculotic things are passing away, all things are becoming chaotic. Do but look at the cut of clothes. That light visible result, significant of a thousand things which are not so visible. In winter 1793, men went in red nightcaps, municipals themselves in sabots, the very citoyens had to petition against such headgear. But now in this winter 1794, where is the red nightcap? With the thing beyond the flood. Your moneyed citoyen ponders in what elegantest style he shall dress himself, whether he shall not even dress himself as the free peoples of antiquity. The more adventurous citoyen has already done it. Behold her, that beautiful adventurous citoyen, in costume of the ancient Greeks, such Greek as painter David could teach, her sweeping tresses snooted by glittering antique fillet. Bright-eyed tunic of the Greek women, her little feet naked, as in antique statues, with mere sandals, and winding strings of ribbon, defying the frost. There is such an effervescence of luxury. For your emigrant Siedevants carried not their mansions and furnitures out of the country with them. But left them standing here, and in the swift changes of property, what with money coined on the place de la Revolution, what with army furnishings, sales of emigrant domain and church lands and king's lands. And then with the Aladdin's lamp of Agio in a time of paper money, such mansions have found new occupants. Old wine, drawn from C.I. Devant bottles, descends new throats. Paris has swept herself, relight herself, salons, supers not fraternal, beam once more with suitable effulgence, very singular in color. The fair Cabris is come out of prison. Wedded to her red gloomy dis, whom they say she treats too loftily, 
fair Cabris gives the most brilliant soirees. Round her is gathered a new Republican army, of citoyens in sandals. C.I. Devants or other, what remnants whoever of the old grace survive, are rallied there. At her right hand, in this cause, labors fair Josephine the widow Beauharnais, though in straitened circumstances, intent, both of them, to blandish down the grimness of republican austerity, and recivilize mankind. Recivilize, as of old they were civilized, by witchery of the Orphic fiddle-bow, and European rhythm, by the graces, by the smiles. Thermidorian deputies are there in those soirees, editor Frerin, orator du Pupil. Barris, who has known other dances than the Carmagnole. Grim generals of the Republic are there, in enormous horse-collar neckcloth, good against saber cuts, the hair gathered all into one knot, flowing down behind, fixed with a comb. Among which latter do we not recognize, once more, the little bronze-complexioned artillery officer of Toulon, home from the Italian wars. Grim enough, of lean, almost cruel aspect, for he has been in trouble, in ill health. Also in ill favor, as a man promoted, deservingly or not, by the terrorists and Robespierre Jr. But does not Barris know him? Will not Barris speak a word for him? Yes, if at any time it will serve Barris so to do. Somewhat forlorn of fortune, for the present, stands that artillery officer, looks, with those deep earnest eyes of his, into a future as waste as the most. Taciturn. Yet with the strangest utterances in him, if you awaken him, which smite home, like light or lightning, on the whole, rather dangerous. A dissociable man. Dissociable enough. A natural terror and horror to all phantasms, being himself of the genus reality. He stands here, without work or outlook, in this forsaken manner, glances nevertheless, it would seem, at the kind glance of Josephine Beauharnais. And, for the rest, with severe countenance, with open eyes and closed lips, waits what will betide. That the balls, therefore, have a new figure this winter, we can see. Not carmignoles, rude, whirlblasts of rags, as Mercier called them, precursors of storm and destruction, no, soft ionic motions, fit for the light sandal, and antique Grecian tunic. Efflorescence of luxury has come out, for men have wealth. Nay new got wealth, and under the terror you durst not dance except in rags. Among the innumerable kinds of balls, let the hasty reader mark only this single one, the kind they call victim balls, bows a victim. The dancers, in choice costume, have all crape round the left arm, to be admitted, it needs that you be a victim, that you have lost a relative under the terror. Peace to the dead, let us dance to their memory. For in all ways one must dance. It is very remarkable, according to Mercier, under what varieties of figure this great business of dancing goes on. The women, says he, are nymphs, sultanas, sometimes Minervas, Junos, even Dianas. In light unerring gyrations they swim there. With such earnestness of purpose, with perfect silence, so absorbed are they. What is singular, continues he, the onlookers are as it were mingled with the dancers. Form as it were a circumambient element round the different contradances, yet without deranging them. It is rare, in fact, that a sultana in such circumstances experienced the smallest collision. Her pretty foot darts down, an inch from mine. She is off again, she is as a flash of light, but soon the measure recalls her to the point she set out from. Like a glittering comet she travels her eclipse, revolving on herself, as by a double effect of gravitation and attraction. Looking forward a little way, into time, the same Mercier discerns Mervalius's in flesh-colored drawers, with gold circlets, mere dancing hurries of an artificial Mahomet's paradise, much too Mahometan. Montgaillard, with his splenetic eye, notes a no less strange thing, that every fashionable citoyen you meet is in an interesting situation. Good heavens, every mere pillows and stuffing, adds the acrid man. Such, in a time of depopulation by war and guillotine, being the fashion. No further seek its merits to disclose. Behold also instead of the old grim tapters of Robespierre, what new street groups are these? Young men habited not in black shag carmignol spencer, 
but in superfine habit care or a spencer with rectangular tail appended to it, square-tailed coat, with elegant antiguilotinish specialty of collar. The hair plaited at the temples, and knotted back, long-flowing, in military wise, young men of what they call the muscadin or dandy species. Frerin, in his fondness names them jeunesse dorée, golden, or gilt youth. They have come out, these gilt youths, in a kind of resuscitated state, they were crape round the left arm, such of them as were victims. More they carry clubs loaded with lead. In an angry manner, any tapter or remnant of Jacobinism they may fall in with, shall fare the worse. They have suffered much, their friends guillotined. Their pleasures, frolics, superfine collars ruthlessly repressed, where now the base red nightcaps who did it. Fair Cabris and the army of Greek sandals smile approval. In the theatre Phaedo, young valour in square-tailed coat eyes beauty in Greek sandals, and kindles by her glances, down with Jacobinism. No Jacobin hymn or demonstration, only Thermidorian ones, shall be permitted here, we beat down Jacobinism with clubs loaded with lead. But let any one who has examined the dandy nature, how petulant it is, especially in the gregarious state, think what an element, in sacred rite of insurrection, this guilt youth was. Broils and battery, war without truce or measure. Hateful is sansculottism, as death and night. For indeed is not the dandy colotic, habilitory, by law of existence, a cloth animal, one that lives, moves, and has his being in cloth. So goes it, waltzing, bickering. Fair cabris, by Orphic witchery, struggling to recivilize mankind. Not unsuccessfully, we hear. What utmost republican grimness can resist Greek sandals, in ionic motion, the very toes covered with gold rings? By degrees the indisputablest new politeness rises, grows, with vigor. And yet, whether, even to this day, that inexpressible tone of society known under the old kings, when sin had lost all its deformity, with or without advantage to us. An airy nothing had obtained such a local habitation and establishment as she never had, be recovered. Or even, whether it be not lost beyond recovery, either way, the world must contrive to struggle on. Chapter 3.7.3 Quiberin But indeed do not these long-flowing hercules of a jeunesse dorée in semi-military costume betoken, unconsciously, another still more important tendency. The Republic, abhorrent of her guillotine, loves her army. And with cause. For, surely, if good fighting be a kind of honor, as it is, in its season, and be with the vulgar of men, even the chief kind of honor, then here is good fighting, in good season, if there ever was. These sons of the Republic, they rose, in mad wrath, to deliver her from slavery and Samaria. And have they not done it? Through maritime Alps, through gorges of Pyrenees, through low countries, northward along the Rhine Valley, far as Samaria hurled back from the sacred motherland. Fierce as fire, they have carried her tricolor over the faces of all her enemies. Over scarped heights, over cannon batteries, down, as with the Venger, into the dead deep sea. She has, eleven hundred thousand fighters on foot, this republic, at one particular moment she had, or supposed she had, seventeen hundred thousand. Like a ring of lightning, they, volleying in C-A-I-R-A-N-G, begirdle her from shore to shore. Cimmerian coalition of despots recoils, smitten with astonishment, and strange pangs. Such a fire is in these Gaelic Republican men, high-blazing. Which no coalition can withstand. Not scutcheons, with four degrees of nobility, but C.I. Devant sergeants, who have had to clutch generalship out of the cannon's throat, a Pichigrew, a Jordan, a Hoche, lead them on. They have bread, they have iron. With bread and iron you can get to China. See Pichigrew soldiers, this hard winter, in their looped and windowed destitution, in their straw rope shoes and cloaks of base mat, how they overrun Holland, like a demon host, the ice having bridged all waters. And rush shouting from victory to victory. Ships in the Texel are taken by hussars on horseback, fled is York, fled is the Stadtholder, glad to escape to England, and leave Holland to fraternize. Such a Gaelic fire, we say, 
blazes in this people, like the conflagration of grass and dry jungle, which no mortal can withstand, for the moment. And even so it will blaze and run, scorching all things. And, from Cadiz to Archangel, mad sansculatism, drilled now into soldiership, led on by some, armed soldier of democracy, say, that monosyllabic artillery officer, will set its foot cruelly on the necks of its enemies. And its shouting and their shrieking shall fill the world, rash coalized kings, such a fire have ye kindled, yourselves fireless, your fighters animated only by drill sergeants, mess room moralities, and the drummer's cat. However, it is begun, and will not end, not for a matter of twenty years. So long, this Gaelic fire, through its successive changes of color and character, will blaze over the face of Europe and afflict the scorch all men, till it provoke all men. Till it kindle another kind of fire, the Teutonic kind, namely, and be swallowed up, so to speak, in a day. For there is a fire comparable to the burning of dry jungle and grass. Most sudden, high blazing, and another fire which we liken to the burning of coal, or even of anthracite coal, difficult to kindle, but then which nothing will put out. The ready Gaelic fire, we can remark further, and remark not in Pitchagris only, but in innumerable Voltaires, Racines, Laplaces, no less. For a man, whether he fight, or sing, or think, will remain the same unity of a man, is admirable for roasting eggs, in every conceivable sense. The Teutonic anthracite again, as we see in Luther's, Leibniz's, Shakespeare's, is preferable for smelting metals. How happy is our Europe that has both kinds! But be this as it may, the Republic is clearly triumphing. In the spring of the year Ment's town again sees itself besieged, will again change master, did not Merlin the Thionviller, with wild beard and look, say it was not for the last time they saw him there? The elector of Mentz circulates among his brother potentates this pertinent query, were it not advisable to treat of peace? Yes. Answers many an elector from the bottom of his heart. But, on the other hand, Austria hesitates. Finally refuses, being subsidied by Pitt. As to Pitt, whoever hesitate, he, suspending his habeas corpus, suspending his cash payments, stands inflexible, spite of foreign reverses. Spite of domestic obstacles, of Scotch national conventions and English friends of the people, whom he is obliged to arraign, to hang, or even to see acquitted with jubilee, a lean inflexible man. The Majesty of Spain, as we predicted, makes peace. Also the Majesty of Prussia, and there is a Treaty of Bale. Treaty with black anarchists and regicides. Alas, what help! You cannot hang this anarchy, it is like to hang you, you must needs treat with it. Likewise, General Hoche has even succeeded in pacificating La Vade. Rogue Rossignol and his infernal columns have vanished, by firmness and justice, by sagacity and industry, General Hoche has done it. Taking movable columns, not infernal. Girdling in the country, pardoning the submissive, cutting down the resistive, limb after limb of the revolt is brought under. La Roca Jacqueline, last of our nobles, fell in battle, Stofflet himself makes terms. Georges Cadudel is back to Brittany, among his chewins, the frightful gangrene of La Vade seems veritably extirpated. It has cost, as they reckon in round numbers, the lives of a hundred thousand fellow mortals. With noyadings, conflagratings by infernal column, which defy arithmetic. This is the La Vade War. Nay in few months, it does burst up once more, but once only, blown upon by Pitt, by our C.I. Devant Puisse of Calvados, and others. In the month of July 1795, English ships will ride in Quiberon roads. There will be debarkation of chivalrous C.I. Devants, of volunteer prisoners of war, eager to desert, of firearms, proclamations, clothes chests, royalists and specie. Whereupon also, on the Republican side, there will be rapid stand to arms, with ambuscade marchings by Quiberon Beach, at midnight, storming of Fort Penthevra, war thunder mingling with the roar of the nightly main. And such a morning light as has seldom dawned, debarkation hurled back into its boats, or into the devouring billows, with wreck and wail. In one word, a C.I. Devant Puisse as totally ineffectual here as he was in Calvados, 
when he rode from Vernon Castle without boots. Again, therefore, it has cost the lives of many a brave man. Among whom the whole world laments the brave son of Sombruel. Ill-fated family. The father and younger son went to the guillotine, the heroic daughter languishes, reduced to want, hides her woes from history, the elder son perishes here. Shot by military tribunal as an emigrant, Hosh himself cannot save him. If all wars, civil and other, are misunderstandings, what a thing must right understanding be. Chapter 3.7.4 Lion Not Dead The convention, born on the tide of fortune towards foreign victory, and driven by the strong wind of public opinion towards clemency in luxury, is rushing fast, all skill of pilotage is needed, and more than all, in such a velocity. Curious to see, how we veer and whirl, yet must ever whirl round again, and scud before the wind. If, on the one hand, we readmit the protesting 73, we, on the other hand, agree to consummate the apotheosis of Marat. Lift his body from the Cordelier's church, and transport it to the pantheon of great men, flinging out Mirabeau to make room for him. To no purpose, so strong blows public opinion. A gilt youthhood, in plated hair tresses, tears down his busts from the theatre Phaedo, tramples them underfoot, scatters them, with vociferation into the cesspool of Montmartre. Swept is his chapel from the place du Carousel. The cesspool of Montmartre will receive his very dust. Shorter godhood had no divine man. Some four months in this pantheon, temple of all the immortals, then to the cesspool, grand cloaca of Paris and the world. His busts at one time amounted to four thousand. Between temple of all the immortals and cloaca of the world, how are poor human creatures world? Furthermore the question arises, when will the constitution of 93, of 1793, come into action? Consider it head surmise, in all privacy, that the constitution of 93 will never come into action. Let them busy themselves to get ready a better. Or, again, where now are the Jacobins? Childless, most decrepit, as we saw, sat the mighty mother. Gnashing not teeth, but empty gums, against a traitorous Thermidorian convention and the current of things. Twice were Bill Laud, Collot and company accused in convention, by a Lecointer, by a Legendre. And the second time, it was not voted calumnious. Bill Laud from the Jacobin Tribune says, The lion is not dead, he is only sleeping. They ask him in convention, what he means by the awakening of the lion. And bickerings, of an extensive sort, arose in the Palais Galate between Tapters and the gilt youthhood, cries of, down with the Jacobins, the Jacobins, Koken meaning scoundrel. The tribune in mid-air gave battle sound. Answered only by silence and uncertain gasps. Talk was, in government committees, of, suspending, the Jacobin sessions. Hark, there. It is in all hallow time, or on the hallow eve itself, month C.I. of Aunt November, year once named of grace 1794, sad eve for Jacobinism, volley of stones dashing through our windows, with jingle and execration. The female Jacobins, fame tricoterses with knitting needles, take flight, are met at the doors by a gilt youthhood and mob of four thousand persons, are hooted, flouted, hustled, fustigated, in a scandalous manner, Cotillon's retresses. And vanish in mere hysterics. Sally out ye male Jacobins. The male Jacobins sally out, but only to battle, disaster and confusion. So that armed authority has to intervene, and again on the morrow to intervene. And suspend the Jacobin sessions forever and a day. Gone are the Jacobins, into invisibility, in a storm of laughter and howls. Their place is made a normal school, the first of the kind seen, it then vanishes into a market of Thermidor Ninth. Into a market of Saint Honore, where is now peaceable chaffering for poultry and greens. The solemn temples, the great globe itself, the baseless fabric. Are not we such stuff, we in this world of ours, as dreams are made of? Maximum being abrogated, trade was to take its own free course. Alas, trade, shackled, topsy turbid in the way we saw, and now suddenly let go again, can for the present take no course at all, 
but only reel and stagger. There is, so to speak, no trade whatever for the time being. Assignats, long sinking, emitted in such quantities, sink now with an alacrity beyond parallel. Combien, said one, to a hackney coachman, what fare? Six thousand livres, answered he, some three hundred pounds sterling, in paper money. Pressure of maximum withdrawn, the things it compressed likewise withdraw. Two ounces of bread per day, in the modicum allotted, wide waving, doleful are the baker's queues, farmers' houses are become pawnbrokers' shops. One can imagine, in these circumstances, with what humor sansculatism growled in its throat, La Cabras, beheld C. Idevance return dancing, the thermidor effulgence of recivilization, and balls in flesh colored drawers. Greek tunics and sandals. Hosts of muscadins parading, with their clubs loaded with lead, and we here, cast out, abhorred, picking offals from the street, agitating in baker's queue for our two ounces of bread. Will the Jacobin lion, which they say is meeting secretly, at the Arcavesh, in bonnet rouge with loaded pistols, not awaken? Seemingly not. Our call lot, our bill laud, Berreir, Vadier, in these last days of March 1795, are found worthy of deportation, of banishment beyond seas, and shall, for the present, be trundled off to the castle of Ham. The lion is dead, or writhing in death throes. Behold, accordingly, on the day they call twelfth of germinal, which is also called first of April, not a lucky day, how lively are these streets of Paris once more. Floods of hungry women, of squalid hungry men. Ejaculating, bread, bread and the constitution of ninety-three. Paris has risen, once again, like the ocean tide, is flowing towards the Tilleries, for bread and a constitution. Tilleries sentries do their best. But it serves not, the ocean tide sweeps them away, inundates the convention hall itself. Howling, bread, and the constitution. Unhappy senators, unhappy people, there is yet, after all toils and broils, no bread, no constitution. Du pain, patent de longs discours, bread, not bursts of parliamentary eloquence, so wailed the menads of Maillard, five years ago and more, so wail ye to this hour. The convention, with unalterable countenance, with what thought one knows not, keeps its seat in this waste howling chaos, rings its storm bell from the pavilion of unity. Section Le Pelletier, old fee as St. Thomas, who are of the money-changing species, these and guilt youthhood fly to the rescue, sweep chaos forth again, with leveled bayonets. Paris is declared, in a state of siege. Pichigrew, conqueror of Holland, who happens to be here, is named commandant, till the disturbance end. He, in one day, so to speak, ends it. He accomplishes the transfer of Bill Laud, Collot and Company. Dissipating all opposition, by two cannon shots, blank cannon shots, and the terror of his name, and thereupon announcing, with a laconicism which should be imitated, representatives, your decrees are executed, lays down his commandantship. This revolt of germinal, therefore, has passed, like a vain cry. The prisoners rest safe in Ham, waiting for ships, some nine hundred chief terrorists of Paris are disarmed. Sansculottism, swept forth with bayonets, has vanished, with its misery, to the bottom of Saint Antoine and Saint Marceau. Time was when Usher Maillard with menads could alter the course of legislation, but that time is not. Legislation seems to have got bayonets, Section Le Pelletier takes its firelock, not for us. We retire to our dark dens, our cry of hunger is called a plot of pit, the saloons glitter, the flesh colored drawers gyrate as before. It was for the cabris then, and her muscadins and money changers, that we fought. It was for balls in flesh colored drawers that we took feudalism by the beard, and did, and dared, shedding our blood like water. Expressive silence, muse thou their praise. Chapter 3.7.V Lion sprawling its last. Representative Carrier went to the guillotine, in December last, protesting that he acted by orders. The Revolutionary Tribunal, after all it has devoured, has now only, as anarchic things do, to devour itself. In the early days of May, men see a remarkable thing, 
Fukier Tinville pleading at the bar once his own. He and his chief jurymen, Leroy August 10, juryman Violet, a batch of sixteen, pleading hard, protesting that they acted by orders, but pleading in vain. Thus men break the axe with which they have done hateful things. The axe itself having grown hateful. For the rest, Fukier died hard enough, where are thy batches, howled the people. Hungry Kanael, asked Fukier, is thy bread cheaper, wanting them? Remarkable Fukier. Once but as other attorneys and law beagles, which hunt ravenous on this earth, a well-known faces of human nature, and now thou art and remainest the most remarkable attorney that ever lived and hunted in the upper air. For, in this terrestrial course of time, there was to be an avatar of attorneyism, the heavens had said, let there be an incarnation, not divine, of the venatory attorney spirit which keeps its eye on the bond only, and lo, this was it. And they have attorneyed it in its turn. Vanish, then, thou rat-eyed incarnation of attorneyism, who at bottom wert but as other attorneys, and two hungry sons of Adam. Juryman Violet had striven hard for life, and published, from his prison, an ingenious book, not unknown to us, but it would not stead, he also had to vanish. And this his book of the secret causes of Thermidor, full of lies, with particles of truth in it undiscoverable otherwise, is all that remains of him. Revolutionary tribunal has done, but vengeance has not done. Representative Levin, after long struggling, is handed over to the ordinary law courts, and by them guillotined. Nay, at Lyons and elsewhere, resuscitated moderatism, in its vengeance, will not wait the slow process of law. But bursts into the prisons, sets fire to the prisons, burns some threescore imprisoned Jacobins to dire death, or chokes them with the smoke of straw. There go vengeful truculent, companies of Jesus, companies of the sun. Slaying Jacobinism wherever they meet with it, flinging it into the Rhone stream, which, once more, bears seaward a horrid cargo. Whereupon, at Toulon, Jacobinism rises in revolt, and is like to hang the national representatives. With such action and reaction, is not a poor national convention hard bested? It is like the settlement of winds and waters, of seas long tornado beaten, and goes on with jumble and with jangle. Now flung aloft, now sunk in trough of the sea, your vessel of the Republic has need of all pilotage and more. What parliament that ever sat under the moon had such a series of destinies, as this National Convention of France? It came together to make the Constitution. And instead of that, it has had to make nothing but destruction and confusion, to burn up Catholicisms, aristocratisms, to worship reason and dig saltpetry, to fight titanically with itself and with the whole world. A convention decimated by the guillotine, above the tenth man has bowed his neck to the axe. Which has seen Carmignols danced before it, and patriotic strophes sung amid church spoils, the wounded of the tenth of August defile in hand barrows. And, in the pandemonial midnight, Egalitaeus dames in tricolor drink lemonade, and spectrum of sighs mount, saying, Death sans phrase. A convention which has effervesced, and which has congealed. Which has been red with rage, and also pale with rage, sitting with pistols in its pocket, drawing sword, in a moment of effervescence now storming to the four winds, through a Danton voice, Awake, O France, and smite the tyrants. Now frozen mute under its Robespierre, and answering his dirge voice by a dubious gasp. Assassinated, decimated, stabbed at, shot at, in baths, on streets and staircases, which has been the nucleus of chaos. Has it not heard the chimes at midnight? It has deliberated, beset by a hundred thousand armed men with artillery furnaces and provision carts. It has been betoxined, bestormed, overflooded by black deluges of sansculottism, and has heard the shrill cry, bread and soap. For, as we say, it's the nucleus of chaos, it sat as the center of sansculottism, and had spread its pavilion on the waste deep, where is neither path nor landmark, neither bottom nor shore. In intrinsic valor, ingenuity, fidelity, and general force and manhood, it has perhaps not far surpassed the average of parliaments, but in frankness of purpose, in singularity of position, it seeks its fellow. One other sansculotic submersion, or at most two, and this wearied vessel of a convention reaches land. 
Revolt of Germinal Twelfth ended as a vain cry, moribund sansculottism was swept back into invisibility. There it has lain moaning, these six weeks, moaning, and also scheming. Jacobins disarmed, flung forth from their tribune in mid-air, must needs try to help themselves, in secret conclave underground. Lo, therefore, on the first day of the month prairial, 20th of May, 1795, sound of the general once more, beating sharp, ran tan, to arms, to arms. Sansculottism has risen, yet again, from its death lair, waste wild flowing, as the unfruitful sea. Saint Antoine is a foot, bread and the constitution of ninety-three, so sounds it, so stands it written with chalk on the hats of men. They have their pikes, their firelocks, paper of grievances, standards. Printed proclamation, drawn up in quite official manner, considering this, and also considering that, they, a much enduring sovereign people, are in insurrection, will have bread in the constitution of ninety-three. And so the barriers are seized, and the general beats, and toxins discourse discord. Black deluges overflow the tilleries. Spite of sentries, the sanctuary itself is invaded, enter, to our order of the day, a torrent of disheveled women, wailing, bread. Bread. President may well cover himself, and have his own toxin rung in, the pavilion of unity. The ship of the state again labors and leaks, overwashed, near to swamping, with unfruitful brine. What a day, once more. Women are driven out, men storm irresistibly in, choke all corridors, thunder at all gates. Deputies, putting forth head, obtist, conjure, Saint Antoine rages, bread and constitution. Report has risen that the convention is assassinating the women, crushing and rushing, clangor and furor. The oak doors have become as oak tambourines, sounding under the axe of Saint Antoine, plasterwork crackles, woodwork booms and jingles, door starts up. Bursts in Saint Antoine with frenzy and vociferation, rag standards, printed proclamation, drum music, astonishment to eye and ear. Gendarmes, loyal sectioners charge through the other door, they are recharged. Musketry exploding, Saint Antoine cannot be expelled. Optisting deputies optist vainly, respect the president, approach not the president. Deputy Farad, stretching out his hands, bearing his bosom scarred in the Spanish wars, optists vainly, threatens and resists vainly. Rebellious deputy of the sovereign, if thou have fought, have not we too. We have no bread, no constitution. They wrench poor Farad, they tumble him, trample him, wrath waxing to see itself work, they drag him into the corridor, dead or near it, sever his head, and fix it on a pike. Ah, did an unexampled convention want this variety of destiny too, then? Farad's bloody head goes on a pike. Such a game has begun, Paris and the earth may wait how it will end. And so it billows free though all corridors, within, and without, far as the eye reaches, nothing but bedlam, and the great deep broken loose. President Boise d'Anglas sits like a rock, the rest of the convention is floated to the upper benches, sectioners and gendarmes still ranking there to form a kind of wall for them. An insurrection rages, rolls its drums. We'll read its paper of grievances, we'll have this decreed, we'll have that. Covered sits President Boise, unyielding, like a rock in the beating of seas. They menace him, level muskets at him, he yields not. They hold up Farad's bloody head to him, with grave stern air he bows to it, and yields not. And the paper of grievances cannot get itself read for uproar, and the drums roll, and the throats bawl. And insurrection, like sphere music, is inaudible for very noise, decree us this, decree us that. One man we discern bawling, for the space of an hour at all intervals, J.E. demand el arrestation de coquins et de lachas. Really one of the most comprehensive petitions ever put up, which indeed, to this hour, includes all that you can reasonably ask Constitution of the Year One, Rottenborough, Ballot Box. Or other miraculous political Ark of the Covenant to do for you to the end of the world. I also demand arrestment of the knaves and dastards, and nothing more whatever. National representation, deluged with black sans glides out, for help elsewhere, for safety elsewhere, 
here is no help. About four in the afternoon, there remain hardly more than some sixty members, mere friends, or even secret leaders, a remnant of the mountain crest, held in silence by Thermidorian thraldom. Now is the time for them. Now or never let them descend, and speak. They descend, these sixty, invited by Sanskilatism, Ram of the New Calendar, Rule of the Sacred File, Gujan, Dukwasnoi, Subrani, and the rest. Glad Sanskilatism forms a ring for them. Ram takes the president's chair, they begin resolving and decreeing. Fast enough now comes decree after decree, in alternate brief strains, or strophe and antistrophe, what will cheapen bread, what will awaken the dormant lion. And at every new decree, Sanskilatism shouts, decreed, decreed, and rolls its drums. Fast enough, the work of months and hours, when C, a figure enters, whom in the lamplight we recognize to be Legendre, and utters words, fit to be hissed out. And then C, section lapelladier or other musket in section enters, and gilt youth, with leveled bayonets, countenances screwed to the sticking place. Tramp, tramp, with bayonets gleaming in the lamplight, what can one do, worn down with long riot, grown heartless, dark, hungry, but roll back, but rush back, and escape who can. The very windows need to be thrown up, that sansculottism may escape fast enough. Money changer sections and gilt youth sweep them forth, with steel besom, far into the depths of Saint Antoine. Triumph once more. The decrees of that sixty are not so much as rescinded, they are declared null and non-extant. Ram, Rule, Pujan and the ringleaders, some thirteen in all, are decreed accused. Permanent session ends at three in the morning. Sansculottism, once more flung resupine, lies sprawling, sprawling its last. Such was the first of Prairial, May 20, 1795. Second and third of Prairial, during which Sansculottism still sprawled, and unexpectedly rang its toxin, and assembled in arms, availed Sansculottism nothing. What though with our wrongs and rules, accused but not yet arrested, we make a new, true national convention, of our own, over in the East, and put the others out of law. What though we rank in arms and march? Armed force and musket in sections, some thirty thousand men, environ that old false convention, we can but bully one another, bandying nicknames, musketins, against blood drinkers, buvers de sang. Farad's assassin, taken with the red hand, and sentenced, and now near to guillotine and placed to grieve, is retaken, is carried back into Saint Antoine, to no purpose. Convention sectionaries and guilt youth come, according to decree, to seek him. Nay to disarm Saint Antoine. And they do disarm it, by rolling of cannon, by springing upon enemies' cannon, by military audacity, and terror of the law. Saint Antoine surrenders its arms, Santerre even advising it, anxious for life and brewhouse. Farad's assassin flings himself from a high roof, and all is lost. Discerning which things, old rule shot a pistol through his old white head, dashed his life in pieces, as he had done the sacred file of Reims. Ram, Gujan, and the others stand ranked before a swiftly appointed, swift military tribunal. Hearing the sentence, Gujan drew a knife, struck it into his breast, passed it to his neighbor Ram, and fell dead. Ram did the like. And another all but did it, Roman death rushing on there, as an electric chain, before your bailiffs could intervene. The guillotine had the rest. They were the ultimi Romano Rum. Bill Laud, Collot and company are now ordered to be tried for life. But are found to be already off, shipped for Cinemari, and the hot mud of Suriname. There let Bill Laud surround himself with flocks of tame parrots, Collot take the yellow fever, and drinking a whole bottle of brandy, burn up his entrails. Sansculottism sprawls no more. The dormant lion has become a dead one, and now, as we see, any hoof may smite him. Chapter 3.7.VI Grilled Herrings So dies Sansculottism, the body of Sansculottism, or is changed. Its ragged Pythian Carmignol dance has transformed itself into a Pyrrhic, into a dance of cabarrus balls. Sansculottism is dead, extinguished by new isms of that kind, 
which were its own natural progeny. And is buried, we may say, with such deafening jubilation and disharmony of funeral knell on their part, that only after some half-century or so does one begin to learn clearly why it ever was alive. And yet a meaning lay in it, Sansculottism verily was alive, a new birth of time, nay it still lives, and is not dead, but changed. The soul of it still lives. Still works far and wide, through one bodily shape into another less amorphous, as is the way of cunning time with his new births, till, in some perfected shape, it embraced the whole circuit of the world. For the wise man may now everywhere discern that he must found on his manhood, not on the garnitures of his manhood. He who, in these epochs of our Europe, founds on garnitures, formulas, culottisms of what sort soever, is founding on old cloth and sheepskin, and cannot endure. But as for the body of sansculottism, that is dead and buried, and, one hopes, need not reappear, in primary amorphous shape, for another thousand years. It was the frightfulest thing ever born of time. One of the frightfulest. This convention, now grown anti-Jacobin, did, with an eye to justify and fortify itself, publish lists of what the reign of terror had perpetrated, lists of persons guillotined. The lists, cries splenetic Abbe Montgaillard, were not complete. They contain the names of, how many persons thinks the reader, two thousand all but a few. There were above four thousand, cries Montgaillard, so many were guillotined, fusillade, moyade, done to dire death, of whom nine hundred were women. It is a horrible sum of human lives, M. L. Abbe, some ten times as many shot rightly on a field of battle, and one might have had his glorious victory with Te Deum. It is not far from the two hundredth part of what perished in the entire Seven Years' War. By which Seven Years' War, did not the great Fritz wrench Silesia from the great Teresa? And a Pompadour, stung by epigrams, satisfy herself that she could not be an Agnes Sorrel? The head of man is a strange vacant sounding shell, M. L. Abbe, and studies Cocker to small purpose. But what if history, somewhere on this planet, were to hear of a nation, the third soul of whom had not for thirty weeks each year as many third-rate potatoes as would sustain him? History, in that case, feels bound to consider that starvation is starvation. That starvation from age to age presupposes much, history ventures to assert that the French sansculotte of 93, who, roused from long death sleep, could rush at once to the frontiers. And die fighting for an immortal hope and faith of deliverance for him and his, was but the second miserablest of men. The Irish sans potato, had he not senses then, nay a soul. In his frozen darkness, it was bitter for him to die famishing, bitter to see his children famish. It was bitter for him to be a beggar, a liar and a knave. Nay, if that dreary Greenland wind of benighted want, perennial from sire to son, had frozen him into a kind of torpor and numb callosity, so that he saw not, felt not, was this, for a creature with a soul in it, some assuagement. Or the cruelest wretchedness of all. Such things were, such things are, and they go on in silence peaceably, and sansculottisms follow them. History, looking back over this France through long times, back to Turgot's time for instance, when dumb drudgery staggered up to its king's palace, and in wide expanse of sallow faces, squalor and winged raggedness, presented hieroglyphically its petition of grievances. And for answer got hanged on a new gallows forty feet high, confesses mournfully that there is no period to be met with, in which the general twenty-five millions of France suffered less than in this period which they name reign of terror. But it was not the dumb millions that suffered here, it was the speaking thousands, and hundreds, and units, who shrieked and published, and made the world ring with their wail, as they could and should, that is the grand peculiarity. The frightfulest births of time are never the loud-speaking ones, for these soon die, they are the silent ones, which can live from century to century. Anarchy, hateful as death, is abhorrent to the whole nature of man, and must itself soon die. Wherefore let all men know what of depth and of height is still revealed in man. And, with fear and wonder, with just sympathy and just antipathy, with clear eye and open heart, contemplate it and appropriate it. And draw innumerable inferences from it. This inference, for example, among the first, 
that if the gods of this lower world will sit on their glittering thrones, indolent as Epicurus gods, with the living chaos of ignorance and hunger weltering uncared for at their feet. And smooth parasites preaching, peace, peace, when there is no peace, then the dark chaos, it would seem, will rise. Has risen, and O oh heavens! Has it not tanned their skins into breeches for itself? That there be no second sansculottism in our earth for a thousand years, let us understand well what the first was, and let rich and poor of us go and do otherwise. But to our tale. The musketon sections greatly rejoice, cabarrous balls gyrate, the well-nigh insoluble problem republic without anarchy, have we not solved it? Law of fraternity or death is gone, chimerical obtain who need has become practical hold who have. To anarchic republic of the poverties there has succeeded orderly republic of the luxuries, which will continue as long as it can. On the Ponto change, on the place to grieve, in long sheds, Mercier, in these summer evenings, saw working men at their repast. One's allotment of daily bread has sunk to an ounce and a half. Plates containing each three grilled herrings, sprinkled with shorn onions, wetted with a little vinegar. To this add some morsel of boiled prunes, and lentils swimming in a clear sauce, at these frugal tables, the cook's gridiron hissing nearby, and the pot simmering on a fire between two stones, I have seen them ranged by the hundred. Consuming, without bread, their scant messes, far too moderate for the keenness of their appetite, and the extent of their stomach. Sane water, rushing plenteous by, will supply the deficiency. O man of toil, thy struggling and thy daring, these six long years of insurrection and tribulation, thou hast profited nothing by it, then? Thou consumest thy herring and water, in the blessed gold-red evening. O oh, why was the earth so beautiful, becrimsoned with dawn and twilight, if man's dealings with man were to make it a veil of scarcity, of tears, not even soft tears? Destroying of Bastilles, discomfiting of Brunswicks, fronting of principalities and powers, of earth and Tophet, all that thou hast dared and endured, it was for a republic of the cabarrous saloons. Patience. Thou must have patience, the end is not yet. Chapter 3.7.7 .7. The Whiff of Grapeshot In fact, what can be more natural, one may say inevitable, as a post sansculotic transitionary state, than even this. Confused wreck of a republic of the poverties, which ended in reign of terror, is arranging itself into such composure as it can. Evangel of Jean-Jacques, and most other evangels, becoming incredible, what is there for it but return to the old evangel of mammon? Contrat social is true or untrue, brotherhood is brotherhood or death. But money always will buy money's worth, in the wreck of human dubitations, this remains indubitable, that pleasure is pleasant. Aristocracy of feudal parchment has passed away with a mighty rushing. And now, by a natural course, we arrive at aristocracy of the money bag. It is the course through which all European societies are at this hour traveling. Apparently a still baser sort of aristocracy. An infinitely baser, the basest yet known. In which however there is this advantage, that, like anarchy itself, it cannot continue. Hast thou considered how thought is stronger than artillery parks, and, were it fifty years after death and martyrdom, or were it two thousand years, rights and unrights acts of parliament, removes mountains, models the world like soft clay. Also how the beginning of all thought, worth the name, is love, and the wise head never yet was, without first the generous heart. The heavens cease not their bounty, they send us generous hearts into every generation. And now what generous heart can pretend to itself, or be hoodwinked into believing, that loyalty to the money bag is a noble loyalty? Mammon, cries the generous heart out of all ages and countries, is the basest of known gods, even of known devils. In him what glory is there, that ye should worship him? No glory discernible, not even terror, at best, detestability, ill-matched with despicability. Generous hearts, discerning, on this hand, widespread wretchedness, dark without and within, moistening its ounce and half of bread with tears. And on that hand, mere balls in flesh-colored drawers, and inane or foul glitter of such sort, cannot but ejaculate, cannot but announce, 
too much, O divine mammon, somewhat too much. The voice of these, once announcing itself, carries fiat and parit in it, for all things here below. Meanwhile, we will hate anarchy as death, which it is, and the things worse than anarchy shall be hated more. Surely peace alone is fruitful. Anarchy is destruction, a burning up, say, of shams and insupportabilities, but which leaves vacancy behind. Know this also, that out of a world of unwise nothing but an unwisdom can be made. Arrange it, constitution build it, sift it through ballot boxes as thou wilt, it is and remains an unwisdom, the new prey of new quacks and unclean things, the latter end of it slightly better than the beginning. Who can bring a wise thing out of men unwise? Not one. And so vacancy and general abolition having come for this France, what can anarchy do more? Let there be order, were it under the soldier's sword. Let there be peace, that the bounty of the heavens be not spilt, that what of wisdom they do send us bring fruit in its season. It remains to be seen how the quellers of Sansculottism were themselves quelled, and sacred right of insurrection was blown away by gunpowder, wherewith this singular eventful history called French Revolution ends. The convention, driven such a course by wild wind, wild tide, and steerage and non-steerage, these three years, has become weary of its own existence, sees all men weary of it, and wishes heartily to finish. To the last, it has to strive with contradictions, it is now getting fast ready with a constitution, yet knows no peace. Size, we say, is making the constitution once more, has as good as made it. Warned by experience, the great architect alters much, admits much. Distinction of active and passive citizen, that is, money qualification for electors, nay two chambers, council of ancients, as well as, council of five hundred. To that conclusion have we come. In a like spirit, eschewing that fatal self-denying ordinance of your old constituents, we enact not only that actual convention members are re-eligible, but that two-thirds of them must be re-elected. The active citizen electors shall for this time have free choice of only one-third of their national assembly. Such enactment, of two-thirds to be re-elected, we append to our constitution. We submit our constitution to the townships of France, and say, accept both, or reject both. Unsavory as this appendix may be, the townships, by overwhelming majority, accept and ratify. With directory of five. With two good chambers, double majority of them nominated by ourselves, one hopes this constitution may prove final. March it will, for the legs of it, the re-elected two-thirds, are already there, able to march. Size looks at his paper fabric with just pride. But now see how the contumacious sections, lapelladier foremost, kick against the pricks. Is it not manifest infraction of one's elective franchise, rights of man, and sovereignty of the people, this appendix of re-electing your two-thirds? Greedy tyrants who would perpetuate yourselves. For the truth is, victory over Saint Antoine, and long right of insurrection, has spoiled these men. Nay spoiled all men. Consider too how each man was free to hope what he liked. And now there is to be no hope, there is to be fruition, fruition of this. In men spoiled by long right of insurrection, what confused ferments will rise, tongues once begun wagging. Journalists declaim, your lacretelles, la harps, orators spout. There is royalism traceable in it, and Jacobinism. On the west frontier, in deep secrecy, Pichigru, durst he trust his army, is treating with Condé, in these sections, there spout wolves in sheep's clothing, masked emigrants and royalists. All men, as we say, had hoped, each that the election would do something for his own side, and now there is no election, or only the third of one. Black is united with white against this clause of the two-thirds. All the unruly of France, who see their trade thereby near ending. Section Le Pelletier, after addresses enough, finds that such clause is a manifest infraction, that it, Le Pelletier, for one, will simply not conform thereto. And invites all other free sections to join it, in central committee, in resistance to oppression. The sections join it, nearly all, strong with their forty thousand fighting men. The convention therefore may look to itself. Le Pelletier, 
on this twelfth day of Vendemiaire, 4th of October, 1795, is sitting in open contravention, in its convent of Fias St. Thomas, Rue Vivian, with guns primed. The convention has some five thousand regular troops at hand. Generals in abundance, and a fifteen hundred of miscellaneous persecuted ultra-Jacobins, whom in this crisis it has hastily got together and armed, under the title Patriots of 89. Strong in law, it sends its General Manoe to disarm Le Pelletier. General Manoe marches accordingly, with due summons and demonstration, with no result. General Manoe, about eight in the evening, finds that he is standing ranked in the Rue Vivian, emitting vain summonses, with primed guns pointed out of every window at him, and that he cannot disarm Le Pelletier. He has to return, with whole skin, but without success, and be thrown into arrest as a traitor. Whereupon the whole forty thousand join this Le Pelletier which cannot be vanquished, to what hand shall a quaking convention now turn? Our poor convention, after such voyaging, just entering harbour, so to speak, has struck on the bar. And labours there frightfully, with breakers roaring round it, forty thousand of them, like to wash it, and its size cargo and the whole future of France, into the deep. Yet one last time, it struggles, ready to perish. Some call for Barris to be made commandant, he conquered in Thermidor. Some, what is more to the purpose, bethink them of the citizen Bonaparte, unemployed artillery officer, who took Toulon. A man of head, a man of action, Barris is named Commandant's cloak, this young artillery officer is named Commandant. He was in the gallery at the moment, and heard it. He withdrew, some half hour, to consider with himself, after a half hour of grim compressed considering, to be or not to be, he answers ye. Yeah. And now, a man of head being at the center of it, the whole matter gets vital. Swift, to camp of Sablins. To secure the artillery, there are not twenty men guarding it. A swift adjutant, Marat is the name of him, gallops, gets thither some minutes within time, for Le Pelletier was also on march that way, the cannon are ours. And now beset this post, and beset that. Rapid and firm, at wicket of the Louvre, in Col de Sac Dauphin, in Rue Saint Honore, from Pont Neuf all along the North Keys, southward to Pont Cide de Vent Royal, rank round the sanctuary of the Tilleries, a ring of steel discipline. Let every gunner have his match burning, and all men stand to their arms. Thus there is permanent session through night, and thus at sunrise of the morrow, there is seen sacred insurrection once again, vessel of state laboring on the bar. And tumultuous sea all round her, beating general, arming and sounding, not ringing toxin, for we have left no toxin but our own in the pavilion of unity. It is an imminence of shipwreck, for the whole world to gaze at. Frightfully she labors, that poor ship, within cable length of port, huge peril for her. However, she has a man at the helm. Insurgent messages, received, and not received, messenger admitted blindfolded. Council and counter counsel, the poor ship labors, Vendemir 13th, year 4, curious enough, of all days, it is the fifth day of October, anniversary of that Minad march, six years ago, by sacred right of insurrection we are got thus far. Le Pelletier has seized the church of Saint Roch, has seized the Pont Neuf, our piquette there retreating without fire. Stray shots fall from Le Pelletier, rattle down on the very tillery staircase. On the other hand, women advance dishevelled, shrieking, peace, Le Pelletier behind them waving its hat in sign that we shall fraternize. Steady. The artillery officer is steady as bronze, can be quick as lightning. He sends eight hundred muskets with ball cartridges to the convention itself, honorable members shall act with these in case of extremity, whereat they look grave enough. Four of the afternoon is struck. Le Pelletier, making nothing by messengers, by fraternity or hat-waving, bursts out, along the southern quai Voltaire, along streets and passages, treble quick, in huge veritable onslaught. Whereupon, thou bronze artillery officer. Fire. Say the bronze lips. Roar and again roar, continual, volcano-like, goes his great gun, in the cul de sac dauphin against the church of Saint Roch, go his great guns on the Pont Royal, go all his great guns. Blow to air some two hundred men, 
mainly about the Church of St. Rock. Le Pelletier cannot stand such horseplay, no sectioner can stand it, the forty thousand yield on all sides, scour towards covert. Some hundred or so of them gathered both Theatre de la Republic, but, says he, a few shells dislodged them. It was all finished at six. The ship is over the bar, then, free she bounds shoreward, amid shouting and vivats. Citoyen Bonaparte is, named General of the Interior, by acclamation, quelled sections have to disarm in such humor as they may, sacred right of insurrection is gone forever. The size constitution can disembark itself, and begin marching. The miraculous convention ship has got to land, and is there, shall we figuratively say, changed, as epic ships are wont, into a kind of sea nymph, never to sail more, to roam the waste azure, a miracle in history. It is false, says Napoleon, that we fired first with blank charge, it had been a waste of life to do that. Most false, the firing was with sharp and sharpest shot, to all men it was plain that here was no sport. The rabbits and plinths of St. Rock Church show splintered by it, to this hour. Singular, in old Broy's time, six years ago, this whiff of grape shot was promised, but it could not be given then, could not have profited then. Now, however, the time is come for it, and the man, and behold, you have it, and the thing we specifically call French Revolution is blown into space by it, and become a thing that was. Chapter 3.7.8 Finus Homer's epos, it is remarked, is like a bar-leaf sculpture, it does not conclude, but merely ceases. Such, indeed, is the epos of universal history itself. Directorates, consulates, emperorships, restorations, citizen kingships succeed this business in due series, in due genesis one out of the other. Nevertheless the first parent of all these may be said to have gone to air in the way we see. A Babouf insurrection, next year, will die in the birth, stifled by the soldiery. A senate, if tinged with royalism, can be purged by the soldiery, and an eighteenth of fructidor transacted by the mere shoe of bayonets. Nay soldiers' bayonets can be used a posteriori on a senate, and make it leap out of window, still bloodless, and produce an eighteenth of Brumaire. Such changes must happen, but they are managed by intriguings, cabalings, and then by orderly word of command, almost like mere changes of ministry. Not in general by sacred right of insurrection, but by milder methods growing ever milder, shall the events of French history be henceforth brought to pass. It is admitted that this directorate, which owned, at its starting, these three things, an old table, a sheet of paper, and an ink bottle, and no visible money or arrangement whatever, did wonders, that France. Since the reign of terror hushed itself, has been a new France, awakened like a giant out of torpor. And has gone on, in the internal life of it, with continual progress. As for the external form and forms of life, what can we say except that out of the eater there comes strength, out of the unwise there comes not wisdom. Shams are burnt up. Nay, what as yet is the peculiarity of France, the very cant of them is burnt up. The new realities are not yet come, ah no, only phantasms, paper models, tentative prefigurements of such. In France there are now four million landed properties. That black portent of an agrarian law is as it were realized. What is still stranger, we understand all Frenchmen have, the right of duel, the hackney coachman with the peer, if insult be given, such is the law of public opinion. Equality at least in death. The form of government is by citizen king, frequently shot at, not yet shot. On the whole, therefore, has it not been fulfilled what was prophesied, ex post facto indeed, by the archquack Cagliostro, or another? He, as he looked in rapt vision and amazement into these things, thus spake, Ha! What is this? Angels, Uriel, Anakiel, and the other five, Pentagon of Rejuvenescence, power that destroyed original sin. Earth, heaven, and thou outer limbo, which men name hell. Does the empire of imposture waver? Burst there, in starry sheen up darting, light rays from out its dark foundations, as it rocks and heaves, not in travail throes, but in death throes. Yeah, light rays, piercing, clear, that salute the heavens, lo, they kindle it, 
their starry clearness becomes as red hellfire. Imposture is in flames, imposture is burnt up, one red sea of fire, wild billowing enwraps the world. With its fire tongue, licks at the very stars. Thrones are hurled into it, and Du Bois miters, and pre bendel stalls that drop fatness, and, ha! What see I, all the gigs of creation, all, all? Why is me? Never since Pharaoh's chariots, in the Red Sea of Water, was there wreck of wheel vehicles like this in the Sea of Fire. Desolate, as ashes, as gases, shall they wander in the wind. Higher, higher yet flames the fire sea. Crackling with new dislocated timber, hissing with leather and prunella. The metal images are molten, the marble images become mortar lime, the stone mountains sulkily explode. Respectability, with all her collected gigs inflamed for funeral pyre, wailing, leaves the earth, not to return save under new avatar. Imposture, how it burns, through generations, how it is burnt up, for a time. The world is black ashes. Which, ah, when will they grow green? The images all run into amorphous Corinthian brass, all dwellings of men destroyed, the very mountains peeled and riven, the valleys black and dead, it is an empty world. What to them that shall be born then? A king, a queen, ah me! Were hurled in, did rustle once, flew aloft, crackling, like paper scroll. Iscariot Egalite was hurled in, thou grim Delone, with thy grim Bastille, whole kindreds and peoples, five millions of mutually destroying men. For it is the end of the dominion of imposture, which is darkness and opaque fire damp, and the burning up, with unquenchable fire, of all the gigs that are in the earth. This prophecy, we say, has it not been fulfilled, is it not fulfilling? And so here, O reader, has the time come for us two to part. Toilsome was our journeying together, not without offence. But it is done. To me thou wert as a beloved shade, the disembodied or not yet embodied spirit of a brother. To thee I was but as a voice. Yet was our relation a kind of sacred one, doubt not that. Whatsoever once sacred things become hollow jargons, yet while the voice of man speaks with man, hast thou not there the living fountain out of which all sacrednesses sprang, and will yet spring? Man, by the nature of him, is definable as, an incarnated word. Ill stands it with me if I have spoken falsely, thine also it was to hear truly. Farewell.